Aliens vs. Predators Ultimate Prey This novel was edited by Jonathan Mayberry and Brian Thomas Schmidt. Story 1. The Low Top Secret by Chris Ryle The day was going fine until April's phone died. She hoped it wasn't a sign. One of those cosmic don't count your chickens things or that other axiom about assumptions. I charged my cell this morning, she whispered. What the hell? She glanced at Brockton's face and thought that his look of dismay was because his cell was dead, too. Which it was. But he was put off for another reason entirely. April, come on, we need to hurry, he said. We have to move. It's that way. He pulled her away from the rest of the team and pointed toward the long, low building over the bluff a few hundred yards away. Be subtle about it, he cautioned. We don't want anyone following us. The excursion onto the grounds here at Area 51 had gone without incident well, beyond the suddenly non-functioning mobile devices but, the farther they drifted from the others, the more uncertain it all felt. Rockton, though. Up until now, his certainty about things he couldn't possibly know for sure had a kind of charm to them, but now April wasn't as sold on his bravado. As they approached the building in question, he started to reveal new information that she found quite disconcerting. She looked back at the rest of the large group. Not one of them was following yet. They all continued down the road toward the military installation itself. Which Brockton said made sense as a destination for anyone who didn't know what he knew. It also meant they were fully exposed, walking on the road toward a base no doubt packed with military forces and other security. But the broader plan for the day was to get arrested and force the base to acknowledge there were strange goings on here. Brockton had suggested to her that they should try to enter a building that was much closer to the gate they'd just breached, and that sounded smart. It would allow them to feasibly check things out and then leave before they found themselves zip tied and under arrest. With black bags over their heads and a one way ticket to a black site. But once Brockton started talking about the limited time left for them to get into this building before it was too late, April began reassessing her willingness to just accept whatever he said. Still, he was right about one thing, she mused. He could indeed get them into the building. The front of the building had no windows, just a set of double doors that looked impregnable. The lock contained a digital keypad, but Brockton simply pulled up his right sleeve and copied a number he'd written on his forearm, typing it into the keypad. The door opened. Brockton looked at April and grinned. See? My source knew what they were talking about. But April thought he looked a little too relieved when he said it, as if he was surprised it actually worked. Funny how you never mentioned a source before, April said. By which I mean, this isn't funny at all. We just went from breaking and entering a base to try to force freedom of information to, well, a full-on B-Andy of a military outpost. He took a few steps deeper into the building. She followed, and they stood in what looked like the waiting area of a typical though unoccupied office building. It won't matter, he said, not if we hurry. If the rest of what my guy told me is also true, we're on the cusp of breaking this thing wide open. I didn't want to freak you out before, but... I've been talking to someone who works here. At the base. The first guy since maybe Bob Laser to really admit that, and he told me. Really? Asked April. Why would he just confide in you? Well, Brockton said, sheepishly, we may have had a transaction. A number of them, really. Shit, muttered April. You bought information from a stranger. No, it's cool. Look, April, this is a guy I came across online a few years ago, and I've been building up trust and gaining his confidence and, well, sure, sending him money. Maybe a lot of it. In regular installments. But not all or even most of it. He knows we have to get in, get the goods, get out safely, and then he gets the bulk of it. Give me some credit here. April snorted. Okay. Greed and a penalty if he fucks us. That makes a bit more sense. Brockton took a few steps deeper into the office base. Against her better judgment once again, so did April. Once this excursion got set, he said it was finally time for the world to know what goes on here, and he gave me that code. 
You mean, you bought that code? Whatever. It was money my parents gave me for college, so it was mine to spend how I wanted. And what better education than this? April groaned. Brockton leaned close and lowered his voice even more. He told me another thing April. Oh, I can't wait for this, she said. This building. It's sitting over the real base. Oh, come on. And, he said, he told me how we can get down there. I she began, but then froze. There was a noise outside. She peered through the glass door and saw a vehicle coming their way, pulling a dust plume behind it. Brockton, she said quickly, I don't quite know what to say to any of this, but if you have a plan, we better go now. That's what I was trying to tell you. He took her hand and they hurried deeper into the deserted office. April thought she heard the outside door open behind them. If my guy wasn't lying, Brockton said as they rounded a corner, then it should be right. Whoa. Here it is. They approached an elevator bank. April felt a chill why did a one-story building built on top of sand and dirt have an elevator? The doors to the elevator stood open, but inside it was dark. Still, Brockton directed her forward and they stepped into it. Brockton. Inside, a control panel contained only a grid of 64 buttons without numbers on them. The buttons alternated between black and white. It looked more like some kind of game than it did an elevator control panel. Brockton pushed eight of them in sequence. Nothing happened. April heard heavy footsteps and voices from down the hall. This was all too much. She wanted out. Brockton, stop. I don't want to do this. Come on, Brockton growled as he kept stabbing the buttons in a sequence once again. This isn't fun anymore, said April. Well, we're here now, he growled. Let me work, will you? Just standing here and waiting to get caught or shot isn't fun, either. We've come this far and bingo. The elevator lights abruptly came on, and they could hear the motor powering up. Now, we've got nowhere to go but down. He was so right about that. As the elevator descended, April found herself taking a long cold look at how the hell she got here. She'd started out wanting to improve her social life or at least her social media life and had ended up on this possibly ruinous path. Only a month ago, she'd let herself get led down a new online rabbit hole. She saw some friends share a group that consisted of people planning to make an excursion onto the grounds at the legendarily secretive military base located at Area 51 in Nevada. April was intrigued, mostly because she saw that hundreds of people had already clicked, will attend. And she happened to know one of them, a friend of a friend named Brockton. Brockton, who owned a car with air conditioning and offered to drive her through the desert to attend this event. She accepted. April didn't particularly believe in the existence of UFOs. Really, she didn't think about them either way. Following conspiracy theories seemed to be the province of, mostly, underemployed men. But the event promised a massive turnout, so why not? Surely she could get a few interesting pictures and a fun story to tell. Enough to ensure another weekend of social media likes, anyway. On the drive out, Brockton proved his conspiracy nut bona fides by showing her all the proof of aliens he had on his phone. Low-res photos and grainy videos, mostly. He also convinced her there wouldn't be any real price to pay for the planned excursion. That's why we made it public, to warn them in advance, he said. Besides, I have it on good authority that we'll be able to get full access to the base that day. I have it all covered. The morning felt full of promise. They joined others at the agreed-upon meeting place, in front of Rachel, Nevada's famous Ailey Inn. The buzz was electric and infectious even to a non-believer, non-care was more accurate, she had told Brockton before, like her. One hour later, outside the base's outer gate, April felt her first real twinge of doubt about what the hell she'd agreed to. There was no security in sight the guard station next to the high fence had been deserted. The wooden bars blocking the path didn't look like they would keep out anything except a myopic raccoon. Nothing looked particularly impressive or intimidating. And it certainly hadn't scared off the 300 people who'd come along on this crazy raid. Hardly the stuff of a high-security military installation. 
April hoped all of this was a good sign that maybe this would be easier than it appeared. Yeah, she thought, because nothing ever goes wrong when you break into a military facility that is the literal definition of looks too easy. It was a walk in the park, right? Then she saw the other sign. A big wooden one posted near the gate. Unauthorized personnel not admitted. Photography is prohibited. $1,000 fine, six months imprisonment, or both. Well. Shit, April said. Brockton laughed it off, though. If they really cared about us being here, he said, they'd have more than just scary signs. Ooh. I mean, we made sure everyone knew when we were coming. He paused. You know, though, that sign is just a cool spot for people to take pictures. People started to walk onto the grounds. Tentatively at first, and then with more enthusiasm. A cheer went up. It was time. Fame awaited. That was when Brockton asked April what time it was. When she pulled out her phone, it went dead in her hand. When the elevator came to a stop, April and Brockton were both thoroughly freaked out. It had moved far deeper into the earth than they'd ever expected, and the time it took to finally reach its destination gave them plenty of opportunity to envision a worst-case scenario. They didn't say anything, but the nervous look in Brockton's eyes matched what she felt. They clung to the sides of the cage as the doors opened, trying to be invisible, but outside was a short empty hallway. They stepped out cautiously and saw there was a door a few yards from the elevator, and another at the far end. Both had keycard scanners mounted on the walls. They crept toward it and looked through a small window into a room filled with row after row of metal exam tables. Brockton tried the door. Locked, he said, stepping back. Now what? asked April, but before he could reply, the door suddenly opened and a man in a lab coat plowed right into Brockton. The man rebounded, actually shrieked and swung a heavy flashlight at Brockton's head, missing by a hair. He overbalanced and dropped the light, which rolled against the wall. Whoa, whoa, said April, pulling Brockton back. The man stood for a moment just gaping at them. He wore an ID badge clipped to his lapel. It read, Dr. Stephen Renfro. The scientist's eyes were wild, and he lunged forward, pushed past them, and ran for the elevator. He began pushing buttons. The elevator doors remained stubbornly shut. No, 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 cried Renfro. It can't be, not already. I'm too late. Too late. Brockton grabbed his sleeve. Too late for what? Dr. Renfro looked at them as if only now realizing they were strangers. You can't be here now, he barked. We're too late. It's all falling apart. We we need to find another way out of here. April looked at Brockton. And I thought you sounded crazy before. Dr. Renfro kicked the closed elevator door. He was panting and his face flushed red. Come on. Come on, you fools, he snapped. Brockton pulled back and said, Hey, man, calm down. You're freaking us out. Are you the one who... His sentence died in his throat when the large, insectoid creature dropped onto Dr. Renfro's shoulders from somewhere above them. Despite its massive size, the creature never made a sound until it landed on the doctor with a heavy thud. April and Brockton both screamed as they scrambled backward, horrified beyond rational thought. The creature was monstrous it must have been seven feet tall, and while its frame was thin, like an insectoid exoskeleton without skin, it had long, jointed arms ending in six clawed fingers on each of its two hands, a longer segmented tail that ended with a wicked pointed tip, and four thick protrusions extending out of its back. Most horrific of all was a long, domed head, and a mouth filled with sharp teeth and dripping with mucus. Renfro's scream was awful. High and shrill filled with absolute horror and bottomless pain. The monster attacked the hapless doctor, its tail whipping back and forth, coming within inches of April and Brockton. April's brain was nearly stalled by shock, but there was that one part of her the clinical, rational mind that kept working. Analyzing. It did that even when she was stoned, or having sex. Always trying to make sense of the world. And now it was shrieking at her that, after everything, Brockton was right. Aliens were real. This thing, this monster, was nothing she had ever seen or heard about. 
it was not of this earth, that much was certain. It wrapped its arms around Renfro in a horrific parody of an embrace, then raked long, sharp fingers in a jagged X across his chest. The claws tore through clothing, flesh, and muscle with little resistance, and blood exploded outward. Brockton seemed too stunned to move, but April grabbed him and dragged him backward toward the laboratory door. For the moment, the creature seemed to ignore them and continued savaging the scientist. It lowered its head, dripping slime onto Renfro's neck, and plunged its tongue, a rigid thing with teeth of its own, into the back of Renfro's neck, the tooth tongue rending flesh and muscle alike. The third time it did so, it got stuck on Renfro's spinal column with a thunk. The door had not swung all the way shut, and April saw that the flashlight the doctor dropped was blocking it. It was a splinter of luck. Was it enough? She snatched it up and shoved Brockton into the room. Hey, someone yelled it was a female voice from the far end of the lab. Come on, this way. This way. April risked a look over her shoulder. The monster had heard the voice, too. It raised its head from the limp body of Renfro, then dropped the corpse. The man's head had been so thoroughly savage that it tore free and rolled crookedly away. Then it began stalking toward them. Its clawed fingers caught the edge of the door, its tail whipping back and forth. The woman at the far end of the room yelled for them. Here, over here. Hurry, for fuck's sake. There Anne. The alien chased them, but another splinter of luck saved them because its chitinous feet skidded in the blood spilling from the stump of Dr. Renfro's neck. It gave them a half second's grace, and they reached the woman, who held open a thick metal door with a square glass observation window in it. The woman grabbed them, shoved them roughly inside, then slammed the door. April and Brockton collapsed against a wall and stared at her. April hugged the flashlight to her chest as if it was a sacred talisman. The woman wore an identical lab coat to Renfro, and her name tag read. Dr. Amy Kupihia. You people are trespassing, she snarled. And you're a pair of goddamn idiots. As she fought to catch her breath, April looked around. The room they were in seemed to be one of those shelter-in-place spots. Dr. Kupihia seemed to read her thoughts and nodded. It's a safe room, she said. We have them peppered throughout. We'll be okay here for now. There's water, MREs military ready to eat meals cots and blankets, and they tell me the walls are impregnable. Brockton kept blinking, clearly trying to reboot his brain. Kupihia kept talking as if she was giving a freaking tour. We have a solid security door, an intranet computer, and a dedicated power source. But why? Demanded April, finally finding her own voice. What's happening here? What is that thing? What? What? I mean. Brockton mumbled, this is where they brought the UFOs they found. That's what that thing is, isn't it? An alien from one of those ships, and it got out. Dr. Kupihia did not answer, and instead demanded to know who they were and how they got there. April did her best to explain, and the doctor listened with increasing dread, as April relayed the last hour of their day their ease, of entrance obviously enabled by someone from within the base, the elevator code, and then the death of Dr. Renfro. This is another of those Occupy Area 51 things. Kupihia said, appalled. Jesus Christ. And you're sure Renfro's dead? Very, said Brockton. God damn, said Kupihia. Then her face hardened. Serves him right. He set this in motion. He should have enacted a hard lockdown. He should have called in a strike team, that's why they're on standby. But no. He kept saying it was all under control, that everything was fine. Shit. And now that thing has the run of the lab, and we're in here. Despite her anger there were tears in the corners of her eyes. Did all of you morons come down here? All what was it? Three hundred. No, said April. Just us. The rest are upstairs. And if that thing gets up there they lolled I, said Kupihia. You don't even want to know how. We saw how, said Brocken. It tore that guy's head off. Can't get a lot worse than that. Kupihia's expression was bleak. Yes, she said, it really can. Brockton looked around. What kind of weapons do we have? Nothing. I'm a scientist, not a soldier. 
Wait, said April, there's nothing in this room that we can use as a weapon to kill that thing. Of course not. Lady, said Brockton, that giant cockroach murderized your friend in like two seconds. He nodded at the computer. Can you call in, like, tactical nukes or something on that thing? Gupihia's eyes were cold. Not even a remotely workable option. We can't even call in the strike team without the QR code on Renfro's ID. Then she took a deep breath, exhaled it, and added, but I have the makings of an idea. I wouldn't call it a plan, but maybe it can offer us a possible way past this mess. April stood with her back to the two of them, her hands clutched nervously tight around the heavy barrel of the flashlight. She peered through the window and the door. She didn't ever want to see that creature again, but even worse to her was not seeing it. I haven't seen it since we got in here. But it's there, isn't it? It's somewhere out there, waiting. The creature can pretty much disappear into the shadows, said Kupihia. It has demonstrated superior skills at stalking and concealing itself. Not human intelligence but very high animal cunning. We've documented how it can somehow fold at seven feet into tight dark spaces and lie in wait. It's maybe its most lethal trick. Jesus. I was wrong before, Brockton said. It's not a giant roach, it's a trapdoor spider. Something heavy slammed against the door. April screamed. Hush. The doctor hissed. It can't get in here, so even if it's got a sense that we're here now, it'll likely seek out a proper dark space to wait us out. That means the rafters. Which are high enough that we might be able to make it out of here. And go where? Brockton said. I'd love to tell you there was a back door we could use or other such escape hatch, but when you mentioned before that the elevator doors wouldn't open, I knew then that no help was forthcoming. Not from the rest of the staff, anyway. For now, we're sealed in here with that thing. Gupihi explained that base protocol dictated the automatic sealing off of any level subject to astrobiological contamination. We can never risk anything that gets loose in here getting free out there, she said, pointing up at the surface. The way you made your way down here. A one-way trip until things are contained, if they are. Per protocol, there's no help coming unless we get Renfro's ID. And even then it's not instantaneous. If we can make that call, then we'll be instructed to hole up in one of these shelter rooms and wait. God, there's help right upstairs, too, said April. Those military guys almost caught us before. We fled down here, thinking that was the better option. They didn't catch us, said Brockton lamely. April wheeled on him. I cannot believe I went along with your stupidity. Look, aliens weren't actually supposed to be real. Brockton whined. I mean, you'd have to be insane to believe the stuff. But you believe. April fired back. God, I should open this door and feed you to that thing. It was a game, he protested. It was all just supposed to be a game. Or, at best, I expected aliens to be those little gray-headed dudes who are all cute, like Archibald in that comic, or that movie Paul. Let's worry less about your faulty information and more about finding a practical solution to our problem, shall we? Said Kupihia with asperity. She stepped to a workstation and pulled up an inventory list filled with objects with long names and numbers. Ah, there you are. She tapped a button on the screen, and a metal compartment against the far wall opened up, and a drawer slid out. Brockton looked at the open drawer. Weapon. He said hopefully. Cause right now all we have is that flashlight April grabbed. Weapon? Used the doctor. Not so much as we understand it, anyway. But he might. He? Asked Brockton. Who he? She lifted an object out of the drawer. It was a rough-hued metallic ball the size of a coconut. Please tell me that's a hand grenade, Brockton said. Hardly, said Kupihia. Frankly, I can't tell you in the strictest terms what it is. It just might help, but it's a backup plan to my non-plan. She glanced over and asked, April, do you still see it? April peered into the laboratory. It was hard to see anything clearly because the glass was smeared with blood and muck, but there was no obvious movement in the other room. No. Then let's hope for the best. If it's far enough away, we might have a chance to get where we need to go next. 
Kupihia turned the object over and over in her hands, lips pursed in thought. Which is where? Asked April. I'll accept any answer as long as it's out of this base forever. You mentioned rafters, said Brockton. That thing dropped from the ceiling before, and Dr. Renfro was dead before we could scream. Where can we possibly go from here where that thing won't just drop on us next? Yes, said April. And more to the point, Doctor, you obviously caught it once, right? So how did you bag it before? Is there a way to do that again? I have the same answer to both of your questions, Dr. Kupihia said. We were able to subdue that specimen before because we had help. Help. Said April and Brockton at the same time. Yes, said Kupihia slowly. Which tells me what we need to do next. And then she told them. Remember, Kupihia said, when this door opens, run for the hallway door. Last one through pulls it shut and makes sure the lock clicks. The specimen is clever, but it can't bypass locks. We get Renfro's ID badge, and we run like hell down the hall to the other door. We slide either his badge or mine through the card reader, and it'll open the door. Once we're through, then it's down the corridor to the fourth door on the right, Brockton said. Enter this code he displayed the number he'd written in large print on his forearm and then stand back from whatever is gonna come out of that room. Make absolutely no threatening gestures, insisted Kupihia. That's critical. I'd even kneel and lower your eyes. But began Brockton, but Kupihia cut him off. Just do what I say. What'll you be doing while we're doing these things? Asked April. I'll be right there with you, Kupihia said but taking great care not to drop this. She presented the strange ball she'd been holding. Your amazing interstellar non-weapon that may or may not be useful, Brockton said. Perfect. Feeling great about this plan. The thing in the room where we're headed, April said. What is it? Another one of these bugs. Only this one found Jesus or something. You're in enough trouble already, said Kupihia. Anything else I could tell you is only going to get you in deeper legal shit. Me too, for that matter. Right now our focus is on survival. Yeah, yeah, sure, said Brockton. Whatever it is, it's something else we shouldn't be seeing. I get it. He shook his head and turned to April. I know I wanted this today, but I mean, you have to know we've already seen too much for them to let us live. Dr. Kupihia looked at April. Let you live. Jesus wept, is he always this much of a paranoid conspiracy nut? April almost smiled. One of the milder cases I met today. You should see some of the others. No joke, there was one guy with an actual tinfoil hat, and I don't think it was an attempt at irony. To Brockton, she said, besides, if we already have seen too much to live, I mean, what's a little more at this point? In for a penny, in for a stupid lethal killer bug pound. Brockton muttered. God. This damn thing better be some kind of magic space assassin. Kupihi appeared to actually consider the comment. It's not an assassin per se, she said slowly. More of a special kind of hunter. Absolutely fascinating. Now, let's get ready to move. They clustered by the door. April could see fear sweat running down the faces of Brockton and the doctor. Her own body was slick with it, and her heart was beating with dangerous intensity. On three, said Kupihia. She counted down and then engaged the door's release and opened it very slowly and carefully. They stepped out into the room and looked around. All seemed quiet, but April didn't take that as a good sign, because she felt as if she was being watched. It was impossible to tell if that was the truth or rampant paranoia. Or both. Then Brockton slipped in a puddle of some viscous lime and fell hard on his ass. The realization tore a cry from him, and the echo banged off every goddamn wall in the lab. Shit, cried April. She and Kupihia yanked Brockton to his feet, and they all ran like hell. Something thudded down behind them, and there was the clickety slither of monstrous feet on the linoleum. It was coming fast. Run! screamed Kupihia, but they were already running. They reached the door. No keycard was needed to exit the lab, so Brockton jerked the door open and pushed Kupihia and April through, then he followed. The alien, at full, inhuman sprint, leaped toward them. 
It hit the wall over the doorway and came down just before Kupihia could go through. She fell back, screaming. The creature rose to its full height nearly seven feet and moved its head in close to hers. Mucus dripped from its open mouth. Within, its long tongue emerged, and the bulbous end opened to reveal that second set of awful teeth. But then April slammed the butt of the heavy flashlight against the underside of the alien's jawbone. She put all of her strength and terror into it, and the four slammed the alien's jaw closed, the outer teeth crunching around the slime-covered tongue. It emitted a high-pitched squeal of shock and outrage. Blood flew from the wound and splashed on the door, missing April by inches. It hissed and sizzled, and April saw some of the metal door and frame begin to dissolve, to run like tallow. Molecular acid, barked Kupihia. Don't touch it. Run. As the alien continued to thrash in fury, more of the acid sprayed out. A few drops hit the flashlight, and April flung it away from her, hitting the thing in the mouth. Kupihia grabbed her hand and pulled her past the alien and into the long corridor. Both women turned and pulled the door shut, but the melting metal kept it from closing all the way. They fled. The hall was lined with heavy semi-translucent glass panels, each with a security keypad affixed to the wall next to it. Kupihia yelled, Brockton. 6121987. The alien pushed through the door, but it was moving slowly, shaking its head from side to side. April couldn't tell if it was in pain or merely disoriented from the injury. Either way, it kept coming toward them. Brockton entered the code and then ran toward April and Kupihia. April. Hit the floor. The alien suddenly lunged forward and leapt at April, but she saw it and dropped down, pulling the doctor down with her. The alien's leap cleared them, but it came down right into Brockton's path, the impact knocking Brockton onto the floor, too. It stepped forward, putting one of its large, spiny feet on Brockton's chest. Its claws poked into his skin. All at once, the whole shape of the world seemed to change. The door to that room swung open and something came out. Even the alien turned, forgetting Brockton in that moment. Something massive stepped into the hall, and with surprising speed and power, it grabbed the monster, lifted it, and hurled it down the hall. The alien hit hard and slid all the way to the doorway. It lay there, momentarily stunned. April looked up at the new creature it stood nearly as tall as the alien, but was much more powerfully built. And it was more obviously humanoid in appearance, though in no way human. It was barefoot and bare-chested, with massive muscles rippling beneath mottled yellowish-brown skin. Most terrifying of all was its face. It was something out of nightmare. Pale in human eyes and a mouth made up of twitching mandibles. The creature looked down at Brockton, and then turned away with a kind of implied arrogance. As if Brockton was nothing. Then it took off down the hall toward the alien. My God, Brockton gasped, they've got an actual reptilian down here. Wait. You mean I was right. April helped Kupihia to her feet, and they moved to Brockton. That thing is on our side. Fuck. Maybe we do have a chance. We call him Dean, Kupihia said. A silly nickname for such an impressive specimen, to be sure, and from what we saw of his companions, likely still growing. He's aggressive and predatory. So far, he doesn't seem particularly inclined to attack humans. The alien had whipped its bony tail at Dean, encircling him and pulling him close. Then it rammed its claws into Dean's left side, piercing the skin and sinking deep into his flesh. The new alien bellowed in pain. Doctor, we need to get out of here. Leave them in here and let them kill each other, who cares? Or maybe open the rest of these cages and let all the different aliens go at it while we escape. Brockton added. Do you have any greys? You are not helping, the doctor said. There are no other reinforcements. And April, I'm sorry, we're not going anywhere. We still don't have Renfro's ID card. This base is sealed off. We have to hope Dean can come out on top. Then maybe we can get the ID and call in a strike team. Otherwise. She rolled the lead globe around in her hands and let the sentence hang unfinished. Down the hall, Dean was having a hard time in the relatively close quarters. The alien held him tight with its tail, its ridges cutting into Dean's legs. 
the alien slashed away with its free hand and dug the claws deeper into the big hunter's side. The insectoid creature's head was inches away from Dean's, slime dripping from it as it extended its toothed tongue yet again. Without any real maneuverability, Dean was forced to bring the fight in even closer. He slammed his forehead against the alien's domed head, knocking the creature off balance enough for him to free himself from its grasp. April could see a big crack in the sleek carapace. But Dean was clearly hurt worse. Iridescent green blood streamed from his wounds. Gupihia took a step forward. We. We have to help him. Um, Doc, you're out of your fucking mind, Brockton said. She stopped moving forward, seemed to reconsider, then returned and handed the globe to Brockton. How's your aim? Oh God, I knew it was a hand grenade, he said warily. You want me to just throw it at them? Worse than that I need it return to Dean. It was among the array of weaponry we found aboard his craft. We usually catalog and store these things elsewhere, but this one needed more study. In fact, it could well have dire consequences we are not even aware of, but, you know, desperate times. You're telling me, Dean said, dismayed. He held the thing out in front of him like it might explode any second. Down the corridor, the alien skittered up the wall near Dean and came at him again, slashing with its own claws. The alien flung itself at the big hunter, and then both creatures came sliding down the corridor, Dean still bearing the brunt of the fight. The alien slashed its claws at Dean's face, but the hunter caught the hand before it could impact him. He then dragged the creature forward and, seeing the open space of his containment cell, swung the creature hard into the cell. It slammed against the far wall. Then Dean slammed the door. Locks clicked audibly, trapping the other alien inside. The alien slammed against the inside of the door, but it held. Good lord, gasped Kupihia, staggering back. April caught her. They watched Dean closely. No one had any sense what might happen next. The injured hunter was panting. That luminous yellow-green blood dripped onto the floor. Then he started pounding on the barrier. Pounding and making noises that sounded like guttural laughter. Is he taunting the creature within, April wondered. Or hoping to free it to continue the battle. The alien responded by slamming against the barrier over and over. But, try as it might, even its deadly claws could not find a berth against its smooth surface. That seemed to infuriate the thing. It bashed its face against the glass-like door again and again, its frenzy mounting. Some of its teeth broke loose and fell to the floor. One particularly vicious blow split its jaw open. Blood dripped to the floor, where its acidic nature caused it to hiss and sizzle into the floor. Then the monster extended its damaged toothed tongue to gouge and tear at its own right arm. What the hell's it doing? Brockton demanded, but Kupihia just shook her head. Each time it struck the arm, it tore away more of the chitinous shell, spilling more blood onto the floor and eating away at it. Finally, its forearm and hand tore completely loose and fell to the floor. The creature howled an inhuman wail of pain. A roiling cloud of steam rose from the melting floor. Dean had stopped his pounding and was watching, his strange eyes narrowed. Inside, the creature smashed at the glass barrier with its severed arm. Each time it did, its acid blood etched deepening damage lines into the surface. Christ Brockton said, it's melting the glass. We need to get out of here, April said. The maimed creature continued its assault on the barrier. Finally, Dean had had enough standing around, and he started pounding the glass again. Doctor? April said, worried. Don't worry, that's a graphene and crystal matrix polymer blend. It should hold. It. And the smoky glass exploded outward in a spray of melting pieces. With a shriek, the alien flung itself at Dean. The hunter rushed to meet it, but the alien thrust the stump of its arm at Dean's chest. The hunter screeched as the acid burned a huge jagged circle into his chest. God, Kupihia yelped, backpedaling. Brockton, throw the globe. But Brockton was rooted to the spot, eyes and mouth wide, expression blank, the globe hanging limply in one hand. Dean, though badly wounded now, was still fighting. He slapped the stump away, grabbed the alien, and slammed it against the wall. Again and again. Each blow shook the hull, 
and cracks whipsawed through the insectoid armor. Drops of the alien's blood flew from its stump, spattering Dean and pocking his flesh. It's going to kill him, April thought, assessing rationally while her body was nearly as frozen from shock as Brockton's. It's going to kill him and then kill us all. She heard herself mumbling words she hadn't said since Sunday school when she was little. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. She felt a hand take hers and looked down in surprise to see that it was Brockton's. He squeezed tight. I'm sorry. She whispered back, fuck you. But she smiled when she said it. He smiled back. Then he released her hand and gave her a small push. Go, oh, he said. April gaped at him. W-H what? Run. She backed away only a few feet. Hey, Dean, Brockton yelled as he crouched and rolled the globe toward the wrestling monsters. Catch. The hunter turned at the sound, but that only allowed the alien to slice his flesh again, spilling more green blood onto the ground. Dean howled and staggered. He'd lost a lot of blood. Then he saw the object rolling on the ground, and it seemed to galvanize him. He twisted and lashed out with a vicious back kick, knocking the insect alien back. The thing hit the wall and rebounded, but it was enough time. Dean ducked and snatched up the ball, pivoted and smashed it against the wall. Well, shit. I could have done that, Brockton said. The ball shattered, splattering against the wall with a bluish goo. Dean used his hand to scoop as much of it as he could. And, as the alien leapt at him with its jaws open and toothed tongue again emerging, Dean drove his left hand into the creature's mouth. Its outer jaw clamped down, and the inner teeth likewise tore at the flesh on Dean's fist. But the true damage was done. The alien recoiled sharply, pawing at its mouth with its one remaining hand. It stumbled sideways, obviously in terrible pain. Dean snarled and kicked the creature away, sending it sprawling on the floor. In shock, April saw that the remaining blue goo was dissolving the flesh on Dean's hand. But the alien had ingested the majority of it, and it was doing far worse to that creature. Dr. Kupihia and the other two stared in horror as the blue dissolving liquid wreaked havoc on both creatures. The skin on Dean's hand peeled down to the bones. He wobbled but stayed on his feet. Meanwhile, the alien was being eaten from within. It managed to push itself back onto its knees before collapsing onto its side. Even as its severed stump burned into the concrete floor, the blue goo melted the creature alive from within. Its chitinous chest collapsed inward as tissue and muscle dissolved. Blue liquid emerged from its joints and its mouth as the creature melted away. Dean looked down at the creature's rapidly dissolving shell. His broad chest heaved from exertion and pain, but he raised his foot and stomped on the gooey remains. Then he raised his good arm in the air and emitted an ear-piercing howl of savage victory. The cry seemed to fill the whole world, but then it abruptly stopped, dissolving into a wet gurgle. Dean sagged down to his knees. He looked at April and the others, and then his eyes rolled up in his head as his big body toppled sideways. Dead. April dropped to her knees, too. Looking into the hunter's eyes, watching the focus fade into a terminal emptiness. After a moment she said, did you know what was going to happen? Kupihia shook her head slowly. No. I I thought it was a grenade. She walked over and placed a hand on Dean's chest, then looked up at the other two. The sadness in her eyes was both genuine and profound. We don't know what drew them here in the first place, she said hollowly. We rarely do. When Dean arrived with the others like him, the best we could figure was that he was brought here to hunt this creature. Hunters bringing their own prey. Like fishermen stocking a lake with trout. That was our theory, anyway. Whatever the case, Dean proved today that he was a true hunter. Jesus Christ. April whispered. And this might not be a very scientific way of viewing things, she added but I hope his ancestors welcomed him to whatever sort of Valhalla their hunters end up in. Things happened fast after the base was accessible again. After a month-long quarantine and a debriefing period that determined that Brockton and April had nothing to do with the freeing of the alien, the conversation turned to what to do about these two trespassing kids long term. Brockton was vague about what he knew about accessing the base and how he knew it, 
but it didn't take the authorities long to determine that Dr. Renfro was the person who leaked the information. How the alien escaped was something April never learned. The authorities refused to answer her questions. Instead, she and Brockton were arrested and charged with a raft of violations. But Dr. Kupihia interceded on their behalf. April never learned all the details, but apparently the scientist either had friends or influence. So, instead of vanishing to Gitmo or some other hellhole, they were offered a deal. Sign a very large and very scary stack of papers, or spend 15 to 20 in a supermax. When April's lawyer read the conditions, he went pale and got sweaty, but he advised her to sign. One condition was that if she spoke publicly about the facility and, more importantly, the specimens, her constitutional rights would be forfeit, and that as the saying goes would be that. And so she signed. It still meant a sentence of six months in a federal prison, no visitors, calls, or internet access permitted. There were counseling sessions and some terrifying lectures by unsmiling men in black suits. They let her out after three months, though she had to wear an ankle bracelet for the balance of her time. She never found out what happened to the other 300 people. And she never saw Brockton again. She never heard from Dr. Kupihia, either. April drifted for a while, feeling disconnected from any version of the life she'd had or the person she'd been. She was alive, though. Alive. At night she dreamed of the alien and the hunter. Sometimes she woke screaming. Sometimes she lay there, with a window open, and looked up at the infinite stars. The infinite universe. Infinite, but in no way empty. Story 2. Isla Matanzas. By Stephen L. Sears. It was my second year of my being stranded on the island. My ability to read the stars told me it was late March of the year 1770. I had become resigned to my fate, but, I confess to you now, after a lifetime of prayer and unwavering devotion, my faith in the power of our Heavenly Father was fading. The Nephilim were losing, I knew it, and I'm certain they knew it. I had watched the battles unfold from my perch high upon the cliffs over the interior of the island, where I made my home in a small cave behind a waterfall. The evil ones, the serpent-like malvados, were too many in number and had command of the treetops, like the monkeys their spawn had used as hosts for their birthing. Their eggs appeared strangely one night, littering the jungle floor. One of the vile creatures within leapt to attach itself to my face. Only my good eyesight and quickness with my father's machete saved me. The curious monkeys, though, were easily taken. I watched as the malvados burst from their chests and took easily to the trees, as the monkeys had, to grow and begin their killing spree, decimating the animals. These were demons from hell with spiked tails, double rows of fanged jaws, and claws that ripped the flesh of any earthly creature. This lonely island was, I realized, a hell's gate, a place where Lucifer's spawn could pour forth to destroy God's dominion. I hid in my cave and prayed throughout the day and night, hoping God would hear my call. When the three warriors arrived from the heavens to battle the Malvados, I recalled the scripture of Genesis, there were giants in the earth in those days. These were the heroes of old, warriors of renown. The holy words referred to them as the Nephilim, and so I named the three avenging angels the Lord had sent to kill these demons and destroy the gate. The Nephilim were truly godlike in their abilities. They were strong, quick, and had powers beyond that of the most advanced army. Fire erupted from their fists, and strange beams cast from shoulder weapons rained destruction. They disappeared and reappeared in a spectral manner. I slept well, believing that the avenging angels had come and victory against evil was assured. But that was not to be. Hope of salvation slipped away as the Malvados overwhelmed the three Nephilim. The hated serpent swarmed through the limbs of the pine trees and climbed the palms as if born to it. In battle after battle, the fire and lightning the Nephilim commanded was silenced, and their spectral powers deserted them. They fought on bravely, but it seemed I was the only one destined to witness their sacrifice on our behalf. I had been stranded on the island after the ship, Hesperia, had wrecked upon its rocky shoals. I warned the captain, but did he listen? To him, I was just Jorge Rodriguez de Viles, a wealthy merchant returning from Spain to La Florida, to oversee his family's remaining interests in San Augustin. 
though a Spaniard by right, I had only spent the last five years in the country of my heritage. San Augustin was the only home I had ever known. My family could trace themselves back to the founding of the city by Pedro Menendez de Aviles and Father Francisco López de Mendoza Grijales in 1565. Admiral Menendez had been sent by King Philip II to establish a fortress against the French invaders, and Father López to administer to the spiritual needs of the colonists and the local natives, known as the Timucua. Sadly, little of their great tribal nation survives, due to European greed that pillaged their land, and the wars of colonial power we brought to their shores. Many more died of diseases common to us but fatal to them. The few that remained left their ancestral homes for Cuba when the English took possession. Yes, the hated English, no friend to Spaniard or Timucuan, now possessed La Florida. I had, as a youth, fought against Oglethorpe himself when his Calvinist bastards invaded our land. I was bloodied in the Battle of Mos, a victory for the Spanish crown which was celebrated throughout Cadiz and Madrid. But, in the end, it mattered not. What the English had failed to take by force, they had taken by treaty. My beloved land was theirs, and I was left to sell off what possessions we still had in San Augustin. The captain, of course, knew none of this nor did he know I had studied navigation and the ocean's maps, with the idea I might do honor to the crown with my service. He dismissed my concerns, convinced that his vast knowledge of the sea was enough to navigate any ocean. He was wrong and his arrogance cost him his life and those of his crew. I survived with only a spyglass and my father's treasured machete. For two years, I had prayed daily, observing my reverence for the Almighty, certain of deliverance from these shores. But, it seemed, my only reward for devotion was to die in a war not of my choosing. But it was during one such battle between several Malvados and the Nephilim I had named Adelantado when God responded to my prayers. It was early morning. I watched through my spyglass as Adelantado had taken the initiative, attempting to entice some of the creatures into a small crevasse between the rocks. Hoping, I believe, to bring them down from the trees, restrict their movements, and kill them one by one. Of the three Nephilim sent from the heavens, Adelantado seemed the more experienced in terms of tactics. Giganti, the name I gave to the largest of the three, was pure brute strength. Assassino was clever and quick. Where the other two were at this moment, I had no idea. They rarely fought together and seemed to compete against each other for kills and trophy heads. I found Adele and Tato to be the most interesting as he seemed to command respect from his brethren. Adele and Tato had already killed one of the creatures, its poisonous blood still steaming on the jungle floor, and used himself as bait for three other malvados. They pursued him up the rocky hillside to the crevasse. As they crowded in, their deadly spike tails became useless without space, and their advantage in speed was nullified. Adele and Tato mounted the rocks above them and waited. He had forced them into single combat, neutralizing their advantage of numbers. His wrist blades were extended, he held his spear in the other hand. The mask he wore disguised any expression of fear or satisfaction he might have. As the first of the devils climbed toward Adelantado, he flicked his hand and the spear extended to its full length. The Malvado reached for him, and Adelantado swiped his blades across the creature's face, while driving the spear up into its chest. The force of the impact lifted the Malvado from the ground. But what I witnessed next was both amazing and horrible. As Adele and Tato attempted to dislodge his spear, this beast grabbed the Nephilim's arm with both claws and wouldn't let him pull back. Adele and Tato was off balance, he was forced to kick the Malvado to free his spear, but its blood spurted onto his thigh. His exposed flesh began to burn and dissolve. He roared in pain. The other two Malvados had now scrambled free of the crevasse. Severely wounded, Adelantado had no choice but to retreat to the top of the mountain where there was no place to hide, nowhere else to run. Only the cliff over the beach and the rocks below. Suddenly my attention was taken by a side on the other side of the crest, white and blurry against the blue sky. I adjusted the focus of my spyglass. The sails of a large ship. It had three main masts and the flag of England. Had it flown the hated Lutheran rose, I would have still rejoiced. I quickly consulted the leather map I had made of the island. 
they would sail north to allow the current to pull them back to shore and anchor in the cove underneath the cliffs. My heart skipped a beat as I suddenly realized the cove was directly underneath the cliff where Adelantado was fighting to his death. The Malvados were certain to see the ship. I rolled up the map, grabbed up my machete and spyglass and, with a look back at my home for the last two years. My prison. I ran through the waterfall toward the small path that led down the hill. My English was adequate. One of my childhood friends who lived in the free black settlement of Moos, had escaped from an English plantation, and taught me the language of his former masters. I have no love for the English, and I was certain their regard for a Catholic of the Spanish crown of Charles, would be no more than mine was for their Protestant King George. I scrambled down the last few rocks to the jungle floor. I made no attempt to be silent. Speed was the only protection I had now. I had to make it to the cove. At any moment, I expected the stab of their claws in my back, to be lifted above and ripped apart, but I dare not look back, lest that hesitation be my undoing. Be strong and courageous. I whispered words from the book of Joshua. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The sun flared brightly in my eyes as I emerged from the brush directly onto the sand. The ship had dropped anchor, its sails furled. Two longboats were already beached and a third was coming ashore. And people. My good lord, there were people. I ran as fast as my beaten body allowed, pushing hard on the sinking sand to propel myself forward, to freedom. There were several Englishmen, probably ten of them. The rest were women, twenty or more. Their skin, barely covered by rags, reflected of ebony and the chains that linked them by neck collars in groups of three, told me who these Englishmen were, slave traders returning with their human bounty from Africa. I have no heart for slavers, I have seen their work. In my beloved home of San Augustin, we had many escaped slaves from the English colonies. The Spanish crown granted them freedom and gave them refuge. The town of Moos, the one the bastard Oglethorpe had taken, was their home. And those Africans had fought bravely alongside our Spanish troops to retake it and defend my ancestral home. Still, I had no choice. I waved my arms, trying to find voice from my parched throat. No. No. Stop, I yelled. Do not go into the jungle. Please, wait. Charles, hold up. The man standing in the longboat called to his compatriots as their muskets immediately turned in my direction. I ignored them as I continued stumbling forward until I dropped to the sand at their feet. Passed away, one said as he opened a water flask and offered it to me. How long have you been here? Gracious, I muttered as I took the flask, my eyes scanning the trees for the demons. Where were they, I wondered. You must leave, now. There is danger, much danger. Then, from the corner of my eye, I saw movement in the shadows cast by the overhanging cliff. I looked up and could make out the form of Adelantado and the two Malvados, still in mortal combat. There. I pointed upward. There, you see. The men, the women, all looked upward, their eyes straining in the sunlight. What the hell? The man nearest to me uttered. Adelantado was poised on the edge, there was nowhere for him to go. He slashed at the nearest attacker with his spear, but the other plunged its jaws into the mighty Nephilim's side. The ground gave away underneath him, and he fell, his body impacting outcroppings of rock and breaking through the trees along the precipice, finally hitting the ground with a mighty thud, his spear stabbing upright into the sand next to his head. Then, silence. The Malvados had gone. What the hell was that? The man on the longboat yelled out. The two men at the front of the group moved toward Adelantado. He lay partially on his side, his armor ripped open, his flesh shredded from his right leg up to his chest. Another gaping wound was just below his shoulder blade. Never seen anything like it, the man bending over Adelantado said. Some kind of animal or something. He turned and yelled back. It has to be worth something. He motioned for the chained women to come forward, but they did not. The Africans searched the trees, speaking softly to each other, their bodies tense. They know. I thought. They know we're being hunted. That's when we heard the hissing. My blood froze with its meaning, the Malvados were here. Too late, I turned to the man who handed me the flask. Now, you must fight. 
The man nearest Adele and Tato screamed as the Malvado's tail spike plunged into his back and lifted him into the air. The creature grabbed him in its claws and ripped him apart. The English fired their muskets, but without aim, fear and shock, rendering their minds useless. There. Up there. One of the English was desperately reloading his musket as he stared up the side of the cliff. The two Malvados who had pursued Adele and Otto were crawling down the cliff, their teeth reflecting in the sun as they fixed on their prey. The trees shook, and three more Malvados jumped from the jungle onto the sand, where they crouched, ready to pounce, their massive heads swing from side to side. They moved as one, spreading out to prevent any escape into the brush. One of the English pulled his sidearm and fired at the nearest one, hitting it in the creature's shoulder. He quickly began his reload when the vile demon's jaw snapped down on his face, the smaller jaw erupting from the back of the man's head. I had no idea if the Malvados could swim, so I dropped my machete and spyglass and raced to the water, diving through the surf, pushing myself underwater, holding my breath and swimming as far as I could. The sight that greeted me when my head emerged from the water was so horrifying that I hesitate to describe it to you. Blood now covered the sand from the torn and shredded bodies of the English, a testament to the arrogance of their supposed superiority. A few feet away, the man who offered me the flask treaded water. His eyes were wide, his face contorted as he watched the carnage. More sounds of musket fire from behind us caught my attention, and we both turned to see two Malvados crawling up the side of the ship, where only three crewmen opposed them. They could swim, after all. I looked away, the crew was doomed. It was then that I saw the most amazing sight. The women in chains had formed a circle, facing outward toward the Malvados who surrounded them. Their voices chanting together, a rough low sound, punctuated with heavy, rhythmic yells. Their chain collars rattled as they shook them and stomped the ground. As one, they opened their arms in the same manner I had seen of the Nephilim then brought them down hard against their sides with a huge slap, repeating the motion. Each time, their voices rose, louder and louder, the stomping became more intense, making them look larger and more threatening, as if they were challenging the demons to attack. The Malvados had quickly dispatched the Englishmen, but with the women, they were cautious. It occurred to me that they had never seen mortals before today, much less this kind of behavior. Even the mighty lion, the king of his domain, would have chosen prudence. The evil ones were looking for an opening, some weak spot in the circle they could exploit. The women countered their every movement, shifting the circle in unison. I must tell you, I have seen the Swiss guard of the Vatican in formation, and it was nothing as precise as this. Another loud grunt from them and they all stepped as one, moving toward the cliff. I assumed they were seeking partial protection from the rocky walls. But no. They were deliberately moving across the bodies of the English, picking up knives and swords to arm themselves. The most striking of these women leaned down to one body, her eyes never leaving the demons around them. She searched the man's belt and pulled something from it. The key to the collar lock. She freed herself, then passed the key to the next woman, who followed suit, then handed it to the next. None of these women ceased staring at their attackers, none of them lost their step, none of them paused in that steady chant. Who were these women? Where had they come from? They reminded me of the brave Africans who defended Mos, but with more defiance than I had seen in the best of soldiers, black or white. I found myself wanting to survive just to learn their story. The Malvados closed together, preparing for their assault. I had seen this before. Once they broke the circle and got behind the women, their tails would slice back and forth, their claws would reach out, and it would be over quickly. They're done for, mate, the English next to me said. Let's get back to shore while the bastards are busy. He began swimming. I wanted to join him, but my eyes were fixed on the women. The one who picked up the key shouted out commands, and the others responded without hesitation. The circle began to reform, the front moving backwards to create a U-shape, much like the horns of a bull. I was confused, this guaranteed the opportunity the creatures were seeking. The Malvados charged forward, screeching as the demons from hell that they were, and pushed into the center of the U, their tails flailing. Amazingly, the women didn't scatter. The two sides of the U pulled back and around, encircling the Malvados. 
their tails struck out, but the women ducked and rolled under the deadly weapons, slicing upwards, wounding the beasts, while others provoked them from the front. Every time the Malvados reacted, the line reformed and repeated the process. It was death by a thousand cuts. The blood of the Malvados sprayed several of the women. They screamed, falling to the ground as their flesh bubbled and melted away. Still, this did not deter the others as they pressed the battle. Two Malvados were dead, the other three fought wildly, but the loss of blood was beginning to tell on them. At that moment, the water erupted near the boats, and the two Malvados who had attacked the ship, raced across the sand to join the fray. The leader of these women saw them and yelled to the others. They tried to reform the line to meet the new threat, but the three demons in the center were still fighting. The newcomers dashed around the beached boats, to attack from the direction of the cliffs. Four of the women turned to face them as the others tried to close the gap. One of the women died quickly as the tail of the lead Malvado sliced into her stomach. Another was knocked aside, into the rocky walls of the cliff, and fell motionless to the ground. Their leader yelled again and they tried to reform the line, but it was thin and faltering. A second attack would defeat all their efforts. A mighty roar from behind the Malvado stopped them. Adelantado. He stood upright, arms upraised in challenge. Shredded flesh hung from his thigh, and the gash across his chest was bleeding profusely. His mask had fallen away, and I could now see his face clearly. It was, I'm sorry I cannot describe it any other way, hideous. His eyes were small for his body, and there were fangs, four of them, aligned around his mouth. They stretched apart with his battle cry as he ran forward, colliding with the two Malvados. He grabbed the first by the throat and spun it around, using the creature's body as a shield. The spike tail of the other demon shot toward Adelantado's exposed ribs. His blades flashed from his wrist, and the spiked end fell to the ground. The demon's blood sprayed the sand as Adelantado pushed it back. But, alas, the one in his grip was not yet dead. Its jaws opened wide and those vicious inner teeth flashed out, catching the side of his head and breaking one of the fangs. The other creature ripped at the already gaping wound of Adelantado's thigh. The mighty angel roared in pain as his luminescent green blood poured freely. He crushed the neck of the demon in his fist and fell to one knee. The remaining Malvado rose up, towering over Adelantado, to deliver the fatal blow. The leader of the women ran toward them. She grabbed up the spike tail lying on the ground, diving underneath the Malvado and stabbing upward. The spike dug deeply into the demon's flesh, and it screamed in pain as she rolled away to avoid its yellow hissing blood. The Malvado took one step toward her before its head jerked to the side and flopped against its shoulder. Adelantado, in a desperate effort, had sliced through the creature's neck. It dropped to the ground, twitched, then lay still. Adelantado ripped the head of the demon from its body, then turned toward the jungle's edge, pausing only to retrieve his mask. His hand never reached it as he fell to the ground, too wounded to move. Three women ran toward him, their swords raised to dispatch him. Their leader stepped forward and stopped them with a firm voice. Her subordinates paused and reluctantly lowered their weapons. I suddenly laughed out loud, I yelled to the heavens. They had beaten the demons. These strange women, they had faced Lucifer's monsters and prevailed. I slapped the water, shook my fist, and screamed with delight. The leader gazed out toward me, and I immediately calmed myself, realizing that their reception to me might not be any less than their regard for the Malvados. I gave her a half-hearted wave, not expecting a response. She motioned for me to swim back, then held her hands toward me, palms open in my direction. I took that as her showing me she held no weapon. What choice did I have? I crawled onto the beach and sat, breathing heavily, coughing with the salt in my throat. The Englishman was already ashore with two women standing guard over him. I had little pity for him. I would have him placed in those cursed iron collars. The women now spread out, forming a rough perimeter, watching the trees and the brush. The brave fallen were laid out next to each other, proud warriors, even in death. The remains of the slavers were covered with sand and ignored. The leader, their commander, looked down at me. She was more than just striking. Her face was carved as the ancient statues of Rome, with strength and grandeur together. 
She had scars tattooed along the lower part of her forehead, just above her eyes, and on her bare shoulders from front to back. They were obviously recognitions of her status. Her skin had an unbroken blackness that seemed to absorb sunlight. The strength she exuded was almost overpowering. I weakly clapped my hands together and smiled. Bendiga a todos. I spoke within my heavy breathing. Thank you, thank you all. I am at your mercy. I bowed my head slightly, keeping my eyes on hers, holding my clasped hands in front of me. She doesn't understand you, the Englishman said. The commander then spoke to him in her language. He responded in kind and she walked away. You speak their tongue? I asked. I, he responded. I've had dealings with her people many times. I reflexively spit in his direction. You are a bastard. I've no slaves of my own, he replied. I merely translate. God will judge your guilt, I responded. He shrugged. No one is innocent, my friend. English, Portuguese, Spanish I've worked for them all. His point was true. Despite the Crown's decree for my friends at most, the history of my own countrymen was not defensible. It doesn't matter, he continued. We're their slaves now. If I was her, I'd have our blood spilled here and our bodies washed out for the sharks. We watched as the women scavenged the longboats, collecting anything that could be used as weapons. The tow ropes were pulled free and the boat hook stacked nearby. Crude spears were fashioned from English knives and the oaring poles. The commander walked the area, inspecting their work, giving orders when needed. I saw her pause and pick something from the sand. It was Adele and Otto's mask. She brushed it off and examined it, running her fingers along the edges. It had markings on the front that seemed to be of interest to her. The Englishman's name was Edward. He was, as he stated, a translator in many tongues. He was upon this ship because he was fluent in Fawn, the language of these women. But who were they? Where had they come of such abilities, to stand in defiance of Lucifer's demons and defeat them? The kingdom of Dahomey, Edward responded to my question. They have fought the Portuguese, the Dutch, and my own people. These women are the king's elite soldiers, his personal guard. Do not be fooled by their gender. There were legends of such Amazons in ancient writings, but that they did exist was not something I had believed possible. They call themselves Minos, he continued. That one is their leader. He pointed to the commander. She is called Nan. How did they end up as? I could not even say the word slave, as it just seemed incredulous to believe of these women. The battle with the Portuguese. They stood their ground to allow their king to escape a trap. He paused to glance around at the women. It was a magnificent charge directly into the guns. Most of them died. The rest were taken and sold at the market. One of the women approached our guards and spoke to them. They prompted us to our feet with their swords. Apparently Nan wants to talk to us, Edward explained. And I would like to talk to her, I replied. There is much she should know about this place. We were taken to the copse of trees on the other side of the beached longboats. Adele and Otto lay under the shade of the largest tree, unconscious but still alive. A woman tended to his wounds. Next to her was a small fire and a bowl catching sap from a slash in the tree trunk. The woman was spreading the sticky gel into the open wounds of Adele and Otto. I noticed Edward's confusion and explained to him. The tree sap prevents infection, I told him. There is a common history of this, from many different cultures. Even the native Tamuku of my home in La Florida, used it as a medicine. How did they know which tree to pick? He asked. These are soldiers, I replied. I'm sure they have suffered enough carnage to know what sort of medicine works and what doesn't, even when in a strange land. Do other women place themselves on Adele and Otto's arms, as if to hold him down? She pulled a burning branch from the fire and placed it on the wound, igniting the sap. I nodded. They're cauterizing the wound to seal it, I explained to Edward. It flared and burned instantly. I had no doubt, had Adele and Otto been awake, he would have thrown the women aside with little effort. Why don't they just kill the thing? Edward asked. Because they are not like us, I replied. Nan approached us and spoke, looking directly at me. She knows you've been stranded here, Edward translated. She wants to know what those creatures are that attacked us and what this thing is. 
Nan continued staring at me. I could sense that she wasn't just listening to the words I said, she was assessing me, to assign the proper weight to my words. All great leaders throughout history share this trait. I explained as best I could and morning soon turned into afternoon. These women were from another land and culture. I had no idea which god they worshipped, nor did I want to become a sacrificial missionary, so I refrained from interjecting my beliefs of war between heaven and hell. Besides, Edward was a Protestant, and I did not want to risk him altering my words to serve his false religion. I told her about Giganti and Assassino, and how they and Adele and Tato had fought many battles against the demons. I pulled the map from inside my shirt and showed her how the wooded terrain favored the evil ones, but that they avoided the areas that were sparse of trees. I pointed to my cave on the map and told her I rarely left it, but how it commanded a view of the entire valley. Nan asked me where the Nephilim were. There was an open area near a stream where the Nephilim congregated at night on occasion, but only for a few hours at best. She took special interest in this, but I quickly told her that any attempt to attack the Nephilim would be folly. She looked toward the ship anchored offshore. It was derelict. The Malvados had certainly killed the few crewmembers on board. The ship has supplies and weapons, but it's useless as long as the Malvados are able to get to the water, I said. Edward translated and she responded. Edward shook his head and replied to her. What? I asked. She wants to know if the ship can take them home, he answered. I told her it was impossible. Even if we could get to it, we'd have to teach them to sail it. They probably already know most of it, having watched the sailors work when topside, I replied. He dismissed my comment. The captain is dead as is the navigator. I can navigate. I know exactly where we are, I said. I can get them back home. Tell her that. He stared at me for a moment, then translated for her. She nodded and spoke directly to me. She said you will take them home. After they kill the Malvados. Edward sighed. You may have just doomed us all. The roar interrupted us. Adel and Tato had come out of his stupor and was fighting to his feet. Women quickly surrounded him with their makeshift spears. He was weak and unsteady, but there was no doubt he wouldn't hesitate to fight. He roared again, spreading his arms in the manner that the Nephilim did when challenging the Malvados. Nan jumped to her feet and raced over, yelling at her women and waving them back. Her soldiers obeyed, backing away and opening a path of escape toward the jungle. For the briefest of moments I feared he wouldn't take advantage of his freedom, that he would choose to attack and kill as many of the Minos as he could. He roared again, then disappeared into the brush. Night soon fell. Edward and I sat between the longboats. We no longer had guards, where would we go? He was telling me of his childhood, being born in one of the coastal trading ports on the west coast of Africa, and how he had a true respect for the native Africans. This was to assuage his guilt more than to convince me. Though he did not hunt them and owned none, he was comfortable that others did. I could not help but remember the brave black men and women who fought at Mos, friends of my family who sacrificed themselves to protect my beloved San Augustine. He was correct, none of us were innocent. But at least I was aware. She's coming, Edward said as Nan approached and spoke. She wants to find the Nephilim, Edward translated. No, tell her no. I looked directly at her. They will slaughter your soldiers if you attack them. He translated. For the first time I saw a slight smile at the edges of her lips as she responded. Edward reacted in surprise. She isn't taking her soldiers, just you. Edward laughed. Well, there you go. Three hours later, I stood in the open area near the stream. Nan stood nearby, the large pouch we had dragged with us on the ground next to us. We had kept to the rocks and taken a longer path to avoid detection by the Malvados. The moon illuminated everything in harsh contrast. We could see easily but were taken by a slight crackling sound from the shadows, almost like a dull clicking. The sounds got louder and moved around us, they were here. Nan raised her arms high toward the sky, twisting her hands slowly, as a low melodic chant grew from her throat. We were completely defenseless now and inviting our destruction at their discretion. The rustle to our left and Giganti stepped from the darkness. His blades were extended, though one of them was broken. 
His armor had burn marks and a jagged gash across his mask. Assassino soon appeared to our right. His condition was not much better than his compatriot. I noted the tendrils on the right side of his mask were missing, ripped away. Every fiber of my body was telling me to run. Something about Nan's confidence stayed me, the power she had over others had extended to me as well. Adele and Tato emerged directly in front of her. His jaws, bared of his mask, flexed as he tilted his head. I repeated the Lord's Prayer silently to myself. Nan stopped chanting and gestured for me to bring the pouch forward. I placed it on the ground in front of her and stepped back. She reached inside and pulled out the Nephilim spear. She had learned how to retract the blades on it, but Giganti and Assassino tensed as if for battle. Nan tossed it gently at Adelantado's feet. She then produced the head of the Malvado killed by Adelantado on the beach. With an almost reverential posture, she placed it on the ground, next to the spear. Backing away, she indicated it was his. Finally, from the pouch, the last item, Adelantado's mask. Nan pointed at the marks on the front, then pointed to the tops of the trees, then to him, and opened her hand as if asking a question. I realized that she was asking if these marks counted the Malvados he had killed. She then lifted the mask to the side of her face, and pointed to the scars above her eyes. Adele and Tato touched her forehead lightly and nodded. She held the mask out with both hands, lowering her head in honor of his valor. He took the mask, placed it on his face and attached it to his armor with two short tubes. His chest expanded as he inhaled deeply in satisfaction. Then he picked up the spear and tapped the side of it against his thigh wound, where the cauterizing had already sealed the gash and healed it. Adele and Tato extended the spear toward Nan, offering it to her. She accepted his gift and, with it, she pointed to the trees, indicating the Malvados. Then she extended the blade and made a stabbing motion into the ground. The three Nephilim nodded their heads and clicked in response, they had a common enemy and a common cause. No words were needed, none could be exchanged between them, but I had the sense that they understood more about each other than most men do about their own brothers. Nan reached back to me, and I handed her my map of the island. She unrolled it on the ground. Adele and Tato watched as her finger moved along the map, pointing out certain areas, jabbing at certain points. She looked up at him and waited. Adele and Tato crouched down and traced his finger across the map. Nan nodded and pointed to another area, then smiled at him. It was amazing. They were strategizing, creating an alliance in the stillness of the night, two completely different beings with nothing in common, except their experience in war. I glanced up to the heavens where the brightest stars struggled to make their presence known against the light of the moon. Was he watching this? Nan and I returned to the beach just before sunrise. The Minos had fortified their encampment with a wall of sharpened sticks placed in parallel lines to the jungle's edge, creating a maze that would force the Malvados to impale themselves or walk into a killing field. Women nearby were fashioning fire grenades made of wadded cloth and pine sap, to be used as a last defense, to set it afire if the Malvados overran them. The rest of the day was spent in preparation for the events of the coming evening. Her strategy was brilliant. And, as with most things of that nature, extremely fragile. Edward was forced to translate it to me and, I'm sure, he must have questioned if we had passed the point of sanity. I already knew my part. Everything depended on timing and communication. I, dear friend, was in charge of that. I gathered the materials necessary for my role. My spyglass would be crucial, of course. My machete would not be of much use, but I took it anyway. Finally, I collected several of the fire grenades into a pouch. I wish you luck, Edward said to me. Our survival depends on you. Not me, them, I nodded toward the Minos. If for some reason you are the only one to live another day, remember this. Remember them when you return to your life. I could never return to the life I had before, he looked to the ground. I know that now. As you said, none of us are innocent of guilt. I tied the pouch and slung it over my shoulder. You are a Protestant. He nodded. Lutheran. Pray to your God for forgiveness, I said. I will also pray for you, to mine. 
With that, I turned and headed into the jungle. I made my way back to my former home in the cave high on the mountainside. I placed the grenades against the entrance and made a small fire. We would have only half an hour between the setting of the sun and complete darkness to make Nan's plan work. Using my spyglass, I saw Nan and four of her soldiers creeping through the brush along the rocks, heading toward the grove where the eggs had fallen. The Malvados were very protective of that area, though I had no idea how many of those eggs awaited new victims. Nan was in position. I saw the flicker of embers as they lit the small sticks they gripped between their teeth. It was time. I lifted the first grenade by its short rope and passed it through the flames of my fire. It ignited immediately. I began singing the Tidum Laudamus, the song of Saint Augustine, the patron saint of my home, as I swung the grenade. The flames formed a circle of light as I spun it harder and released it. The fireball sailed high into the sky, then turned toward earth and disappeared. Had they seen the signal? Should I try another? I began to panic. There. A flare of light among the trees. And another. The Minos were throwing their grenades into the grove of eggs, and fleming them. Several of the pine trees began to ignite as well, casting harsh shadows across the ground. The screeches of the Malvados rose above the valley as they raced toward the grove. Run. I mentally screamed at the women as I ignited another grenade and sent it as high as I could in a flaming arc. Now run. The Mino saw the signal and turned back, following the rocky path as they headed toward the crevasse that led up the mountainside. They paused only long enough to ignite more grenades and throw them at the pines. The trees flared and burned brightly. I shifted my spyglass behind them. The Malvados were on the ground. The flames prevented them from using the branches and forced them to the narrow path, slowing their pursuit. Nan and her warriors reached the crevasse and crawled through it, climbing up and scrambling over the bare rock. The Malvados followed, emerging from the jungle onto the escarpment. I counted twelve of them, the remaining entirety of their number on the island. Their claws assisted them on the rocks, and I was certain the women could hear their screeching and scratching from behind. Above was the crest of the mountain where Adele and Tato had been trapped between the Malvados and the cliff over the rocks of the beach. One of the women slipped and the lead Malvado reached out to grab her. The spear from Adele and Tato pierced its head, killing it instantly. Nan pulled it free as the creature fell away, then lifted her sister back onto the rocks, pushing her forward to continue their climb. They were almost to the top. I launched another fire grenade into the air. The shadowy figures of five more Minos arose on the crest, waiting for their sisters. I held my breath, for this was the most crucial part of the plan. Nan had to allow the Malvados catch up. They paused just under the lip of the mountaintop and waited. The demons increased their pace, scrambling toward their prey. Even if they saw the five women on top, it would have made no difference. What could ten do against their power and numbers? Closer and closer, Nan and the four held to the rocks, exposed. Wait. Wait. Now. As if they heard the command in my head, the women turned and scrambled up, barely a few feet ahead of the horde. Nan and her brave Minos raced into the arms of their waiting sisters, pushing them off the ledge, wrapping their arms and legs around them in a death embrace. I could make out the longboat ropes tied around the ankles of the awaiting Minos as they fell toward the beach below them. The ropes had been measured carefully, to reach above the sand, and the heavy twine had been thin to stretch, relieving the force of gravity on their bodies during the fall. The Malvados in the front stopped, confused, staring down at their escaped prey. The ones behind, ignorant of the event, still moved onto the rocks, pushing forward. The mighty roars of three voices could be heard across the valley, as the Nephilim stepped from their hiding places behind the Malvados, blocking their path back down the mountain. The mighty giants charged into the serpents, spears and blades flashing in the remaining rays of the sun. Giganti grabbed one after another in his huge hands, breaking necks and ripping open the jaws of his opponents. Assassino ducked and rolled between them, jabbing at their chests, slicing at their necks. And Adele and Tato moved as if possessed, using his forearm under the neck of one creature, 
slicing down with his blade to rip open its torso, then spinning into the next demon with an upward stroke of the blades. All the while, they pushed forward, using the dead bodies as battering rams. The Malvado slipped and fell over the cliff's edge, followed by another, down toward the beach, where the Minos had arranged the sharpened sticks of their defensive wall among the rocks, creating a death zone. Another. Then another. Those that didn't fall to their doom faced the wrath of these avenging angels. It was as if the most glorious church tapestry depicting the scripture of Revelation had come to life before my eyes. And silence. The battle was over. The three Nephilim raised the severed heads of Malvados into the air and roared in victory as the last vestige of light disappeared and darkness concealed the massacre. I returned to the beach in the morning. The bodies of the Malvados littered the rocks, many of them still impaled on the sharp sticks. The Minos were gathering fruit and securing water in the wooden casks of the longboats. The Nephilim were not to be seen. Their mission here was done. I was certain they had already returned to the heavens. I saw Edward with Nan and walked toward them. Edward's left arm was hanging loose, his shirt ripped open. The wound underneath had pine sap drying on it. It seemed that he not been a mere translator after all, and had done his part to subdue the Malvados who survived the fall. Nan turned and smiled when she saw me. I cannot tell you how beautiful she looked at that moment. Tall, radiating strength and confidence, she glowed with the beatific light of the blessed. Jorge, she said, I thank you. It was in broken Spanish and I could see Edward smiling. She then took my face in her hands and kissed my forehead. She's honoring you, Edward said. She wanted to cut a tattoo on your head, but I told her it was not your way. With a step back, she pointed to me, then to the ship offshore. She wanted me to take them home, as I had said. I smiled and swore to the Heavenly Father that I would see these warriors back to their homeland or die in the process. I won't bore you with the details. As I surmised, they were quick learners in sailing. My knowledge of the stars allowed us to find the currents we needed to return to Africa, to their home and freedom. Edward and I stayed with the Minos in the Kingdom of Dahomey for eight years until he died of the plague. We became friends and I miss him. I hope he found peace. I struggled with my decision to return to Spain. Perhaps the fear of blasphemy cowed me, but I realized that the Heavenly Father wanted me to tell my story, even at the risk of my life. And so, I am here. I tell you, my friend, there is a war between heaven and hell that goes unseen by us. Demons do exist, but so do angels. They are not as we know them in the artwork of the masters, they are not the perfect beings we envision. They are ugly, hideous, violent, and as foreign to our eyes as the Nephilim. They can also be beautiful, strong, black, like the Minos, and more godly in their sisterhood than most have ever seen in their brethren. I tell you this not to diminish his holiness in the Vatican. With his wisdom and the guidance of our Heavenly Father, we can defeat these malvados when they appear again. But, I fear the Lord might not send the Nephilim to fight our battle for us next time. What will we say to God if we allow the angels he has already placed among us to be enslaved? Indeed, what if we ignore that we can all, like the Minos, be the defenders of humankind? If our lot is to enslave each other and arrogantly war upon those who could enrich us, then Satan has already won. I pray that you believe me and will honor my request. The document remained on the desk in front of Cardinal Cartega, where Father Lorenzo had placed it. The Cardinal continued staring out his window at the skyline of Madrid. A light snow had already dusted the spires of the church, and the fireplace glowed brightly with warmth. What became of this man? The Cardinal asked. He returned to La Florida, Lorenzo responded. I had no reason to hold him here, so I gave him blessings and told him I would consider his request. To show this to His Holiness, the Pope. He glanced to the stack of bound papers. As he related it to me, yes. I took it down word for word. Lorenzo shifted uncomfortably in the large wooden chair. I would not have believed it myself nor have disturbed your eminence with it, but there was more, if I may. He asked as he reached for the large leather satchel next to him. Partega raised an eyebrow and nodded. Lorenzo pulled out an elongated skull, 
several sharp teeth still present in the jaw. He placed it on the desk. The cardinal leaned over the skull, examining it. Amazing, he said under his breath. Yes, Lorenzo replied, encouraged by the cardinal's interest. I thought it was extraordinary. It's almost biblical, the cardinal continued. I agree, Lorenzo replied. I felt the same way as he related his tale. But we already have a Bible, do we not? One that has been guided by the hand of God. Words that the people have learned to trust and, in that, to trust us. The cardinal picked up the document. It does not include these women warriors or this strange description of the Nephilim, does it? Lorenzo's heart sank. But shouldn't the Holy Father know? What if Jorge's story is the truth? It is rare to find a kingdom built purely on foundations of truth, Cartago replied. But just as surely, they can be brought down by it. The cardinal tossed the papers into the fireplace. Lorenzo stared, his mouth open in shock as the pages flared and curled into embers. I will honor your church with a visit in the coming week, as an acknowledgement of your service. And your silence. The cardinal extended his hand. Lorenzo stood, kissed Cartago's ring, and bowed, backing out of the cardinal's office. Cartago's gaze turned to the skull on his desk. Was it truly a creature of Satan? Was this a soldier in Lucifer's war of the coming apocalypse? He leaned forward, his head resting on his hands as he stared at it. He felt all of hell staring back. Story 3 Homestead by Delilah S. Dawson Sometime between midnight and dawn, Lucy wakes to the sound of her little dog, Dash, barking his fool head off. The one-room farmhouse is still and dark, and Lucy reaches for Robert's side of the bed before remembering that he's gone. Dash, you hush now, she whispers. But Dash doesn't hush. He barks and growls at the rough wood door, clawing at it like he's digging out a gopher. Lucy pushes herself to sitting, not an easy task, with her belly nine months gone. It's a hot, still night, ribbons of moonlight shining in through the house's many cracks. One hand rubbing the curve of her stomach, she creeps to the door and puts her eye to a gap in the boards. Dash whines and paws at her ankles, and she doesn't have the heart to push him away. Outside, nothing seems amiss. The barn is locked up tight, the pigs are shadowy lumps in their wallow, and what's left of the lake glimmers with starlight. None of the animals are roused or making noise, and for the long moment that she watches, nothing moves not even a breath of a breeze ruffling the endless miles of prairie grasses. Dash wedges his snout under the door, growling, and Lucy sighs. You should have gone out earlier, fool. She opens the door, and Dash squeezes out and sprints past the outhouse toward the lake. Goosebumps ripple down Lucy's shoulders, and she crosses her arms and tries to rub them away. The sky is so wide and soft out here that it feels like she's being suffocated by a velvet pillow. Looking up almost makes her dizzy. Although the sky is clear, there's a sudden flash like lightning, the whole world momentarily bright white, but without the clap of thunder. A breeze blows through the grass and over her like ripples in a pond. Dash, she calls, but not too loud. The closest neighbors are five miles off, but yelling still seems rude. The little terrier doesn't bark in reply or run home, and Lucy yawns so hard her jaw cracks. She heads back inside, one hand supporting her aching back. Dash knows his way home, and she's not waiting up all night for a silly dog. Robert promised he'd be home in five days and that's tomorrow, and Robert doesn't lie. Lucy closes the door and pulls in the string before settling down on the crackling mattress for a night of restless sleep. 
an odd chittering sound starts up outside, some new sort of frog, maybe, and it makes her skin crawl. She tosses and turns in dreams of a dark form standing over her, a tall, thin shadow reaching to caress her face. Robert, she calls, voice raspy, half asleep. But when she wakes up, she's alone. The door is open. Her throat hurts, maybe from crying. Dash is still gone. Lucy wakes again at the rooster's call and runs eagerly to the door, but of course Robert isn't home yet. It's a good twenty miles to town, and it's not like he'd leave before there was light. Even so, she stands in the door hunting for a smudge moving on the horizon, be it dog or man, rubbing the swollen belly straining against her patched shift. The grasses part as if a large man is striding through the field, but there's no one there, just a trick of the light. It's not that she's scared to be alone. Lucy was pumping water at three, minding babies at five, birthing cows that same year because Daddy said she had the smallest hands. It's more that. Lucy remembers watching her ma before Jeb and Sarah were born. Restless, aching, her temper a frayed thing, stretched thin. That's how Lucy feels now. And what if the baby, like her daddy's calves, needs help? Sure, Robert's hands are too big and clumsy, but he could gallop for the town doctor or fetch Mrs. Gunderson from the next farm over. As she feeds the chickens and hunts for their ever-dwindling eggs, she notices an odd mark on the barn, like a scorch mark. When she rubs a hand over it, it doesn't smear or rub away. She doesn't think it was there yesterday, but pregnancy does funny things to her mind and memory. There are more scorch marks on the ground, the grass burned black as if by fire, but only in one place. A shooting star, maybe? It would be better if Robert was here. He would surely know what to do. Probably stop to buy me a pretty ribbon, she muses into the cow's warm side as milk hisses into the bucket and the calf bleats from where he's tied up. Starving, empty, with the desperation of a yowling cat in her gut, Lucy gulps sweet, hot milk right from the pail, ignoring how it soaks the front of her shift. Outside, the sun beats down like it longs to grind her into dust. The pigs stagger in from the edge of the lake, their faces caked in lumpy black mud. The drought is even worse now, and the lake is sinking in, making the animals press deep into the sucking mud just to slake their thirst. Robert said this was the perfect place to build their homestead, but now Lucy isn't so sure. The well water tastes funny, and the crops keep failing, and the lake is disappearing. Lucy isn't a clever girl her father and Robert both told her so but she knows that something's wrong. She scans the fields for Dash as she trudges out to the other barn. They keep it locked against horse thieves at night and every morning she's greeted by gentle Belle and Beau whinnying a welcome as the handsome handful of a stallion named Devil Bugles and tries to bust down the barn wall. Belle, Beau, she hollers as she fumbles the key. You all awake? Within, the barn is still and silent. A goose walks over her grave, and Lucy lingers in the summer sun. Dash should be by her side, darting in to snap the necks of the scattering mice, but she hasn't seen him since he ran out the door last night. Devil, you being good, she calls, louder than usual. The response is a disturbingly weak kick, hooves against wood. I reckon not, she mutters. For some reason, Lucy doesn't want to go into the barn but she knows that if Robert was here, 
he'd remind her that she's got to pull her weight, no matter how big she's got. Belle and Beau are both pressed back against the walls of their stalls, eyes wide and rolling. The draft horses are usually sensible things, but they're acting scared, or maybe they're sick. Lucy unlatches Belle's stall door, and the mare bolts out into the sun with Beau hot on her heels. They always head straight out for the lake to drink, but instead they just stand there against the fence, stamping nervously. Something moves out by the water, something big and dark and tall, but when she blinks, it's gone. Maybe it's a summer bear, starving in mangy, on the hunt. Maybe that's why the horses are so nervous. Lucy looks up at the sky, thinking maybe there's a twister coming. The horses surely know something she doesn't. When she gets to Devil's stall, he's lying down, slick with sweat. Get up now, she tells him, but he won't, so she fetches a halter and tugs him to standing. His legs tremble, but he follows her outside and stands where she leaves him, belly swollen and heaving. Bell and Beau keep their distance, and Lucy knows she should walk him, but she's got more chores to do yet and he's a vicious thing. Outside, she looks to the lake, now a muddy mess as the water dries up, leaving odd shapes as what's long been hidden underneath the surface is revealed. Bulbous, slime-coated forms poke up like rotten teeth, heat rising off them like mist. Something screams, a high, vicious sound, and one of the dead, crooked trees falls over in a hail of mud and leaves. Maybe the bear found its prey. Maybe she's seeing things that ain't there. The horses still won't drink. She calls for Dash, but there's no answering bark. Holding up her stomach with an arm, she looks toward town, toward the direction that should bring Robert back. Your daddy's on the road now, she says softly. As if in response, the tadpole squirms in her belly, sending up a rancid burp. Robert hates it when Lucy does that, but Robert's supposed to be here, and he's not, so why would she hold it in? Lucy keeps on with her chores, but her head feels emptier than usual. Time passes funny when a creature is heavy with child and about to burst. The day goes on forever, and she can't stop looking toward town. She'd swear she sees things moving in the muck of the lake, parting the tall grasses like buffalo, making the air quiver like august heat on stone. She calls for Dash again and again, but the little dog doesn't turn up. As twilight fades to dark, she leans against the door of the crooked farmhouse, staring out at odd, red flashes dancing over the water. Must be the sunset striking fireflies, some trick of the light. Heavy, hulking shadows seem to stalk across the horizon. The coyotes are singing, and there's something odd in their song. She hopes they didn't snatch Dash up little thing that he is. She already double-checked all the doors and fences, made sure everything was tight and snug. She checked the stalls for rattlesnakes and walked devil and locked the barn door. Maybe the wagon was too small to carry all the good things your daddy's bringin', Lucy murmurs to her belly, and he has to borrow a bigger one. He'll be home tomorrow, I know it. She falls asleep in the rocking chair with her belly under one hand and the gun under the other. She doesn't know much, but she knows something feels wrong. In Lucy's dreams, somebody is screaming, and when she jerks awake the screaming continues. Her fingers curl around the gun's sweat-slicked stock. Maybe it's Robert, and he needs her help. There's panthers and bears and wolves, after all, 
and she's seen their silhouettes in every shifting shadow these past few days. She crams her feet into his old boots and waddles for the door. But it's not Robert that's screaming, and she knows it. Dash. Her little dog normally sleeps by the fire, but well, he never came back, did he? Lucy wrenches open the door, expecting to see Robert valiantly fighting a grizzly, but everything looks just as it should if not for the screaming. It's the pigs, she can tell now, all of them hollering in pure terror, and she hurries to their pen, Robert's gun clutched in her hands. She doesn't like to kill things, hates twisting even the meanest hen's neck on the hungriest day, but whatever's causing trouble can't be allowed to live. They need those pigs. The moon is a scant sliver, but Lucy sees eight of the huge, mud-spackled beasts huddled up against the fences, making the wood boards creak and belly out. There's something big in the middle of their sty, sunk in the mud, something they're trying to get away from. That mangy, hungry bear, maybe. She sets the gun tight against her shoulder and pulls the trigger, just trying to scare it off. The bear doesn't move, and Lucy edges closer and realizes. It's the ninth hog, turned over on its side, and gone dreadfully still. Well, not exactly still. It's shaking. But like it's shaking from the inside. As Lucy creeps closer, tripping over hidden lumps in the sty mud, the trembling pig bursts open. Blood splashes hot over her cheeks. She scrubs a fist over sticky eyelashes and watches something God Almighty, what is that, slither out of the pig. She steps closer and shoots again, another miss. The thing it's like a snake, or a worm, but flesh-covered and toothy turns toward her, almost like it's looking for her, and she drops the empty gun and runs for the barn amid a chorus of hog screams. Those pigs they might be the only thing that can save the failing farm, and they can't afford to lose another one. Shaking like a leaf, clumsy as an ox, Lucy snatches the pitchfork from where it leans against the barn and hurries back out to the hog pen. The slithery thing rushes to meet her, and the baby jerks in her stomach like it wants to run away, and she stabs that pitchfork straight down. She feels it in her bones as the tines punch through the creature and stick in the hard earth. Like a snake, it's a mix of soft and hard, bone and flesh, but it writhes in death like any other animal does. There's a sizzle, and Lucy looks down to find its blood burning a hole in Robert's old boot. She wipes it off against a post and steps back farther and farther away from this this thing. Robert, she calls before remembering he's not there. The hogs settle down a bit and sniff their fallen friend in the way pigs have, almost like they could have feelings, if they didn't taste so good, and her face goes all hot and just pours tears. She's trembling, arms wrapped around her belly. Pitchfork twitching as whatever the hell that thing is dies. The pitchfork's wood handle falls to the ground, the metal tines dissolve to syrup. This none of this is possible. Lucy grew up in a big family, and moving out to the prairie homestead with Robert made her lonely as a cloud, but she's never felt so alone in her life as she does right now like she's a million miles from anything she loves, and she wants to fall to the ground and beat it with her fists until it opens up and swallows her whole. Out of nowhere, one of the hogs starts screaming again. The other animals stampede away from it to the opposite side of the paddock, and Lucy feels like she might never blink again because she's stuck watching this pig she's raised from a little pink suckling fall to its side and start shaking, just like the last one did. 
across the sty, another pig screams and falls. And another. And another. For pigs on their sides, twitching like they're full of bees. The remaining pigs don't know what to do, but they're smart, and they're watching. Lucy just stands there, frozen. The child writhes in her belly, forcing hot bile up the back of her throat. Whatever that snake thing is, it's not something that's got any business existing. She's no good at reloading the shotgun, and the bullets are all the way inside the house. The pitchfork's destroyed, and a knife is too puny to kill whatever's coming out of those dying pigs. She's got to get away. Town's twenty miles from here, but the Gunderson farmstead is only five, and for all that they don't speak much English, they're sturdy folk, and that Mr. Gunderson hates a snake. Lucy fumbles with the barn key and she can only hope that Devil's in better shape after she walked him in circles for an hour. She throws open the door and snatches his bridle off the wall, but he's lying on his side in his stall, panting like he's run a mile, his bloated belly trembling in an all-too-familiar way. Oh, Robert, Lucy murmurs. You promised me he'd sire a line of champions. Devil's a lost cause, but the draft horses seem fine, so she grabs Bell's rope halter and leads the mare over to a stack of hay bales. The big horse is nervous as a bride, her eyes rolling every which way as she wickers nervously to bow. After tying her halter into reins, Lucy tosses them over Bell's neck. I'll bring her back, bow, she murmurs leaping up with every ounce of strength she has to straddle the broad, warm back. It's a good thing Lucy took to wearing Robert's old breeches under her dress, and it's likewise fortunate that her daddy made sure she could ride, for all that Robert says it's unladylike. Her belly makes her unbalanced and awkward, and she knows full well that riding isn't good for the child, but she understands on a bone-deep level that if she doesn't get off the farm, her child won't stand a chance of living to see his daddy. Back in his stall, Devil lets out a sound no horse should ever make, a sort of wheezing, groaning squeal that ends in a wet, cracking splatter, and Lucy nudges Belle with her knees, pointing her out the barn doors. The mare is happy to oblige, snorting as she gathers herself for a run. It's not safe to gallop a horse at night across a prairie full of hidden gopher holes, but it's a hell of a lot safer than sticking around that barn to see what came out of Devil. Lucy used to love a good gallop, but that was before she was chock full of child and scared for her life. It takes everything she is just to stay upright, clinging to Belle's sweaty back, her legs aching, spread too wide around the horse's barrel gut. One of Lucy's boots slips off, and all she can do is cry. Belle stumbles and catches herself, and there's a sharp pop somewhere up inside of Lucy's belly. Hot liquid gushes down her thighs, making Belle's back all the harder to cling to. Lucy knows it's her waters, and she knows that's bad but she tells herself it's piss to keep from going mad with worry. As they gallop, the coyotes call to each other, less a song than a warning, and the night all runs together, endless dark grasses and scrubby trees lit by those dancing red lights, the mountains looming shadows in the distance and the woman's only thoughts as repetitive as the horse's thundering hooves, don't step in a hole, don't fall off, don't step in a hole, don't fall off, a prayer for them both. The child goes still inside her, and she pins her lips against wave after wave of nausea. The only sign that time is passing is Belle's exhaustion, her sides groaning like bellows and slick with sweat. She tries to fall off to a trot, 
but Lucy kicks the poor thing with all she's got, both feet bare now, her breeches soaked. Belle gives a little buck of indignancy and keeps on, but she can't go on forever. Neither, for that matter, can Lucy. She's not even steering, and she reckons the only reason they end up where they're headed is because when Mr. Gunderson borrows Belle for plowing, he gives her oats afterward as a treat. The neighbor's fine farmstead rises up from the prairie like a squat black ghost, German and disapproving, all straight lines as harsh as their language. Mr. Gunderson, Lucy shouts as Belle drops down to a trot. Lucy nearly bounces off, each smack of her rump against the mare's spine slamming pain directly into her aching belly. When Belle is walking, Lucy slides off. Her feet are numb, stupid rocks, and she stumbles and falls to her knees on the hard ground. Mr. Gunderson, help! The only answer is Belle snorting nervously. No dogs bark, and she knows the Gundersons have three. No one hollers a hello or comes rushing out with a gun. The farm is just dead silent. It's a hot night, but Lucy's as cold as Christmas as she lumbers up to standing. When she puts a hand on her belly, it's taut and hard and it tightens under her palm in a way that suggests time is no longer her friend. Nothing's screaming, at least. Maybe the Gundersons and their dogs went into town, just like Robert did, to sell furs with the mountain men and hear the news. Neighbors are neighbors, and they won't mind if Lucy takes shelter here, not when they learn what happened back home. Leaving Belle to graze, she walks up to the dark house, calling out to the Gundersons, doing the neighborly thing to let them know she's here. When she raises her fist to knock, the door creaks open under her touch, and she only pauses a moment before pushing her way in. They got a peculiar scent, the Gundersons, boiled cabbage and sausage and some soap they make with flowers, and it's usually comforting but just now it makes her gut royal. Mr. Gunderson? It's me, Lucy. I could surely use some help. The house is utterly still, and she's almost grateful. She couldn't explain what happened back home to someone who speaks her language, much less folks who mostly smile and say, Jaw, no matter what she says. She'll stay here tonight try to calm herself down, and then. Oh, Robert. You promised it would only be five days, she whispers. Her heart sinks when she realizes that she's still missing that extra pair of hands. She'd hoped Mrs. Gunderson would know a thing or two about babies, but now Lucy is alone and even farther away from the doctor in town. A woman's job is work that's what Robert always says. No time for wool gathering. She heads for the stove to start up a fire, but there are embers in there, still cherry red. As she adds in some kindling, she thinks the Gundersons must have left recently, for the fire to still be warm. The baby hairs rise up on her neck as she patters barefoot through their big room lighting lanterns and candles and feeling like she's someplace she doesn't belong, but like there's nowhere else she can go. The leaking continues, and she has to stop and breathe funny as her belly tightens and her innards growl. She almost heads into the bedroom, but she knows how much work went into that pretty piecework quilt she's seen on the Gunderson's bed. Instead, she heads out to the barn with a lantern to fetch a horse blanket, some old rag they won't mind getting ruined. The farmyard is deadly still, the cows asleep in their paddock, as cows ought to be. The Gundersons, like Robert, built all their fences to extend out into the onceful lake 
so the animals could drink at will, and the moon glints off the wet expanse in a way that makes Lucy stop and stare. There are odd shapes out there, poking up out of the pudding muck, strange things that surely aren't stumps or rocks. From out here, they almost look like eggs. And she could ignore that if not for one particular lump that's not like the others, one that's about the size and shape of a large German man. She steps closer, hurrying, hurting, picking her way through the mud, hating the clammy ooze between her toes but desperate to understand what she's seeing. She stops when she knows. It's Mr. Gunderson, lying on his back in the mud wallow that was once a lake, a bloody, gaping hole in his chest suggesting there's not a damn thing she can do to help him. One of his dogs, the spotted one, lies at his side, just torn to bits. All around them are big, leathery plant things, almost like eggs, rising up from the mud. A few of the eggs have bloomed like morning glories, but the remaining ones are almost see-through, and the shapes inside seem to wiggle in the lantern's light, surely some trick of the flame and Lucy's own exhaustion. One of the egg things twitches, or her mind tells her it does, and she can't get back to solid ground fast enough. Mr. Gunderson, her neighbor, a kind man, and he's... No. She can't think too hard about that. Can't think about the way his exposed ribs curl the wrong way, reaching for the sky. Robert calls her crazy sometimes, and Lucy's heard that some women go a bit mad when they're in the throes of childbirth, so now she starts to reckon it's true. None of this it can't be real. She's been seeing things out in the prairie grass all day. Things that aren't there and things that are. Things with teeth and claws and faces like angry catfish. Her belly stiffens, and she has no choice but to hold her breath and double over, teeth gritted, the scent of fresh blood and rotting mud fighting down her throat. No matter what's real and what isn't, the baby's coming. Trying to put Mr. Gunderson's cropecked eyes out of mind, she heads for the safety of the house. That same chittering frog call echoes over the lake, standing all the little hairs up her neck on end. Back inside, she sighs with the animal pleasure of being behind a bolted door, surrounded by the warm light of lanterns and candles. Some predator got Mr. Gunderson and his dog, but that's a risk pioneers take when they file for a homestead probably a wolf, she tells herself, because surely the snake thing that slithered out of that pig was her mind playing tricks. She's heard the wolves, seen their eyes shining green at night. Yes, that's it. Mr. Gunderson and his dog went down to the lake for water and fell prey to the starving wolves, and Mrs. Gunderson is in town visiting her sister, so she doesn't know yet the poor thing. Firmly past being polite, Lucy hunts around the big room, but she can't find anything soft to spread before the fire. She notices a loaf of bread sitting on the table, a plate fallen and broken on the ground, a lump of butter smeared by a boot on the shiny wood floor. All is quiet, all is still. Ice seeps down Lucy's spine, lost in a shudder of pain as her belly constricts. She has to open the bedroom door for the quilt, and to make sure she's as safe as she thinks she is. I'm right sorry, Mrs. Gunderson, she says, putting a trembling hand on the fancy doorknob. She doesn't like to invade someone's personal space, but she opens the door, and... Sweet holy Jesus! Mrs. Gunderson is in the bed, just sleeping away, 
and here Lucy's been walking around her house like she owns it, and like Mr. Gunderson isn't dead out back. I'm so sorry, she says, but Mrs. Gunderson doesn't move. Mrs. Gunderson doesn't. Dot breathe. Lucy holds up the lantern. That pretty white quilt she covets is soaked in black shiny blood, and now she understands why the house is so quiet. Mrs. Gunderson is dead. Dead, and... Ripped apart. The two other dogs are with her, likewise half-eaten, fallen in front of the bed as if protecting their mistress. Lucy takes a step back, and another, and another, until she's in the main room. She slams the bedroom door and slides down the wall to the floor. Her stomach heaves, and she dribbles puke into her hands and wipes them on her breeches, unsure how to be a person just now, but still certain she's not supposed to ruin such good, clean floors. The fire's crackling merrily, but she can't just give in, can't settle her heavy bones on the floor and prepare to push out a child into some hungry monster's maw. She's got to get up, got to get out. Got to find some safe place to go to ground. Maybe she can make it into town, where there are mountain men trading furs, armed to the teeth and ready to step between her and whatever's dealing death across the prairie. Robert will call her crazy and dumb, and a weak little thing, and she won't mind, she won't argue as long as someone keeps her and the baby safe. She drags her body to standing and lumbers over to pull down the shotgun on hooks over the front door and sling it over her arm. It'll be loaded, so she's got two shots, which is a damn sight better than nothing. Before she heads out, she pulls on a pair of old boots sitting by the stove and snatches up the stale loaf of bread, slathering it in the fallen butter with her bare hands and choking down what she can. Outside, she whistles for Belle, but the mare doesn't trot over like she should. Her rumps on the ground, poking out from behind the barn poor, tired thing must have laid down for a little nap. As Lucy stumbles across the farmyard, her sight readjusting to the darkness, she trips on something slick and rubbery. It's an odd, thick, wet lump, almost like an old shirt made out of skin, shining translucent and moist in the moonlight. Nothing here is right. This whole place, this whole goddamn stretch of prairie is wrong. Bell, sugar, she calls voice trembling. Wake up, baby. The mare doesn't get up, doesn't budge, and even a woman as desperate as Lucy can understand why she'd prefer to sleep. But as she rounds the corner there's something wrong with Belle's head, like the horse got tangled in a blanket. Lucy gets around front, and the ugliest thing she's ever seen is clamped over Belle's face like a giant spider covered in human skin, its rattlesnake tail curled around the horse's throat. Lucy spins to run, stumbling in Mr. Gunderson's oversized boots, desperate to get away from whatever that thing is. I'm going crazy, she mutters to herself. This ain't real. This is. This is some kind of sickness. It's got to be. Robert said I've been acting strange, and Robert don't lie. She stops and stands there, rooted under the wide, black sky, halfway between the locked barn and the farmhouse. She has to escape. But from what? And to where? What could possibly be safe now? She needs another horse which means she has to fetch the barn key from where it hangs by the front door. The lock is slick in her hands, just as stubborn as the one back home, and she keeps glancing over her shoulder, expecting some skin spider snake to leap on her, 
but the prairie is quiet except for the madly chittering frogs. Even the coyotes are silent now. The lock pops open, and she flings open the barn doors, looking to the first stall, where Mr. Gunderson keeps his riding horse, Carl. No curious nose pokes out of the stall. There are no stomps, no whinnies of welcome. Please, Lucy murmurs. Oh, please, Lord. Carl is on the ground, torn near and half across the chest, like his heart jumped right out through his ribs, and she thinks back on poor devil and shudders. A spider crab thing like the one on Belle's face lies dead in the corner. Stall after stall, this is what she finds, dead horses, a dead mule, dead lambs, all ripped open across the chest or half-eaten. Finally, there's a noise other than Lucy's sobbing, but it's not the comforting sound of hoofbeats and shouting, not Robert calling her name, not the sort of noise that promises everything will be fine. It's the cows lowing out back. The first few moos are curious, then warning, then furious and desperate and frightened. The beasts are moving, a thunder of hooves and big bodies crashing clumsily against the wood fence. Lucy's fingers tense on Mr. Gunderson's gun as her belly contracts. She's starting to get an idea of what's out there, all these hard-to-hit, fleshy things with long tails and sharp teeth. She can't shoot them all, and she can't run away fast enough on her own, but maybe she can use the cows. She realizes now, deep down in her bones and sinews, that Robert isn't coming to help her. He's not on his way home galloping to rescue her like some big damn hero. He's in town, likely at the saloon or whorehouse, spending the money from his furs and thinking everything is just fine and his silly fool of a wife can't complain about another day away. Robert can't save her, and the Gundersons can't save her, and the town doctor can't save her, and hiding behind a sturdy door can't save her it sure as hell didn't save Mrs. Gunderson. Lucy hates death Robert, teases her all the time, tells her a pioneer woman's got to toughen up. But if there's any hope of living through the night, of her child getting to see daylight, she's got to take matters into her own two hands. She's got to kill before she gets killed. There on the barn wall is Mr. Gunderson's scythe, just as sharp as the one her daddy taught her to swing when she was a girl. She slings the shotgun over her shoulder and takes up the more familiar scythe, storming out of the barn toward the cows, her belly now a roiling rock, angry as boiling water, furious as her heart. She's soaked through with sweat and brine, and her fingers splay over her jerking stomach, caressing the sharp elbows and knees now fighting to escape. Just a little longer, she croons. It's almost time, I promise. The Gunderson's cattle aren't like the pigs they're not pressed against the fence, watching cleverly. No, they're stampeding around like idiots, running from one side of the paddock to the other too dumb to break the boards, just dumb enough to try to run away when there's nowhere to run. Out in the grass, a glossy black curve like a stallion's neck surfaces briefly before diving back under cover. Ice pools along Lucy's spine, her old dress wet as a frog skin. She feels a pressure down below and clenches her nethers. It's happening faster and harder now and she knows that she can't stop what's coming. When her belly stills, she drops the scythe and puts the gun to her shoulder, hating that the little one inside has to hear gunshots. When next she sees that slick black curve out in the grass circling ever closer, she squints and pulls the trigger. There's a sharp pinging noise and a squeal, and it dives back under cover. Fine. Then, 
let it come closer. She may be no good with a gun, but she's got one more shot and she's able with a scythe and she'll throttle that monster with her bare hands if it'll let the babe be born in peace. Sure enough, it changes direction away from the cows, stalking her now, tail lashing over the grasses like a cat. With a deep breath, she takes aim and pulls the trigger again. It's a miss. She's out of bullets. And whatever it is, there's more of them out there. The cattle can sense it, can tell the hunters are getting close. She drops the gun and takes up the scythe, barely able to uncurl and stand as another shudder runs through her. Everything in her body tells her to drop to her knees and push, but she won't do that until this critter is good and dead and it's safe to close her eyes and scream. Her shoulders tense, and the animal inside her suggests that something is sneaking up behind her. Knowing it's stupid, but not knowing what else to do, she hurries toward the cattle pen. As long as she's standing out in the farmyard alone, she's vulnerable, but if she can get in among the cows, she'll be one of many. That's why they stick to herds, after all, her daddy taught her it means maybe a neighbor will get eaten first. Lucy bends to maneuver herself between the board's a tight squeeze. The cows stomp and careen across the pen, their soft black eyes focused on the prairie. Whatever's out there they're clever. They're stalkers, not the sort of thing that just barrels out. Robert said he got stalked by a panther once, that he knew it was there but never saw it so he just had to return to town to spend the night. Lucy reckons it was just another excuse for staying out late at the saloon, but now she knows how it feels, being hunted by something you can't see, can't hear, can't smell. One of the cows bellows, and they all stampede right at Lucy. She spreads her legs and holds her ground, scythe in both hands, belly trembling. The herd parts, running around and behind her like she's going to save them, and she wants to laugh at how dumb these animals are. She's just a weak little woman, as Robert so often reminds her. A bony hip nudges her, and her borrowed boots sink into the mud, and she feels the monsters sizing her up, somewhere out there. Come on then, she growls, pausing as a wave of pain nearly doubles her over. I ain't got all night. Beyond the fence, the grasses sway, and a smooth, black curve cuts through the shifting shadows and disappears. It's closer now, and another cow bumps her, and she starts to think maybe she made a mistake coming in here, that the clumsy cows might do something foolish and kill her before whatever's hunting them all can finish the job. Moonlight glints as a tall, slick form rises up against the starlight, a twisted black stallion made of nightmares and blades, and Lucy holds up her scythe and grits her teeth and begs her body not to tense up, not now. Not when she's got to put everything she has into killing something that's got no business existing. With a screech, it charges, and the cows bellow and careen around her, and she waits and waits and then puts everything she has into sending the shining scythe in a powerful arc. Lucy's arms judder as the scythe blade slams into hard black armor and sticks. An unholy scream rips through the night. A constellation of burning liquid splashes across her arms. The scythe jerks out of her hands its blade already melting as a labor pain rips through her body, snapping her teeth over her tongue as she falls to hands and knees in the dirt. The scythe handle follows, the metal blade dissolved like penny candy left out in the rain. She doesn't know if it's dead, doesn't know if its friends are close, She's waiting for the crunch of teeth in her spine when the air changes. 
she looks up and watches as if in slow motion as the slick black thing stands and is sliced in half. As if by nothing, the monster falls to the ground, a clatter of horse legs sharp as beetle shells and a long, curved head like nothing she's ever seen before. It's as big as devil and as wrong as his namesake, and she doesn't understand what's happened. The pain blessedly stops, and Lucy uncurls, looking up in confusion. The air shimmers, and then there's something standing there, something like a person but bigger, taller, broader. At first she thinks its face is made of metal, but then it takes off a mask to reveal a face like a feral hog, and a catfish had an unholy child so she didn't imagine it. It's got long hair, thick and beaded, and armor that gleams over unexpected curves. When it she looks at Lucy, she wants to shrink up and disappear into the earth rather than feel those strange eyes crawling over her, judging her, the larger version of a scythe in the creature's hand hovering inches away from her head. Lucy doesn't know what to say, but her daddy taught her manners, so she clears her throat and says, Thank you. It ends in a groan as another pain doubles her over, and she struggles not to push, to hold in this baby for a few moments longer. When Lucy is able to straighten up again, the creature points at her belly and makes that annoying chittering, clicking sound Lucy's been hearing all night, the one she thought was just frogs. My child, Lucy says softly. My baby. Robert Jr. Little Robbie, maybe. She mimics cradling a babe, hoping the terrifying hunter can maybe understand. Surely these things have children they love? After all, even wolves love their pups. In response, the hunter shakes her head fiercely, braids clattering, and holds up her weapon in a threatening sort of way. Lucy is out of weapons, but anger flows through her. No, she barks gruffly. No. It's mine. When the creature steps closer, she pummels it with her fists, finding only slick metal over hard muscle. The hunter steps back. The big, terrifying head nods once, almost in respect, or maybe pity. Then the creature puts her helmet back on and disappears, as if stepping sideways into nothing. The next pain takes her, and doubled over as she is, Lucy can't look up, but the noises she hears slices and squeals and groans and hissing give her hope that the bad monsters out in the grasses are dying by the hand of the good one who saved her. Finally, finally, there is silence. For the first time tonight, things don't feel wrong. Lucy drags herself out of the cow pen. As she crawls on hands and knees toward the farmhouse, she hears a sharp sound out past the barn, and the muddy lake erupts in blinding flame. She keeps crawling. Inside, the stove fire is still burning, but there's nothing soft here, not like she'd planned back home, no neat stack of sheets and a kettle of water heated over the flames. Lucy gets on her hands and knees on the wood boards and waits, knowing it won't take long. She's dripping sweat now, her head on fire and her heart thumping like galloping hooves. The next time her body tenses up, she lets it do what it will, what it needs, lets it push and heave and howl. After all this time holding back, it feels good to give in, now that it's safe. She knows Mrs. Gunderson is not twenty feet away, dead in the bed but that big girl outside with the armor and the side something about that powerful huntress tells Lucy she's safe now. Protected, even. Robert, you goddamn liar, she shrieks with her last, big, painful heave, and she catches her baby with her own two hands. 
except it's not a baby, or maybe it was, once, but now it's something else, small and twisted and hard, suck dry as the lake outside, and she clutches it to her chest as her vision goes dark. She falls onto her back, eyes unseeing, as her round belly bursts open like an overripe fruit, and many small things slither out. Lucy, a voice calls outside. You in there with the Gundersons, Lucy? I'm home. Story 4. The Hotel Mariposa. By David Barnett. What a dump, says Ben. He always says that. It's sort of his thing. Kara looks over a Cade, who's in turn framing the building in front of them inside a rectangle made of the outstretched thumb and forefinger of each hand. He always does that, too. Like he's Cecil B. Demily, sizing up the crucial shot. Creatures of habit, men. Frank and Dean stayed in the fifties, says Carol. In fact, the whole rat pack did. She shields her eyes against the midday sun, and looks at the wide, squat building built into the New England hillside, surrounded by a girdle of tall trees. The Hotel Mariposa. Ben pulls a joint out of the breast pocket of his crease-checked shirt. Now, maybe if we could summon up all blue eyes, that might get us a third season. The Hotel Mariposa is their last chance. They have to deliver the goods to Netflix in four weeks. Once the novelty of season one of American Spookchazers had stopped being a trending topic, and season two, currently streaming, was getting what you could only very politely call lukewarm notices, the cards were on the table. A Halloween special, make or break. Something good. Something juicy. Or American Spookchazers was as dead as the graveyards they spent their night stumbling around in. What'll get us a third season is you staying on top of your game, not getting stoned, and actually getting footage, says Cade, hauling his case out of the station wagon. I mean, we don't want Phoenix all over again. Whatever happened, they'd always have Phoenix. The one time there was indisputable, right there in front of your eyes, holy shit this is world-changing paranormal activity. And Ben was in the toilet vacuuming up two lines of coke from the rim of the hand basin. Carol thought Cade would in some way hate him for that. No, we do want Phoenix all over again, says Carol, flipping up the pages on her iPad. We just need evidence this time. Ben offers her the joint and she shakes her head. He shrugs and takes another drag, pointedly not holding it out to Cade. He looks across the wide gravel driveway pitted with weeds and small, wild shrubs at the peeling, faded Art Deco facade of the hotel. Ben wipes the sweat from his bald head with his hand, and rubs it on his sagging jeans, and says, so what's the story here, then? You didn't read the briefing notes, says Carol with an exasperated sigh. Cade makes a pantomime of rolling his eyes. Ben shrugs. Give me the TLDR. It was built in the 1920s, bolt hole of the rich and famous. Hemingway famously got drunk and trashed the bar. But there's always been strange phenomena reported, from the word go. A guest disappeared for three days in 1928. When they found him, half-starved to death, he said he'd been lost in the corridors all that time. Poltergeist activity, sightings of dead people, the usual. In the thirties, a woman nearly drowned in the swimming pool. Said she'd been doing laps and suddenly couldn't see the sides. Like she was in the middle of a milpin commotion. She swam for hours until suddenly she hit the steps. She was treated for exhaustion at hospital. Carol flicks through her notes on the tablet. Business started to drop off, and the place was closed for good in 1967 after the murders. Oh, yeah, that I know about, says Ben, grinding the joint under the heel of his boot. That hippie death cult, right? All got jobs as waiters and porters and shit, and then rampaged through the place gutting the guests with machetes. That's gotta get you no stars on Tripadvisor. Ben shoulders his bag and sets off for the curved glass entrance, boots crunching on the gravel. He glances over his shoulder at Cade, then Carol. So yeah, let's hope for another phoenix, eh? Wasn't all bad. For some of us. Vic, says Cade to his back. 
He runs a hand through his unruly dark hair and looks around at what would once have been carefully tended gardens, now rewilded to high-grassed meadow, and says, weird how this whole place is built in a kind of huge bowl. Like a natural amphitheater. Jesus, Cade, didn't you read the briefing notes either? It was the site of a huge meteor strike in the 16th century. That's why they built it here. Groundwork had already been done. Carol looks up at the dark windows at the front of the Mariposa. I feel like we're being watched, don't you? Let's fucking hope so, says Cade, setting off to follow Ben. Or it's back to corporate training videos for us. Carol rubs her bare forearms, feeling a sudden chill. She glances around at the thick semicircle of trees surrounding the grounds and hurries after the others toward the Mariposa. For two days Hinchui has been sitting in total stillness, communing with the land. It is important, he thinks, to align with the hunting ground. You must make the territory your friend, your ally. He has seen too many younger Yodja ignore this. They treat the hunting ground as merely the stage on which their glory will be played out and their honor won. The land can be a powerful weapon. And if you do not make it your ally, you risk making it your enemy. But this is strange land. All the Yatja know that. It is why they come here. It is why not all return. And not just because of the prey Hinchui already has two Kai and Amedha trophies, hard won to the obvious enhancement of his honor. He has no fear of them. No, it is the hunting ground itself that is to be feared. The sun is high in the sky, casting dappled golden light through the tallest branches of the trees. Hinchui decides to commune a little while longer, to probe and examine this territory, to test for weaknesses he can exploit, or strengths he can employ. Then, when night falls, the hunt will begin. The Mariposa is exactly everything you'd want from a remote, abandoned, haunted hotel. Red carpets. Long corridors with mahogany doors leading to rooms and suites far bigger and grander than you'd get in any hotel today. A lounge bar and a huge dining hall, with a stage on which a set of drums and a piano sit, coated with dust. A roof terrace overlooking the tops of the trees and the lake beyond, glittering in the late summer sun. Ben takes the camera around on his own, doing some deliberately shaky shots, running down the corridors, into rooms, slamming doors and hurtling around corners. To edit in if things don't get exciting enough, he thinks. Things have to get exciting enough, they all know. Weird how nobody bought this place, says Cade, standing behind the bar in the lounge, inspecting a bottle of bourbon he's found in a cupboard. Even with the murders, prime bit of real estate like this. Carol doesn't remind him it's all in the briefing notes. Instead she says, they did. Several times. Never amounted to anything. Last time anyone bothered was in the early 80s team of contractors was brought in to do some preliminary work. They packed up after a day and refused to come back. Cade twists the cap off the bottle and gives it an exploratory sniff. Carol says suddenly, Mariposa. It means butterfly. Cade shrugs and tips the bottle to his lips. Like. Emerging from a cocoon, muses Carol. It lasts a heartbeat. Less. A tenth of a heartbeat. But she sees it. It's no longer Cade standing in front of her, but her mother, one of Carol's last memories of her. In the park on a hot day, almost silhouetted against the sun, lifting a bottle of Dr. Pepper to her mouth, the golden light picking out the diffuse shape of her body through the thin sundress. Carol is sitting on the grass, playing with her plastic dinosaurs. She loves dinosaurs. She says, Mommy, if a T-Rex came to eat me, would you protect me? Her mother laughs and wipes the drops of soda from her chin with the back of her hand. Of course, baby, I'd protect you from all the monsters. And one month later, she had gone, and Carol never saw her again. Are you all right? Says Cade, and Carol realizes she's got her eyes closed tight. The sudden clashing, discordant racket makes them both jump, Cade spitting bourbon down his shirt. On the stage, Ben is sitting at the drum kit, bashing the skins and cymbals with a pair of sticks, dust flying up around him in a cloud. Carol hadn't seen him sneak in. Ick, spits Cade, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. Pick anything up. Shouts Carol across the lounge as Ben throws the sticks on the carpet, heading over to them. 
the vision of her mother has already faded, almost forgotten. Dust a fucking hernia lugging my gear around, says Ben, holding out his hand for Kate to pass him the bourbon. This place is huge. Bigger than it looks from the outside. I think it goes right into the hill. The rooms are pretty cool, some of them have sheets and blankets. We should maybe go and choose a couple of sweets, says Carol. She feels the hairs prickle on her arms again, like she did outside. When she felt like she was being watched. Well, I want to be on a different floor, says Ben, taking a swig of the bourbon. I actually want to get some sleep tonight, if we're doing the full 24-hour stint from 8 tomorrow morning. He winks a Cade, and Carol rolls her eyes. Ever since Phoenix, ever since she and Cade got together, Ben hasn't let it drop that he heard them that night, after Cade had snuck into her room in that old motel. But there's always an edge to it, a viciousness. She knows Ben thought he'd lost out to Cade, that he had some kind of claim on Carol. He'd been like that since the three of them were at college. She'd once heard them talking in a bar, unaware she was walking back from the bathroom. They clinked their bottles together, and Ben said sourly, best man won, I guess. Like I'm a fucking teddy bear to be played for at a fairground sideshow stall. Cade takes the bottle back and says, if something happens, we want to be together. Especially given the stories about this place having some kind of weird geometry. Bullshit and you know it, says Ben, then shrugs. But if you say so. Let's go look, then, says Carol. She can feel tension between the two men, and she wants to head it off, especially if they're going to be drinking. I definitely want a sweet, though. Hinchui watches the three humans leave, and wonders which of them it will be. It doesn't really matter, none of them will survive the night. He taps his wrist, and the shift suit fizzes off. He'd been following the big woman, puzzling at him banging doors and running along the corridors, his recording device held high or low against the floor. He wonders why they are here. Other than to facilitate the birthing. Again, their reasons for their presence are of no concern. The conditions are periodically right for the hunt, the presence of human hosts and the hatching of one of the eggs buried deep below this place. Sometimes one happens, sometimes the other. When both occur it is a fortuitous moment. Hinchui has been waiting patiently for his turn to hunt here. Hinchui strides through the room and steps onto the raised area, considering the curved black box on legs, lid propped open, displaying innards of wire and wood. Hinchui taps one of the white keys, and a dull sound emerges. Another key produces a note of a different timbre. A device for making music. Perhaps when the creature is dead he will compose a victory song upon it. He wonders if it is here, yet. Scuttling under a table or behind the walls. Waiting for its moment. Hinchui draws his curved blade the only weapon he has brought to the hunting ground, aside from the wrist blades built into his armor and gazes at the reflection of his yellow eyes in the metal. The Yodja call this place Gorath Pentila. He had been listening to the human's converse, invisible in the corner. His universal translator offers him an understanding of their words, but their meaning is often obtuse. Still, he gets a sense of their unease about this place, an inkling of what Gorath Pintila would be in their context. Something very like. The place where nothing is as it seems. Let me guess, says Ben behind her, making her jump. All work and no play makes a Carol a dull girl. Very funny, says Carol. She's sitting in one of the stylish egg-shaped easy chairs in the lobby, her iPad clipped into her Bluetooth keyboard, making some preliminary notes for the voiceover script. Aside from some freelance production people, it's mainly the three of them who do American spook chasers. It was the lo-fi Blair Witch kind of feel that made it such a hit at first. But things move so fast these days, even after two seasons the show is being considered old hat. They need to get results. Something has to happen. Did you want something? Says Carol testily, to Ben lurking behind her. Cade wants us all to do a little two-camera piece. Talking about our motivation, all that shit. She can guess Ben's peel. Ain't no such thing as ghosts. Once you're dead, you're dead. I haven't seen nothing can't be explained by tricks of the light or the mind fooling itself. 
Ben plays up the resident skeptic shtick, which suits the show. Gives people a way in if they're not believers themselves, rather than it just being a bunch of credulous geeks jumping at every flickering candle flame. Where do you want to do it? Here's fine. Ben sets up and says, so, why do you do this? Peril pauses a moment, still staring at her iPad screen. Because when I was four years old my mother left me and my sister with my daddy. And we never found out what happened to her. It was like she fell off the face of the earth. And all these years I've been searching for her not knowing if she's dead or alive. Carol looks at the camera. I think she's dead. And this is maybe my way of continuing the search. What if you find her spirit? Says Ben. Or it finds you. Then I can ask her why, says Carol, turning back to the keyboard. Ben films for another few seconds, then gives her the thumbs up and cuts. I loved when you did it for the first episode, and I still love it, says Ben. Even if it is Jesus. What was that? Carol frowns had she heard something. Scrabbling or scratching. And turns to where he's pointing. I didn't see anything. Something running on the desk. Oh, man, I fucking hate rats. Shit. They're more scared of you than you are of them, says Carol, concentrating on her script again. Only people who say that are ones who never got bit by a rat, says Ben. Shit. I'm going to go smoke something to calm my nerves. What did Cade say on his two-camera piece? Same as always, says Ben with a shrug. There's more than we know, more than we see, more than we hear. The trick is learning to open your heart. Usual crap. Peril glances out the window. Hey, she says. Sun's going down. Well, let's hope the ghouls come out to play, says Ben, casting one last nervous look at the reception desk before heading toward the dining hall. It is the creature, thinks Hinchui. He watches, camouflaged, in the lengthening shadows, interested to see if it will strike. It doesn't. Perhaps it has a sense of the dramatic, appropriate to what these humans are doing here. Some entertainment they are creating, he thinks. Like the clan plays the elders put on at feast days. The parasite can take on characteristics of its host. This has the makings for a good hunt. Uncharacteristically, Hinchui has a vague hope the parasite doesn't take the female. Not through any sense of empathy or weakness he'd had that beaten out of him, just like everyone else in the Karite where youngbloods learned their craft. But because of what she'd said. She seemed particularly attuned to this place. His translator told him the human was speaking of her mother, which in turn, makes Hinchui think of his. He remembers when she got the sickness and took the long walk into the arid desert as penance for her shame. She was still fertile, would be for a long time. Her weakness had deprived the Yatja of who knew how many warriors. And it was a sickness that could not be cured. Melancholy a brought on by addiction to the fermented juice of the Ferenth berry. The Yatja way was honor and victory. Not sadness and shame. She had no choice, according to the traditions of the clan, but to pack up her shame and take it with her, away from them all. Even her children. Hinchui gathered with the rest of the clan, silently watching her walk into the dust, until she was just a tiny dot and then gone from sight. She was long dead, of course. Her bones picked clean by carrion birds. But she had left behind her memory, her reputation. As she set off on the long walk, she had turned briefly, her eyes meeting Hinchui's. And he burned with shame for what she was doing, what she had done. Which was why he chose the most perilous hunting grounds, the most vicious prey, and utilized the most basic weapons. Shame was not the warrior way. He'd keep fighting it all his life, by hunting the most dangerous game. They take an early dinner in the dining hall, lit by candles and a bank of the battery-powered lights. They'd brought all their food with them, of course. Sandwiches, cooked meats, bread and olives, a big cooler of beer Ben and Cade tear into as they eat. The sinking sun casts golden light through the torn, dusty drapes at the tall windows, until darkness takes hold outside, the wilderness beyond the hotel, painting the panes black. Peril shares with them her research from the afternoon. As you'd expect, the place became a magnet for hobos and teens and drug addicts over the years. She passes the iPad around. Look at this. 1971. 
homeless guy found by a fishing party heading back from the lake and taking a look at the old hotel. Ugh, fuck, trigger warning, maybe, says Ben. I really don't want this cold meatball sub anymore. The police photograph shows a corpse with its chest ripped out. Interesting, says Cade, examining it. Aw, old guy drank himself to death and got eaten by animals, says Ben, belching. Harold takes the tablet and calls up another picture. 79. Bunch of young punks gathered here for a party. One of them got lost and when they found him next morning. The monochrome picture shows a Sid Vicious wannab lying in one of the guest rooms, a spreading black patch on his chest. And an 85. I think we get the picture, says Ben, reaching for a beer. How many of these you got? With their hearts ripped out. 6. Cade's eyes widen. That can't be any kind of coincidence. Nobody's put this together before. We could have some kind of serial killer here. Or the ghost of a serial killer. Jack the fucking Ripper. I'd rather have Sinatra, says Ben. He stands unsteadily. I'm going for a walk. Then crash for a while. Then maybe a bit of coke. Carol rolls her eyes, and they talk about Ben's drug use, and whether it's going to be problematic at some point. They talk about the show, and if this weekend is going to save their asses. They wonder if they should take a vacation once it's over as they move from the dining room to the bar. Jesus, it's late, says Cade, looking at his watch. We've been up for hours. You think Ben is okay? Cade walks unsteadily toward the bar, on the hunt for another bottle. His concern for Ben is really heartwarming, Carol thinks. He dips into the shadows and when he emerges her heart leaps. He's not alone. A figure is entwined about him. A woman. Naked. Young. Blonde hair billowing behind her as though she's underwater. Carol recognizes her, and then Kate is alone, staring at the label on a bottle and frowning. She'd suspected, of course. Her imagination had never conjured up anything so detailed before, though. Is it this place, the Mariposa? Is it doing this? How long have you been fucking Jeanette? Says Carol when Cade sits down heavily with the bottle. Cade falls silent, his face in an almost comic grimace, as though she's asked him to name all the state capitals in reverse alphabetical order. Jeanette. Jeanette the production assistant, says Carol. Unless you know any more Jeanettes. Unless you're fucking any of them, too. Cade puffs out his cheeks. Playing for time. Carol waits. There's nothing else to do tonight. Look, he says eventually. I'm not sure what. I mean, I don't know what you think. Carol almost feels relieved on his behalf when the nearby scream rents the dusty, still air of the Hotel Mariposa. Hands. It was fucking hands. Screams Ben, sitting on the tiled floor of the bathroom off the lobby. Came right out of the can and grabbed me. Tell us again, says Kate calmly, shooting Carol a look. Ben takes a deep breath. I put my flashlight down on the basin and took a piss. Ben's torch is still lit and sitting on the taps. Then I cut out a couple of lines. The toilet is one of those with a low cistern behind the seat, and on top of it are two tracks of coke, untouched. I bent down, and these fucking hands came out of the goddamn can and grabbed my face. Hands, says Carol uncertainly. Ben, you're sure it wasn't a rat? It was fucking hands. He shrieks. He holds his out wrists together, palms and fingers splayed, thumbs aligned. Like when you were making the shape of a bird when you were a kid, thinks Carol. And were there. Arms. Ben puts his face in his hands. I don't know. It was dark. There were hands. They grabbed my face. I blacked out, I think. I've been lying here for fucking hours. Didn't you get worried about me? He leans forward and vomits in his lap. Cade frowns. Carol knows exactly what he's thinking. Phoenix all over again. Ben didn't have his cameras. I think we should maybe get you to bed, Carol says softly. Ben nods gratefully, then throws up again. Camouflaged in the corner of the lobby, Hinchui watches the three of them, the male and female, helping the big woman between them, toward the corridor running off through the double doors beside the desk. He puts his hand on the hilt of his blade. 
And so it begins. Do you think it's the drugs? Says Cade, sitting up bare-chested in the bed. Para lies beside him in her PJs, flicking through notes on her tablet. Without looking over she says, well, either that, or it happened. Or he's just making it up. Cade shakes his head. You saw the look on his face. Ben isn't that good a liar. All men are that good a liar if they need to be, thinks Carol. Their earlier conversation still hangs between them. The room is lit by flashlights on the nightstands, casting long, grotesque shadows around the dusty suite. Carol glances over at Cade. Good-looking, fit, funny. Everything a twenty-year-old production assistant would find irresistible in a thirty-two-year-old man. Is that even legal? Under the thick blankets, Cade puts an exploratory hand on her thigh. No, she says. Not with Ben next door. Cade sighs and turns off his torch and lies with his back to her. Carol waits until he is gently snoring before laying down her tablet and switching off her light and lies there for a long time, listening to the complete silence in the Hotel Mariposa. The first thing Carol does is vomit, loud and ugly, on the rug. Then she grabs her cell and dials 911, and through her tear-blurred vision, she can see there's absolutely zero service. She was sure she had it yesterday. She jabs at the numbers again, willing to hear something other than the dead nothingness of no connection to the outside world. She doesn't want to look at the bed, so she looks at Kate instead, who is just standing there, running his hand through his hair, muttering, Oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck oh fuck. You should at least put some fucking clothes on, thinks Carol crazily, staring at him standing there in his boxer shorts. Ben is on his bed, naked, his chest a raw and glistening mess of muscle and fat and sinew and blood. Like he's been. Ripped open. From the inside. Carol leans forward and vomits again, until there's nothing but hot yellow bile being wrenched from her gut. Carol had showered and dressed while Cade still lounged in bed, and she'd gone next door at about eight to make sure Ben was all right. Her scream had brought Cade running. But there was nothing either of them could do for Ben, his skin cold and clammy, his eyes staring glassily to the ceiling. We need to get away, says Carol, tugging on Cade's arm. Whoever did this is still here. She drags open the door to the suite, as if expecting to see a madman with a blood-dripping axe standing there, but it's just the corridor. Cade. She shouts. Get dressed. Let's drive to somewhere with signal. While Carol jabs at her cell again, Cade rattles the handle on their suite. He turns and says, did you lock it? You were last out. She pushes him aside and tries the door. He's right. She sees the number and frowns. This isn't our suite. We're 23. This is 85. Of course it's ours. We were next door to Ben. Cade steps back and looks over at Ben's closed door. See? He's 86. Carol goes to Ben's door. He was definitely in 24. It's locked. She frowns at Cade, then looks down the corridor. Without saying anything she sets off to the corner, which should lead to a set of double doors and the lobby. When she gets there the corridor stretches on, almost to vanishing point. Impossible, she says. When she turns, Kate is gone. Maybe she was wrong about the room numbers. The door must have just been sticking. Ben's had automatically locked when they closed it behind them. She goes to 85 and tries the handle, but it won't budge. She hammers on the door, shouting, let me in. Kate, don't fuck about. There is only silence in the Hotel Mariposa, as stifling and thick as it was in the absolute darkness just before she fell asleep. Carol looks both ways along the corridor, which suddenly seems a lot longer than it did a moment ago. She heads back in the direction she's sure the lobby lies. Wherever the fuck Kate is gone, she needs to get out of this place. Kate watches Carol disappear around the corner and waits, feeling foolish in just his shorts. The image of Ben's eviscerated chest explodes behind his eyelids every time he blinks. Maybe Carol is being too hasty, wanting to leave. Isn't this exactly what they came to the Hotel Mariposa for? It's dynamite. This is what will get them a third series. A third, fourth, fifth. This is what's going to make American spookshazzers. Make them all rich. 
and when he's sure Carol is taken care of, money-wise. He thinks about Jeanette, the way her skin is so taut and smooth the way Carol's no longer is, the things she'll do in bed Carol want. There'll be a hundred Jeanettes. A thousand. Hey, maybe we should think about this, he calls, setting off for the corner. When he gets there, the corridor heads off for what seems like miles. He was sure the lobby doors were here. And there's no Carol. He jogs down a little way. Has she gone into one of the rooms? Then he arrives at a crossroads, another red carpeted corridor slicing across and disappearing into infinity on either side. This can't be right. Carol. Yells Cade, voice flat and heavy in the still air. Carol, where are you? Cade decides to double back, return to where their rooms are, and begin again. He starts as he turns, at the sight of the black shape in the ceiling. There are wooden panels there, hiding a crawl space for the pipes and utilities, he supposes. One is skewed, revealing a triangle of darkness. On the carpet are puddles of goo, spit, saliva. Like some huge beast has been slavering. He's about to call Carol's name once more when the hairs on his neck stand up, and his balls shrivel. There's someone behind him. He can sense it. He spins around, and screams. Carol has been walking for what feels like hours along a corridor that seems to go on forever, when she hears the unmistakable sound of Kate screaming. She runs, suddenly hitting a right turn she hadn't seen coming, and around the corner there he is, on his hands and knees, shaking. A pool of piss dripping from his boxer shorts. She wrinkles her nose. Oh God, oh God, oh God, he says, over and over. Carol. Fuck. Thank God. We need to get out. I've just seen a fucking ghost. When she's calmed him down he takes a ragged breath and sits against the wall, marshalling his thoughts. Eventually he says, it must have been seven feet tall. More. Kind of a shape in the air. Like blurred air. But like a man. Like looking at someone through a dirty lens. Then suddenly it was there. He looks at her, tears streaming down his cheeks. It had this helmet. Like. I dunno. Maybe an old world knight or something. A knight. Cade slaps his head three times. I don't know. I'm only telling you what I saw. Let's leave. Now. Carol looks one way down the endless corridor, then the other. Yeah, we should. Easier said than done. She says, which way did you come? He points in the opposite direction from which she'd arrived. Whatever is going on in this place, trying to find their way out through the corridors is hopeless. It's like a labyrinth. There has to be another way. Pinchui had been tracking the prey when he came upon the naked male. He showed no signs of being infected. Pinchui had shown himself to the human, he didn't really know why. He sometimes liked the reaction of other races when he revealed himself. Even if they didn't know the Yodja explicitly, they recognized him for what he was in some primal corner of their brains, their collective species memory. A hunter. A predator. Pinchui saw no point in killing him. Like treading on an insect. Besides, he was good bait to draw the Kayanda Medha out, all that noise and stench. Hinchui would follow and wait for the creature to strike, as it inevitably would. After the human screamed, Hinchui activates his shift suit and pads away along the corridor, the hunting ground is living up to its own mythology, the space within it warping and shifting to dizzying effect. Hinchui nods agreeably. What victory songs he will have to sing about this day. And how much farther will he drive his mother's shame deep inside him, never to resurface. Let me try, says Carol, exasperated at Cade's futile attempts to force the door. It was her idea. If the corridors were going on forever and she didn't want to give too much headspace to that then they'd try to get out through a window. She takes a run up, slamming the flat of her foot just under the handle, and the wood splinters and gives. The small utility room is stocked with mops, brushes and cleaning equipment. And a window, overlooking the overgrown grounds of the hotel to what must be the east side. Somehow they were on the second floor. She can't work out how that has happened. But there is a drain pipe running down the side of the hotel, near the window. They can shimmy down and get the hell out of here. 
Farrell picks up a mop, hefts it in her hands, and drives the end of it hard into the center of the window. The glass fractures and smashes and falls away. Revealing, impossibly, a bare brick wall where there had been the enticing view of freedom seconds before. What the fuck? Carol. Says Cade, his voice curiously strangled. Jesus, Cade, can't you see I'm? He just sobs this time, and she turns. And sees it. It is skeletal and black, its impossible, grotesquely distended head slick with a sheen of moisture, rows of teeth bared. It stands behind Cade with an almost simian crouch, a spine-like tail whipping behind it. Viscous liquid drips from its maw, spotting the vinyl flooring dot. What? The? Actual? Fuck. Peril, says Cade, tears rolling down his face. I'm sorry. The creature opens its mouth, and something emerges, like a limb, with a second mouth gaping at the end. This is a nightmare, thinks Carol wildly. I'm asleep. Ben is still alive. This is just a dream. Then the nightmare rips Cade's face off. Hinchui watches with interest from the door, and wonders how the human will react to the Kayanda Medha. Will she think it another illusion conjured by this place? How much do the humans understand of what happens here? He doubts, from what he knows of humans, that she could absorb the concept of an ancient race, harvesting hundreds of Kayanda Medha pods, then taking them out of the sector in a ship powered by a drive unknown to any other race in the galaxy. A drive that warped and bent reality to fold space. A drive that went wrong, causing the ship to crash here hundreds of this planet's years ago. Even if he knew her tongue, how could he explain the crew were all killed, but the drive created a place where space and time are twisted out of shape. The Yodja investigated the crash site, of course, after tracking the unknown ship through space. The first team just had time to report the hold of the half-buried ship was full of unhatched Kayanda Medha pods, before contact was lost. The follow-up ship discovered the scouts all slaughtered. Apparently by their own hands. When the new team began to see strange visions of things that weren't there, and the landscape began to shift and change in defiance of both physical sense and Yodja technology, it was deduced that however the ship's strange warp drive worked, in its malfunctioning state, it was having an effect on the material world. Normal rules did not apply. Anything could happen there, or at least seem to. As Uman settled the area, and the ship became more concealed, the stasis fields containing the pods began to fail, sometimes two or three at a time, sometimes none for cycles, then one or two more. Giving the Kayanda Medha hosts and the Yodju one of their strangest and most celebrated hunting grounds. Of course, none of it matters to the Uman now, staring in uncomprehending horror at the Kayanda Medha. He could let it kill her. It doesn't matter to him. But, on a whim, he scans both her and the creature with his wrist bracer and pauses. Then he draws his blade, switches off his shift suit, and roars his challenge. Kate had been right. A ghost. A giant ghost with dreadlocks. Carol's mind whirls so fast she thinks she just might black out as a defense mechanism. The monster throws Cade's bloodied faceless body away from it and spins around, crouching and hissing. The knight thinks Carol. Why would there be a knight? The ghost of a knight. This isn't goddamn Scooby-Doo. She doesn't know if they're on the same side, but he's stalking toward the monster with some kind of curved sword, so that's good enough for her. Hey, Motherficker, she shouts, and as the creature turns back to her, she rams the end of the mop right into its dripping jaws. The giant swings his blade, and it connects with the tail of the monster, which yowls in agony, her anger. Yellow blood gouts from its wound, sizzling and smoking on the carpet and cupboards where it splashes. Acid. The creature suddenly leaps up, like a cat, into the recesses of the ceiling space where it had come from. She hears skittering along the panels, and it's gone. Trying to ignore Cade's crumpled form on the periphery of her vision, Carol hefts the mop like a pole vaulter, the end dripping with the creature's saliva pointed toward the figure that might be her savior or her doom. Did that thing kill Ben as well as Cade? She says. What is it? What the fuck are you, for that matter? He tilts his helmeted head, as if considering her. Then he sheathes his blade. He's not going to kill her. 
at least not with that. Then he puts his hands together, as if in prayer, and inclines his head, and points to her belly. It takes her a moment, then Carol says, you are shitting me. Pinchui turns and stalks from the room, checking his wrist bracer. The creature is on the move, above him. The female lumen follows him, chattering at him in her language. She is with young. Not any of his concern. His kind would not kill a female bearing a child, not deprive the universe of another potential warrior. But he can use her, to draw the creature out. Bait. Except. The crippled drive of the ship buried deep beneath this place, which affects the physical world so, had shown him images as she talked, a parade of pictures, brief snatches of the human's life. Her mother, abandoning her, just as his had. Is that a source of great shame among the humans, as it is among Yatja? Again, not his concern. All that matters is the hunt. He checks his bracer. The creature has doubled back, heading toward them, in the space above. He puts his hand on his blade. I don't fucking believe it, says Carol, running to keep up with the man's long strides. Pregnant. Cade, you bastard. A sudden sob is ripped out of her. Yes, he was a bastard, she was going to leave him, but he didn't deserve that. Nobody deserved that. She didn't even know what that was. Kate and presumably Ben had been killed by that thing. What was it? A demon. A monster. Some kind of. Experiment. Mutant. Hey, she shouts. You're here to kill it. Who are you? You speak English. Where are you from? He's looking at his wrist some kind of monitor or hut on there, maybe. Then he looks up at the ceiling. Carol grips the mop. It's coming back. He's looking at her again, then he puts his hands to the corners of his helmet and lifts it, shaking out his long dreadlocks and revealing his face. His mottled gray face, pinprick eyes and... Mandibles. Fucking mandibles. Then he points down the corridor and snarls. Carol runs. As Hinchui hoped, the Kayanda Medha above pauses. Whether it can hear her or it can sense her as she flees, it doesn't matter. It will not be able to resist the lure of prey. It's moving. Fast. The human turns a corner, and Hinchui can see from his bracer it's above her. He draws his blade and sets off at a run. Where the fuck are the doors? How can she get out? The corridor stretches into infinity. Stay here long enough, you'd go insane. If you didn't die of starvation first. Maybe she should double back, go past that. She doesn't even know which would be worse to meet with, whatever the hell that monster was that killed Cade, or the giant knight. Not a knight, idiot. It's a monster like the other one. She's weighing up, deciding whether to be caught between a rock and a hard place, then the choice is taken out of her hands. The ceiling tiles explode and the monster drops, crouching like a shining black tiger, jaws dripping as it regards her, sizing her up. Preparing for the kill. Then, with a roar, the other one comes barreling around the corner, its blade held high, and the monster turns to face it. Has the thing grown since killing Kate? It certainly seems larger as it uncoils, standing on sinewy legs, tail severed at the end, dripping caustic, acid blood whipping like a cobra. Pinchui is somewhat disappointed by how easy it is. The Kayanda Medha puts up a good enough fight, he supposes. A lesser Yatja might have found it more challenging. Might have failed, have been killed. But Hinchui, swinging his blade with expert precision, dispatches it in clinical fashion. Well, almost. Hinchui pauses from delivering the fatal blow. The human is cowering by the wall, watching the battle in horror. He wonders what she would think if he had a truly worthy opponent. Still. Every kill, every trophy, goes some small way toward making up for his mother's shame. Toward shaking off the stench of her betrayal of his clan. Toward, in some small way, redeeming her. The human's mother abandoned her, as well. Does she feel shame at that? Hinchui looks at the stricken creature, then decides. He holds out his blade to the female. He wants me to finish it, Carol thinks crazily. The creature's blood is pooling and smoking as it writhes weakly on the floor. Uncertainly, she stands up, her arms folded across her belly. Where her baby grows. This thing could have killed her. And her baby. 
who knows how many more of them there are. Then, she realizes, she has to do this. For Cade. For Ben. For herself. For her baby. She must prove she can protect this child growing inside her. Even if she has to raise it alone. She is not her mother. She will not abandon this baby. She will do everything she can to protect it. She will kill monsters for it. Carol reaches out for the blade. They stand in the sunlight on the forecourt of the Hotel Mariposa. She has no idea how they got outside. She just followed him through the winding corridors until they found a door. Afterward. After she'd killed the monster. You need a lift anywhere? Says Carol, pointing to the station wagon. Where the hell you from, anyway? He indicates the trees. He doesn't speak, but she guesses his meaning. He's got his own transport. He points upward, and she shields her eyes against the sun and looks up into the blue sky, the blackness of space beyond. Well, of course. That figures. Aliens. Fucking aliens. Kate and Ben would have loved this. She stifles a sudden sob. She's going to have to deal with this, somehow. There are going to be questions. There must be answers. But not now. Now she just needs to get out of here. The alien takes his blade and, with a tip, draws a crude figure in the dust. A stick figure, with a distended belly. A pregnant woman. Carol says, is that me? Hinchui cannot make her understand. Grunting, he pulls off his bio-helmet. She recoils at first, then stares at him curiously. He ignores her, looks out over the hunting ground. The crippled warp drive reacts to sentient thought, subtly shifting reality to tap into moods, or memories. That much is known. He wonders. Hinchui looks at her, takes off his glove, and holds out his hand. Whatever he is, he's on her side. Carol looks at his huge hand, then places her own in it. For a long moment, nothing. She isn't sure what's supposed to happen. She can hear something, though almost imperceptible, a kind of thrumming noise, deep underground. Maybe she doesn't hear. Maybe she feels it. Inside her. Then two figures appear by the trees circling the Hotel Mariposa. One tall and broad, wrapped in some kind of rough material, the other tiny and slight, in a flimsy. A flimsy summer dress. Carol realizes what she's seeing as they walk toward them, almost the mirror image of the pair of them standing there, hand in hand. It's her mother. She looks up at the alien. His small round eyes narrow as he watches the figures approach. It's his mother, too. Ghosts. Whispers Carol. Has she finally found proof of the paranormal at the Hotel Mariposa? Or is this something to do with the monsters? She has had a jumble of images she cannot understand. Crashed spaceships, crippled engines distorting perception. Is that what this is? Is it an illusion, or something more? He doesn't say anything. Doesn't look at her. Together they wait until the two women, the two mothers, stand in front of them in the bright sunshine. Why did you leave? Carol isn't sure who speaks. She's certain it's her but feels the words chitter and growl in another tongue as well. I had to, says her mother. Says his mother. The two mothers are one. Somehow, she and the alien are one, too. Hinchui. His name is Hinchui. Hinchui looks at the human. Carol. The hunting ground is fading them into each other, folding everything down into single digits. There is only one mother. There is only one child. All is one. There is only one question. Why did you leave? Only one answer. I had two. Only one more thing to be said. I never stopped. The next word, the next feeling, clashes within Carol and Hinchui. It is a thing neither of them understands in relation to the other. But that doesn't matter. Because they understand it themselves. You never stopped loving me, thinks Carol, and her tears flow freely. You had to leave, and I'll never know why, but it wasn't because of me. It was in spite of me. And you never stopped loving me. Carol looks at Hinchui and realizes he's having a similar revelation. She smiles, then both women turn and walk back the way they came, and are as insubstantial as summer haze before reaching the tree line, then gone. Carol and Hinchui let go of each other, and become themselves. 
They look at each other for a moment, then he nods and turns back toward the hotel. Carol watches him, until he disappears through the doors to where the corpse of the Kayanda Medhahe, I learned a new word lies, and God knows how many more are buried in the sand beneath the hotel. Rather him than me. She knows eventually all this is going to hit her like a truck, she'll collapse into a sobbing, terrified mess. Or maybe not. Maybe she's a different Carol to the one that walked in there. She remembers what she said about mariposa meaning butterfly. Like. Emerging from a cocoon. She finds the spare key behind the fender and lets herself into the station wagon. She won't be going home, she decides. Let them think she disappeared or got killed with Kate and Ben. She can start a new life, her and the baby. No more American spook chasers. All ghosts laid to rest. Carol starts the engine and lets it growl for a moment, foot on the gas. No more chasing the past. Time to look to the future and be a kick-ass mom. The kind who kills monsters. And who never stops loving. Carol puts the wagon into gear and executes a wide turn on the drive, glancing in her mirror as something shoots into the sky on a column of fire beyond the trees. Story 5 Planting and Harvest By Mira Grant For the longtime crew of the Philomelus, discovering that even the deep reaches of space had their seasons had been a surprise but one that had long since died down into simply part of the way the world worked. Time passed, the station turned, their beds and banks of seeds turned into beds and banks of seedlings, of plants, of fruits and grains, all ready for harvest. It was as if the sheer density of the vegetation set the calendar, and all of their subjects consented letting themselves be governed by the communal timeline. It had been a busy summer, with seventeen new colony worlds looking for stable crops they could grow under their unique local conditions and populations that needed to be fed. And even as that was going on, the corporations that paid their operating costs were baying for better and more shelf-stable grain to be included in long-range ship supplies. That would have been easy enough, if they'd been able to develop a single strain and call themselves finished, but every ship seemed to draw its crew and do its marine recruiting from a different population back on Earth. The corporations weren't big on coddling the rank and file, and would have been happy to have them all sustained by nutrient paste and water, if not for the surprisingly extensive problems that came with this approach. The human body didn't do well on nutrient paste not in the long term and marines who couldn't lift their own equipment weren't very useful when it came to defending company resources. They needed solid nutrition in forms their bodies could understand and process, and they needed those nutrients to come from shelf-stable foods that wouldn't set off any of the allergies found in the various populations the crews were drawn from. That meant gluten-free, rice-free, soy-free, and low-carbohydrate versions of the same ration bars were necessary if they wanted to keep the ships properly supplied, and that was in addition to fruits and vegetables, and herbs and aromatics, for the higher-ranking crew members, who might be willing to accept a certain amount of privation for the sake of the job but weren't willing to face the vastness of space without garlic and fresh peppers and the other small luxuries they thought themselves owed. That was where Philomelus and the other stations like her entered the picture. Their hydroponics and grafting stations were entirely devoted to producing edible results that could remain stable over long stretches of time in the storage centers of corporation and colony ships, remaining as fresh as possible to keep the rank and file from feeling as if they were being mistreated by their corporate masters, although, of course, they were anyone who went into the sciences however loyal they had been in the beginning of their tenure, couldn't help seeing that with a T. 
terrible clarity the first time they delivered a load of new protein bars to a starving battalion of colonial marines, reassuring them that none of the allergens flagged for the unit had gone into their manufacture. Some of the stations also produced seeds. Not Philomelous. They specialized in finished products. It was commonly assumed that the scientists and farmers who worked the hydroponic stations were soft, and maybe that assumption was right, on some level, but the one thing no one seemed to take into account was that by the time someone had been with the company long enough to land on the Philomelous, they were unquestionably a killer. No one made it all the way to the remotest of the hydroponic stations without at least a little blood on their hands, and for most of them, it was a lot of blood. Mary, who specialized in tomatoes and didn't like talking to people when she didn't have to, was personally responsible for the death of an entire platoon of colonial marines after her attempts to tweak the flavor and stability of the fruit into something that could be pulverized and stabilized in paste form had also resulted in such an increased level of solanine that every one of her testers had died screaming as their muscles spasmed and locked, cutting off their air supply. Terry who had been working for years to perfect a form of rice that could keep under frozen conditions for longer than the currently accepted 30 years, had potentially killed more when his first test batches, despite passing early tests, had proven to be nutritionally about as valuable as water. At least two crews had starved to death, and he had been reassigned to the Philomelous, his work downgraded in importance his chances of advancement dramatically curtailed, but not eliminated. Honestly, Nita, whose job involved keeping distractible horticulturists and researchers from accidentally engineering some kind of horrific weaponized kudzu doing it on purpose would, of course, be completely fine, and probably earn the team responsible a commendation wasn't sure any of her researchers actually cared about falling out of favor. Their punishment, such as it was, constituted removal from the seat of corporate power, with all the attendant politics, power plays, and jockeying for prime funding. Here, they all pulled from the same pool, and while she was constantly fielding complaints from teams who felt someone else had been given special treatment, most of them were smart enough not to formally complain that corporate funds weren't being used to benefit their personal projects. It was less, in Nita's eyes, because they understood that embezzlement was wrong and likely to get them in trouble, and more concerned that if the Corps heard about some of those private projects they would be seized in an instant. Intellectual property, her sweet ass. It was just a fancy way of saying, someone else does all the work, and we get to pretend we understand the end result as long as we feel like we can profit from it. Her staff did the bulk of their work in private, so there was a chance that they could keep it. Of course, nothing here was truly private. The corporations found out about everything eventually and anyone who was actually caught concealing research would find themselves taking a swift trip out an airlock when the collected interest for all that life support they'd used up over the years came due at once. Nita knew what her researchers were doing, and she knew they were all smart and self-interested enough not to take it too far. They would hand their projects over like good little corporate assets, when they stumbled on anything even remotely profitable. They knew their role in all this. A chime echoed through her office, informing her that the event she'd been waiting for all day they were too far from the nearest star to have true day and night cycles, but humanity would cling to its little habits had finally occurred. Smiling to herself, Nita shut down her terminal and rose, heading for the airlock. Heads popped out of office doors as she passed them, 
curious researchers turning toward the sound of something new happening like flowers turn toward the sun, their faces simple ovals in the dimness of the hall. Only Mary, misanthropic, antisocial Mary, found enough interest to actually emerge from her lab, rolling her chair into the hall, and calling, in her harsh Planet Ciders accent, Hey! What's going on? Seed shipment, said Nita, and turned to face her researchers, even as she continued walking backward down the hall. One of the other stations failed, and we've picked up their unused stock. Call it Planter's Christmas. You'll all have the opportunity to review the manifest before we divvy up. But it was all corp-funded and corp-owned, and that means it's ours now. Which one? Terry followed Mary's lead into the hall, an expression of uncharacteristic worry on his weathered face. The Asus, said Nita. I thought something might have gone wrong, said Terry mournfully. They stopped updating their beacons a week ago. I'd been communicating with one of their granary specialists. He was working on a better means of hardening quinoa, and some of the genes looked like they might be cross-compatible. Your specialist, whoever he was, did that work in the name and on the payroll of the Weyland Utani Corporation. He is no longer listed on that same payroll, which means it is now considered intellectual salvage, and can be claimed by anyone who wants to continue that work and doesn't ask too many questions. She injected a note of warning into her voice. When she'd been notified that they'd be receiving the shipment, there had been no indication as to why, exactly, the hydroponic station had failed meaning that it could have been anything, from an equipment failure that killed everyone on board to an attempt at corporate espionage resulting in the liquidation of the station. Terry paled, clearly taking her point, and retreated back into his lab with a final muttered, if the research files were included, I call dibs. Mary scowled and wheeled herself back into her own lab, recognizing a line past which Nita would not allow herself to be pushed. They could and did, on a regular basis test the limits of both her patients and the companies, but they hadn't survived employment long enough to get booted to the ass end of nowhere without learning at least a few facts about surviving in a corp-owned research facility. No one else interrupted her as she made her way through the rest of the station to the hold where the supply shuttle was docked. It was unmanned. Not unusual when you were talking about the research facilities even the ones like the Philomelus, where nothing of value was genuinely expected, which stayed open only because the people in charge had long since determined that their occasional wild flashes of genius more than balanced the cost of keeping them up and operating the rest of the time. They didn't want to risk theft of research or corporate espionage. Nita barely glanced at the control panel to confirm that the shuttle had left the Asus and proceeded directly from there to the Philomelus, with no unscheduled stops or detours. Everything in the log was correct to her expectations, save for one small notation, Pilot? Pilot? Why would they list a pilot if there wasn't meant to be one? Hunk of junk, said Nita, smacking the console with the flat of her hand. Wherever this Lieutenant Terry Ashmore was, they weren't in the shuttle. She was disabused of that belief as soon as she opened the back, releasing a hiss of bitterly cold air. Steam swirled into the hold. Nita took a step back allowing it to dissipate before she stepped inside. Racks of seed stock lined the walls, carefully labeled and locked down, often with the corresponding data chip affixed to the container. Sprouted specimens sturdy enough to survive the cold transit required by the journey stood in tidy racks at the center, 
ready to be delivered to their new destinations. And there, slumped in the corner, was the absent Lieutenant Ashmore, slumped over and very clearly deceased. Well, of course he is, muttered the small voice of sanity, still echoing at the back of her head. People need a torso if they want to be alive. Nita froze, torn between wanting to get a closer look and wanting to run away as quickly as she could, before whatever had killed this man could spread itself to her. If it's airborne, you're already dead, she thought, and stepped closer. The warmth of her presence set off a cascade of blinking lights and humming systems, the shuttle reacting and preparing itself for use. That confirmed that Lieutenant Ashmore had been dead long enough for his body to cool completely, in case the ice crystals in his hair hadn't been confirmation enough. From the state of him, she guessed his death had occurred very shortly after the shuttle left the Asus, probably inside of the hour. But what could possibly have done something like this to a human body? She crouched down once she was close enough, peering into the wreckage of his chest. Between the injury and the cold, everything had frozen essentially in place. It had definitely exploded outward, but the ribs and the flesh around them remained too intact for this to have been caused by an actual bomb. Something had been inside this man's chest. Something that started out as small enough to fit in the human body, finding space for itself alongside, oh, lungs and the heart and all the other organs nothing looked like it had been eaten at all, although some things looked more than a little squashed but growing rapidly enough that even the organ damage she could see hadn't been given sufficient time to kill him. Nita was still crouched down, studying the remains, when she heard a clicking sound from behind her, like the rustle of a cricket's wings. She had a moment to remember an old lab partner of hers who had been working on sustainable insect-based protein sources, and whose side of their shared workspace had always sounded like that and then she was slowly turning to face the inevitable, to behold the horror uncurling from where it had been coiled against the frozen ceiling, long, segmented tail unwinding click by click, jaws open and working on nothing, and she understood exactly what had happened to the lieutenant. In less time than it took to remember everything she hadn't finished, she understood better than she had ever wanted to understand anything. There wasn't even time for her to scream. Mary didn't like people. That was the first thing most people realized about her. She didn't like them, had never liked them, and was never going to like them. People were, in a word, irrelevant to the way she wanted the world to work. She liked the things that people made, liked having life support and lights and tools calibrated to her exacting standards, but all those things could happen without the people responsible for them getting anywhere near her. She could live in a world devoid of anyone but herself and her beloved plants, as long as no one interfered. People assumed that because she didn't like them, she ignored them or was unaware of their movements. In reality, she paid more attention than the majority of them did. She had to, if she wanted to avoid them. Nita's location beacon moved into the hold, to what Mary presumed was the newly arrived salvage shuttle, and then it stopped. Mary scowled at the screen. The dot did not obligingly resume movement. This was unusual especially as the system showed no one else in or around the hold. Nita could be waylaid Mary had done it herself on occasion, when Nita wasn't processing a funding or equipment request quickly enough but not by screens. If someone was messaging her, she'd still be on the move. Mary scowled and gripped the wheels of her chair, turning and rolling herself out of her office. 
If there were any new tomato varietals in this shipment, she wanted them before one of the others could try to lay claim. Nita was usually decent about allotting things according to people's individual projects, but sometimes people were working under NDA for the corp and somehow managed to get first dibs on new materials accordingly. If there were tomatoes, Mary wanted them, and she wanted them now. She hadn't known that new tomatoes were a possibility until Nita mentioned it, but now that she knew, she couldn't think of anything else. Tomatoes were all. She rolled herself down the hall toward the hold, more determined all the time to find her supervisor and demand what she was due. The doors to the hold hissed open at her approach. There was the shuttle, hatch standing open, and not a trace of Nita to be seen. Mary frowned, rolling closer. Hello? Nita? We need to talk about this delivery dash. There was no reply save for an odd, distant clicking sound. Mary turned to look over her shoulder. There was no one there. She was alone. Gripping her wheels, she rolled closer to the shuttle. Something red was sprayed across the surface of the hatch and the floor immediately inside. Mary frowned. Fertilizer of some sort? There was a meaty tang in the air, like the blood meal she sometimes gave to her tomatoes when she needed to encourage more robust growth. She rolled a little closer to the shuttle. No, not like blood meal, which was made almost entirely from freeze-dried plasma. This was the raw substance that went into the stuff, fresh and arterial and still drying. She spun her chair around rolling as fast as she could toward the door. She didn't make it. But oh, how she tried, and in the end, she came terribly close. Terribly close indeed. Any horticulturist can explain how quickly leaf rot spreads. Once it gets into an otherwise healthy plant— you're looking at cutting and burning everything above the root structure to even have a prayer of saving anything at all, and even then, you might fail. When the shuttle from the Asus docked with the Philomelus, there had been nineteen researchers and five support staff on the station, a bare-bones crew for a station that no one really cared about, that only mattered on paper. It was a corporate asset that turned out just enough in the way of results to pay for itself, but not enough to make a serious profit. Only the ironclad contracts some of the researchers had signed when they were younger and more valuable kept the place operational. And the corporation would be happy to shut them down anyway if they ever got the chance. Still, an army marches on its stomach and they had been filling that stomach for a very long time. They had never considered themselves to be at any great risk of attack, from either without or within. But leaf rot, once it makes contact, spreads. It spreads so swiftly, like the infection that it is, and once it takes hold the fight is already over. Less than a day after the shuttle from the Asus docked, the Philomelus sat silent, drifting in limitless space, spinning slowly with the force of her own engines, not yet winding down. Inside, plants grew, automated systems delivered water and nutrients in preset quantities, nurturing banks of seedlings and trays filled with mature plants. Things moved through the foliage. Terrible, inhuman things. Silence reigned over all. The things had yet to fully understand that there was no way for them to leave the station. They would spend their strange lifespans here, whiling it away within these walls, and they would die here. Even if they had understood, there was nothing to indicate that they would have cared. They had taken this place as their own, claimed it in the face of all adversity, 
not that they had faced much resistance from the hot, squishy creatures that had claimed it before their arrival. Those had been soft things, easily slain, easily turned into incubators for their young. The hive, small as it was, was complete and serene in its dominion. Deep in the belly of the Philomelus, a small room, sealed off to prevent its contents from seeping out and infecting the rest of the cargo, sat closed away, heat-shielded and maintained in a perpetual state of negative pressure. And inside, its sole occupant sat at her terminal, desperately transmitting message after message, desperate to reach any form of rescue. Dot I repeat, this is the research station Philomelus, requesting immediate and urgent assistance. My name is Lisa Olson. I am a horticultural researcher working for the Whale and Yutani Corporation to develop a more effective form of corn blight to distribute on colony worlds afflicted with an excess of native vegetation. I am, as near as I can tell, the soul. She stopped there trying to swallow away the sudden dryness in her mouth. Dot the sole survivor. Her breath caught in her throat, and she paused. When the things had torn through the rest of the crew, she had been in the process of delivering another tray of samples to her workspace. She had seen them moving through the halls on the monitor, swift and oil-skinned and terrible. They moved like they were slicing through the air, like there had never been anything so sharp in all the world, and she knew they would have her dead in an instant if she allowed herself to be caught. And if she left this room, she would be caught. There was no question of that. So she stayed in her solitary isolation, and sent her pleas for help out into the ether again and again, praying for a reply resigned to the fact that she wasn't going to receive one. She was a junior researcher at a station in the middle of nowhere, who had yet to make enough of a profit to be worthy of an expensive, potentially dangerous rescue mission. She was going to die here. The only question now was whether she was going to die slowly, of starvation, or quickly at the claws and jaws of an unspeakable creature of clearly alien origin, swift and sharp and terrible. Based on what she'd seen on the monitors, it might be painful, but she wouldn't have time to suffer. Unless she did. Most of their victims had been taken apart immediately, dissolving into an explosion of blood and tissue that would almost have been beautiful if it hadn't come out of a living person. But the victims that weren't taken apart. The closest comparison Lisa could make was to certain types of wasps that some of the other horticulturists used in their research. They laid their eggs inside the bodies of predatory caterpillars, and when the larvae hatched, they fed on the bodies of their unwilling hosts until they finally got too big and burst out of their birthing space. The people who'd been burst open in that horrifying way were still sprawled where they had fallen when their terrible offspring emerged. She couldn't see any signs that they'd been even partially devoured the bodies seemed fairly intact, except for the open-petaled flowers of their ribs but she also hadn't looked too closely. Some things didn't bear that much study. Some things were better left alone. Lisa shuddered and dragged her eyes back to the communication panel, depressing the button to send out one more message, one more hopeless prayer, into the emptiness of space. She could survive in here for a few more days, eating her own samples the ones that weren't harmful to the human body and then, when the food ran out, she could decide her death. And of course, there was a third option. There were things in here that she knew would kill her if she swallowed them. But she also knew precisely how painful that death would be, and she wasn't quite ready to consider that way out. This is the research station Philomelus, 
requesting immediate and urgent assistance. I repeat, this is the research station Philomelus, requesting immediate and urgent assistance. My name is Lisa Olson. There were no corporation-owned vessels, Wayland yutani or otherwise, within range of Lisa's transmission. The next scheduled transit wasn't for nearly a solar week. She'd be long dead by the time it occurred, through whichever of her five paths eventually came to seem the most appealing. But there was a ship. Its systems picked up the transmission automatically, running it through equally automated translation systems until words not in English, nor in any language known to the human species appeared on a dark display screen. Monitors tend to be the same whenever designed and constructed by a species that shares a similar visual wavelength, and so while nothing else on this ship might have been understood by human eyes, the control panel and associated displays were perfectly comprehensible. A small light began to flash, and when no one came to check on it, after a reasonable amount of time, an equally small alert began beeping in time with the light, becoming impossible to ignore. One of the navigation crew appeared, walking out of the deeper corridors of the ship, mandibles flaring in annoyance. This was an interruption, a distraction, and there was no possible way it could be worth the time it was taking away from his personal pursuits. He'd taken this posting in part, because of the long stretches of time he'd have to himself, allowing him to focus on caring for his extensive collection of bladed weapons. They were primitive, to be sure, but they were oh so lovely, and their edges spoke of the elegance inherent to the physical universe. He looked at the screen, with its precise, unflinching translation of Lisa's words, most precisely at the section where she had attempted to haltingly, awkwardly describe something so singular that it was recognizable even through her imprecision and ignorance. He straightened, eyes suddenly bright, and turned to bellow two words into the depths of the ship before reprogramming their destination in the drive. Hianda Amida, he yelled and everyone in range of his voice understood at once when the ship rumbled to life under their feet, when they felt the propulsion systems engage and shift them onto their new course. Onward they sailed, toward a greater hunt than any of them had dared to hope for on this relatively staid and predictable circuit of their established space. They were a warrior species, yes, but even within a warrior species some infrastructures must be maintained, some choices must be made less for the sake of glory and personal experience than for the retention and livability of claimed territories. This ship had been on a slow circuit of others in the area, refueling them and performing basic maintenance tasks. All of them had been tested as adults, and all of them had succeeded but not well enough to be considered elites. A hunt such as this would never have been offered to them. They could, if they chose, send a beacon to a better prepared crew, notifying them of the opportunity. Or they could claim this prize for their own. There was really no question, in the end. Lisa hunched in her seat staring at the monitors. There hadn't been much activity for the last few hours. Prior to that, she'd seen the fast, hard-shelled things gathering in the halls, tapping their tails and talons against the floor, sending vibrations through the structure of the station. She thought they might be communicating, although she couldn't say for sure, they were too alien to her understanding of how life operated. Maybe if she'd been an entomologist. Regardless, she thought they knew she was there. They had been appearing more and more frequently in the hall outside her lab, low to the ground, tails lashing, and terrible heads canted forward, 
so that they seemed less like semi-skeletal bipeds and more like very strange quadrupeds. They could move even faster on four legs than they could on two. Them being off balance wasn't going to save her if she unlocked the door. And with the way they'd been prowling, and the fact that they hadn't eaten any of their victims, she suspected they were stalking her less because they were hungry, and more because they wanted to incubate at least one more of themselves. Jokes on you, she muttered, and took another swig of water laced with nutrient powder that was supposed to go to her blight. Another few days in here, and there won't be enough of me left to incubate anything in. The monitor beeped. Lisa's head snapped up, and she stared with wide, disbelieving eyes as a ship with an unfamiliar outline gently sidled up to the airlock, magnetic grapples engaging as it began the docking process. No, she breathed. No, no, no. They were going to walk into the station and get slaughtered. At her last count, there were eleven of the things moving through the halls and ducts, each one of them fast enough to take out anyone who dared enter their presence. Lisa hit the button for the intercom. If you can hear me already, unidentified vessel, this is Lisa Olson. I am the last surviving member of the station complement. It is not safe to enter without a full situation report. Please disengage immediately. Had she summoned these people here, condemning them to a quick, brutal death with her distress calls? She couldn't live with herself if that were the case. This was the first time she had used the intercom since the deaths of her crewmates, and she was a little surprised when none of the creatures showed any reaction to her voice. She blinked, slowly. They didn't hunt by sound. They must use something else to guide them to their prey. It matched with what she'd been able to observe of their vocalizations thus far. They hissed and snarled and occasionally made an almost pleasant trilling sound, but none of that seemed to say anything. The only times she'd seen anything that even trended toward communication had been the tapping against the floor. Vibration They communicated through vibration. That couldn't be the only means of hunting they employed, but it meant the intercom was safe enough. They had attacked her speakers in the beginning, but stopped when they realized there was nothing there for them to eat. Taking a deep breath, she watched the airlock door slide open, the creatures pouring toward it, and tried to calm the frantic beating of her heart, which felt like it was going to burst clean out of her chest without any aid from their unwanted guests. It wouldn't help her and it wouldn't answer any of the questions now thronging in her mind, the largest of which was simply, what are these? The creatures that had claimed her station were insectal and strange, unbelievably alien in the lines of their bodies and the angles of their bulbous heads, and somehow their very impossibility made them easier to accept. Of course something that deadly, that unstoppable, would look like nothing else she'd ever seen. That was what made the things make sense. These, though. They were bipedal, following much the same body plan as human beings, with thick legs and muscular arms. Based on the size of the weapons they carried, that muscle wasn't for show. They would need to have several times standard human strength to be able to make any use at all of their equipment. And their musculature. Something about them was subtly wrong. Whatever these were, they weren't human. As they poured into the station, weapons at the ready, speaking to one another in a language that seemed made of a mixture of growls and clicks, she began to hope that there might be a chance she would survive this. Then one of the original things lunged out of the shadows at the new creatures, 
who shouted and brought their weapons to bear. Those weapons not guns, not lasers, but a hybrid of the two, incomprehensible and clearly deadly spoke, and the creature exploded into a mass of chitin and gore. Where the blood splattered on the walls, it began eating away at the metal, corroding and dissolving it like fungus chewing away at the roots of a bramble vine. Lisa was immediately on her feet, one fist thrust into the air like she had just seen a sports team make the winning play in a competition she'd been following for years. Yes. Lisa froze, feeling ridiculous. Slowly, she lowered her hand, then flushed red as she realized that even her embarrassment was pointless. There was no one here to see it. Even more slowly, she sank back into her seat, eyes fixed on the screen. The new arrivals were fanning out, making their way along the hall in slow, deliberate formation. Eight of them there were, and warriors all, properly blooded, for all that their performance in the trials had been poor enough to warrant consignment to a maintenance ship and not to the fields of glory. They would all be able to claim elite status when they returned home, proper Yautja adults at last, and no one would deny them improvement in their station or better opportunities for advancement. Truly, this hunt was a gift from the universe and they were going to take full and enthusiastic advantage of it. No one could say they had stolen this opportunity from a more deserving hunting party, a group of young bloods yet to fail their first trial or a better armed and armored team of proper warriors. No, this was a chance outbreak, a completely unpredictable hive that had yet to fully establish itself, and they would triumph. They were Yautja, and this was only hard meat, difficult to kill, brutal, yes, but animal. Proud of themselves and confident in a victory not yet won, they strode into the station, delicate and decoratively made, as Uman structures always were. Almost at once, two of them earned the title of blooded, as one of the hard meat lunged out of the shadows and met the speaking ends of their weapons, bursting into a spray of gore and chitin, pieces on every surface. They all roared laughter, delighted by the ease of their accomplishment. The laughter stopped a moment later, when the smallest of their number made a choked sound and the rest turned to find him gone, only empty space where he should have been. The remaining seven immediately pressed closer to each other, shoulder to shoulder, weapons at the ready. They had been careless, and one of their own had paid the price. Yes, the soft, squishy humans had been caught off guard by the hard meat, but they could almost be forgiven. They were strong warriors in their own way but they were still as children wandering the cosmos with no concept of how many dangers lurked on the fringes of their known space, how many terrible ways the void offered for them to die. And they were breakable enough, and bred quickly enough, that the ones who did learn to recognize those dangers rarely survived them. The bodies were swept aside and forgotten, washed away by the brief tides of short human life. Yautja had to be better than them, were better than them, in every possible, every conceivable way. And still they were down a man, already, and the kill count stood at one for each side. More cautiously, not laughing now, they began to creep forward, winking out of sight one by one as their refraction suits activated and removed them from the visible world. Oh, you did not. Lisa exclaimed, sitting up straighter. She had shrieked and slumped when one of the swift black things appeared and took one of the massive strangers away, whisking him into nothingness more quickly than she would have believed possible. Their fight had taken place entirely on a different screen, well away from the rest of his crew. Without his gun, 
he still put up an incredible fight, producing what seemed like an endless stream of hand weapons and holding the creature at bay for longer than she would have believed possible. And then the stream ran dry, and the creature was upon him. It jammed the point of its terrible tail through the stranger's throat, and he died with a gurgle and a final thrash, the tension leaving his body as the life left his eyes. At least he was dead, and couldn't be used as an incubator. The creature hissed triumphantly atop the corpse before darting away, moving too quickly for the cameras to smoothly follow. Why did they kill the way they did? They didn't feed. They took some of their victims alive and glued them to the walls, where skittering crab things she had never seen before used their bodies as incubators for more of the swift, dark things. Killing this newcomer made a certain amount of sense. These creatures, whatever they were, had clearly come here ready to fight the things, armed and armored and ready for a slaughter. A slaughter that was apparently not going to be as one-sided as they had expected it to be, judging by the way this one had been taken. So self-defense made sense as a motive, but the deaths of the other horticulturists. They hadn't been killed for food, and they hadn't been killed in self-defense, and most of them hadn't been killed to serve as incubators. It was like these things viewed absolutely everything that wasn't part of their hive swarm. She didn't have a group noun for these things, and while she probably didn't need one, she was a scientist. She preferred it when things were easily categorized and filed away. Fine, then, call them a hive one whose collective danger sense was so finely tuned that anything they recognized as other, which seemed to be absolutely everything, was suspect and needed to be destroyed. There were ten of the things remaining, and seven of the creatures or there had been seven, before they all vanished into thin air, concealed by some sort of refraction technology she would have loved to study at more leisure. When she'd seen them blow the first one apart, she would have called those good odds, but now. Now she needed to do something to help them, if she could. She pressed the button for the intercom, taking a deep breath. I don't know if you speak English, she began. I'm hoping you do, and you came here because you picked up my distress call. The black things don't react to sound when it isn't coming from a living person. The creatures were invisible to the eye, but they still showed up on the station's temperature scanners. She still didn't know how the things hunted. They had no visible eyes, so it was possible that vanishing from sight wasn't going to help them the way they hoped it would. If you can hear me, if you can understand me, there are ten of them, and they're moving toward you in the halls. Your comrade is dead. The one that took him killed him quickly, without implanting any eggs. I don't know how much you know about these things, but it's got to be more than I do. I'm the last survivor dash. The voice of the woman who had called them here emerged from speakers along the ceiling level and while they would obscure the sound of the warrior's footsteps, they would also obscure the sound of the hard meat. One by one, their translators keyed on to what she was saying, and they realized that weak and cowardly as the omen might be, she was also providing them with the precise locations of the remaining hard meat, as well as their numbers. The weapons of the Yautja were superior to the biology of the hard meat. Only speed and surprise served to give the creatures an edge of superiority. With the omen telling them precisely where to go and shouting dismayed warning when the hard meat accelerated toward them, even that thin edge was lost, and the hunt's conclusion became a foregone conclusion. It was still a hunt with honor. The danger of the prey and the closeness of the quarters saw to that. 
one of the warriors was standing too close to one of the hard meat when it exploded into chitin and gore, and he howled as the droplets of acidic blood ate into the side of his face. They were a cleaning crew, however, and one of his companions stepped in with neutralizing spray before the blood could do more than slew away the top layers of his skin. He would have a scar to remember his grand hunt by, and a renewed need to kill. He roared approval, and his companions echoed him. And still the omen voice spoke, guiding them to target after target, until the last hard meat was dead and they harvested their trophies, tails and spines and one partially intact head. The last thing it guided them to was the room where it had cowered throughout the great fight, opening the door enough to see them, to be seen for itself. They looked the omen in the eye, scanned her, and saw that she was not infected. She was weak and small and fragile, but she was not carrying the hard meat nestled in the palace of her bones. Their work here was done. They removed their masks and looked at her bare-faced, with honor. Lisa recoiled, but did not scream. There was no queen. A pity, that. Content and triumphant, they made their way back to their ship, leaving the omen who had called them here still standing on her own unsevered feet. She had given them a great gift and she had offered neither threat nor challenge. Let her receive the greatest honor they had to offer in return. Let her live. Lisa had seen videos once, of a kind of fish that used to live in the oceans on Earth, called the sarcastic fringe head. It was a silly name for a silly animal, which could distend its jaws to make its head look like it had doubled in size. When the strangers revealed their faces to her, that was all she could think of. These things had faces sort of like a bulldog crossed with one of those fish, topped with a cascade of fleshy tentacles. If she'd been forced to guess where they lived from looking at those heads, she would have guessed they were something aquatic, rarely if ever coming to the surface. These were alien things, from an alien cosmos, and she had no place among them. For a moment, she thought for sure that she was going to die. Then they turned, and walked away, and left her alone. Lisa watched, eyes wide, as their ship decoupled from the airlock and the strange visitors left. Slowly, she rose from her chair and made her way back to the lab door which she had resealed as soon as her visitors had come and gone, cutting herself off from the rest of the station. There was nothing out there now. Nothing moved on the monitors. Just her, alone, in a floating graveyard the corporation had probably already written off as lost. No one was coming to save her, not now, and maybe not for a long, long time. Lisa took a deep, shuddering breath and opened the door. Someone needed to cycle the hydroponics. She might live here for the rest of her life, but by God, she was going to live. And life meant she was going to have strawberries. If nothing else, she would have strawberries. Story 6 Blood and Honor by Suzanne L. Lambden. A thunderous noise and heavy vibration roused Lieutenant Kai Kentris from a groggy slumber. Her immediate response at finding herself strapped inside a life pod, wearing a spacesuit and helmet, and plummeting toward a red planet was confusion. The last thing she remembered was lying in bed next to Captain Duran of the USS Tefra. Together, We'll explore the galaxy, Duran had told her. Somehow, the comforts of her pillow and his arms ended up replaced by a turbulent ride in the one-person pod. 
It was possible the predator ships spotted in the Andromeda system had attacked the Tephra. Captain Lucien Duran, a cautious man, would only have ordered the Marines and crew to abandon the Bougainville-class military vessel if it had sustained serious damage and there was no other choice. If this were the case, Kentris should have seen other jettisoned life pods out the window, but as she searched, the pod entered the atmosphere. Friction against the nose of the small vessel caused the metal to glow crimson. Red and orange flames lapped outside the window. Kentris a U.S. colonial marine, trained to remain calm in the worst situation, and still able to smell Duran's cologne on her skin closed her eyes. She immediately recalled a prior meeting on the Tefra with Duran and Palmer Lennox, a rep from Wayland Dittani. Lennox had nervously chewed on the end of a pen, while Duran oozed confidence and pride. All three sat in a conference room with a long window affording a few of a planet with more landmass than oceans. Like Earth, planet XK-93 has a protective ozone layer and an atmosphere, Kentris said. There are high levels of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide. Breathable air. Yes, yes, Lennox said, impatient. And if your captain sends down a platoon, as agreed upon, you'll be with them. I agreed to nothing. The company New Xenomorph XX-121 inhabited this planet before we arrived, Duran said. The prior science expedition failed to report back. We must assume a queen exists, producing eggs, and one platoon won't cut it. You're the expert, Captain Duran. The company will colonize this planet. With or without your help, Lennox said. I suggest you follow orders. Our drones identified xenomorphs on the southern the hottest continent before we lost contact with them, Kentris said. There's a network of tunnels running beneath the surface, which is where the queen will be. The company drones found several active volcanoes and a large cache of iron ore before we lost contact with them. Duran leaned forward. We know as well as you do that the company is after the iron ore deposits, Lennox, he said. The ship sensors have the same problem as the drones because of the ore, and can't get an exact reading on the xenomorphs. I'm not sending down a platoon until we can confirm the Queen's location and the number of her guards. Excuses, Lennox said. I'm starting to think you're the wrong man for the job, Duran. Do what you're told, or this will be your last command. This is an extermination mission. It's why the military is here. As for the ore, that's none of your business. Can I say something? Kentris asked. You're interested in the southern continent. We know a queen is down there. The night marchers can get the job done, but we have a bigger problem than acid-spewing aliens. The company man glared at her. The tips of his ears turned red. I'm in charge of this mission, Captain Duran, he snarled. Tell your lieutenant I'm not interested in her opinion. Now you're pissing me off, Duran said. He stood at six foot five, dark-haired, impeccably groomed, down to the sleek cut of his triangular black beard. A spaceship entered this solar system six hours ago. We tracked it while in orbit, but lost contact when it entered the planet's atmosphere. I've seen one of those long-nosed ships before and that's why I know XK-93 is the hunting ground for these aggressive predators. Preposterous, Lennox said. Ever seen a hunter close up? 
Kentress opened her jacket and pulled up her undershirt, revealing a set of long scars across her taut stomach. I encountered my first not long after I transferred to the ship. Female. Vicious. The science team were no more equipped to deal with these hunters than the colonists will be, and you know it. I've seen images, Lieutenant Kentress, but you survived, Lennox said. In fact, you're precisely who we need down on the planet. I'm not sure what is worse, Lennox. Your breath or your stupidity, Kentris said. I got lucky Sergeant Mule had my back. No Marines. No big show, Duran said. He crossed his arms. We'll find another planet to colonize. End of discussion. The flames at the window receded. Kentris gazed out at a hazy sky riddled with dust clouds, but saw no other life pods. Set on automatic, the vessel made its rapid descent over a desert with massive dunes that reminded her of the southern continent, and with a loud click, deployed a canopy. Air filled the massive parachute with a violent yank to slow the vessel's descent, letting it drift down until it slammed into a dune. The force behind the pod's impact punched it through the sand to slide down a hundred feet before coming to a jarring halt. In the next instant, every monitor on the console turned off. The engine whined in protest and shut down, leaving the interior dark. Without an operating system, she had no way to contact the Tephra, nor scan for hostile life forms, and she had to open the door manually. Unfastening the harness, Kentrist stooped as the roof was low, and grasped the emergency handle in both hands. When she pushed downward nothing happened. Frustrated, she threw her weight into forcing the handle down and cursed when it broke off in her hand. She stared at eighteen inches of specialized metal in numb disbelief. A marine never gives up, she thought, and wedged the end of the handle into a groove in the side of the door. Able to hear the howl of wind and sharp grains of sand pelt the side of the ship, she hesitated. Without powered armor or weapons, Kentris doubted she'd survive long wearing a spacesuit in the harsh elements but she had to try. Repeated attempts to open the door left her lightheaded. She sat in the chair, flipping switches in the hope the computer system might reboot, and managed to turn on the emergency beacon. Next, she searched in a cubbyhole for a gun, found nothing, and pushed the face shield open. Duran wouldn't leave me. Nor would Sergeant Mule. This is company bullshit. During the last seven months, Kentris had found Lennox's manner threatening, but she didn't think he had the balls to stuff her inside a tin can. Duran had handpicked conscripted Marines for reassignment to the Night Marchers, 4th Battalion, 3rd Army Group, and chose Kentris as his weapons specialist. The moment she met the captain, she knew they'd be lovers, and had decided a three-year mission sounded good. Later, she discovered Wayland Yutani privately owned the spaceship in which Duran's father-in-law was a major shareholder which was why he'd tolerated the company rep. The Tephra had visited two planets Duran marked as habitable with terraforming potential. Colonists would arrive at both locations months before the Tephra made its voyage home. They were the lucky ones, Kentris thought. XK-93 was a speck of red dust on the outer fringes of the Andromeda system, too far removed from any space station for anyone to intercept the transmitted beacon until several months later. As Duran had placed the planet under quarantine and scheduled their immediate departure, the Tephra had left the solar system without her. 
After the meeting, Lennox had slunk off with his tail between his legs. Kentris had retired with Durand to his quarters. Same routine as always the captain went first, then five minutes later, she entered. Both stripped, got into bed, and Durand rushed, as if they'd run out of time. Lennox is trouble, Kentris said. That a-hole can complain all he wants. Lennox doesn't care if every Marine dies down there. I made the right call. There are other planets, Kai. The company doesn't realize these predators are a serious threat. Nor is this the only planet they're on, Kentris said. I don't trust Lennox. Nor should you. Think he knows? No one better know about us. I'm a married man. I meant that I'm trans. Honey, you're beautiful, and you know it. That's not the problem. My wife is a harpy. Her father is Cronus reincarnated. If they find out I'm off my leash, they'll devour me. I'm sorry, but my career comes first. What's that mean? It means I can't have Lennox poking his nose into my personal business. Be extra careful sneaking into my room. Okay? Kentris took her anger out on the door. Adrenaline pumped through her system as she stood, got into position, and jammed the handle into the groove. Muscles cramped as she pushed against the metal handle, and the door opened an inch. She paused, again queasy, and leaned against the door until the cramps subsided. With a glance at the monitor on the back of her left wrist, she confirmed the surface temperature was 103 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was getting hotter inside the pod. She put her shoulder to the door. A loud thump hit the observation window. Kentris glanced at it, able to see slimy skid marks but not what made them. Sand adhered to the substance within seconds, but her resolve to get outside was stronger than her fear of the unknown. Closing the face shield, desperate to get outside, she put her feet against the chair and back to the door. She used every bit of strength to force it open. Wind slammed into her, and she fell to the ground, half out of the pod, still holding the door handle. Rising to her feet, Kentris first checked her oxygen level. Suit remained cool. There was enough oxygen to last six hours, but she needed to get her bearings. The windblown sand partially obscured her vision. In every direction were miles of sand and giant dunes, and a large orange sun that created shimmers. She turned to the pod, raising the handle, and approached the observation window. Not a trace of slime remained, blown clean by sand and wind. Nor were tracks left in the sand to suggest what it might have been. She moved away from the pod, watching for movement in the sand, and finally climbed to the top of a dune for a better look. The long, dark shadow of a mountain range appeared in the distance. Thirty to forty miles from her current position, if vegetation grew at its base, she'd find water. A fit marine could make the march in less than ten hours, but Kentris walked on hot, shifting sand, weighted down by the suit, and each footstep was heavy and methodical. She avoided climbing dunes when possible, and twelve miles in, paused to suck on a tube within the helmet. Attached to a recycler, she drank her own perspiration running through a filtration unit, but it had a dank taste. It could have been worse. Her best friend Sergeant Frank Mühlmüller had drunk his own piss to survive in a desert environment. I've tasted worse, Mühl had told her. 
most of the things Mule recounted to Kentris were meant in jest. Unfortunately, Mule had underestimated the intelligence of a buck private when he told him, All you have to do is lie down in the presence of a hunter, avoid eye contact and stay quiet, barely breathing, and the big bastard will pass you by. The sergeant had failed to mention this tactic worked for unarmed civilians, viewed as a non-threat by predators, not soldiers. Kentris was with the private when the female hunter found them. The hunter had worn armor plates over her breasts, and her dreadlocks had ornate silver beads. Dual blades had extended from the hunter's wrists and sliced through the private's midsection. In the next stroke, the blades had sliced into Kentris's chest. As she lay on the ground, bleeding, she'd pretended to be dead when the hunter nudged her to provoke a reaction. Fortunately, Mule arrived, armed with XM99A phased plasma pulse rifles, blowing the formidable hunter into bits, and saved her life. Mule wouldn't betray her. Mule had tried to warn her. Minutes before the meeting, he had pulled her aside to say, the science team discovered an old queen in a cave surrounded by petrified eggs. No Praetorians were guarding her, which means the old girl no longer serves a purpose and was abandoned. That doesn't mean a younger queen isn't hiding somewhere else, producing eggs. Xenomorphs thrive in hot climates, which is why we spotted a hunter ship. Don't trust Lennox. I'm not so sure about Duran, either. Try to convince those two idiots that any time spent down on that planet is a death sentence. Why bring up Lucian right now? Because I know you two have a thing going on. Does his wife know? Kentris didn't believe in miracles and her chance of survival seemed slim. Whatever maniacal god controlled the cosmos had set the big orange sun on broil. Shimmers appeared on the sand to create mirages. What she saw a mile up ahead could not be real. The wind had a purpose and had partially uncovered the wreckage of several derelict spaceships cradled between the dunes. She trotted forward, eager to investigate. The remains of a USCM drop ship, battered to hell, and a larger predator ship told a story of what befell the company's ill-fated science team. They'd encountered hunters, not xenomorphs, as officially reported. Now it made sense why Duran had wanted to leave the moment they arrived. Both the captain and the rep had known the details of the ill-fated mission, but which man had sentenced her to death? Hoping to find weapons, she approached the dropship. A blast hole in its side had allowed sand to fill the interior. As she knelt to sweep aside sand, something heavy struck the top of her helmet, and a long tail curled around her face shield. Kentris suppressed rising panic, removed her helmet, and flung it aside. She'd worn her spacesuit for protection, not fear of pathogens. When the helmet hit the ground, she noticed a large hole melted into the center of the face shield. A pale, tan creature with a long tail slithered out of the helmet, burrowing deep in the sand. It was a xenomorph facehugger. She'd suspected as much when she'd noticed slime on the pod window, and now she watched its tail reappear, sifting the sand, before it headed toward her. Crawling backward on the sand, her hand brushed across what felt like a shaft and she pulled a spear from the dune. Her years of training in small ops had included using all types of blades and muscle memory guided her hands. As the creature flew toward her, whipping its tail, with an upward sweep the spearhead sliced through its body. A spray of acid hit the sand.
Kentra stood, holding the spear tight, no longer eager to investigate further, not if xenomorph eggs were inside the hunter's ship. She ran toward the mountains, not stopping for miles, not until she felt safe. Then she walked along slowly and used the time to examine the weapon. She'd seen a similar spear in the past. It was a predator's weapon, made of black polymer, which was unbreakable and acid-resistant. Light in hand and well-balanced, she discovered a switch released a second blade or retracted both, making it compact and easy to carry. Her spacesuit, however, had served its purpose, and now she roasted in it. The moment she removed the suit, Kentris felt cooler. Her damp undershirt and camo pants dried fast. While used to sand collecting in her boots, her long hair was a menace. One swipe with an extended blade left it cut at an odd angle, but she could see. Toward dusk, she arrived at a forest that grew at the base of the mountains. Exhausted, she took a knee and watched the rise of seven moons. Each moon was a different size and color, producing enough natural light to scrutinize the terrain. The air felt moist beneath the trees, but she remained thirsty. A carpet of green moss was a nice change from sand. As she listened to the silence, the hairs rose at the nape of her neck. She was not alone in the forest. Less than twenty yards away stood two Praetorians near a pool of water. Both were ten foot tall, black, with massive legs, long arms and spindly fingers that ended in razor-sharp talons. Prior reports had made note of their speed and agility. Their long tails served as weapons, with spearheads at the tips, and as if manufactured in a lab, they had two sets of jaws and elongated skulls. As the strange moonlight reflected off their crest-shaped skulls, the one closest to Kentris turned and hissed. She knew Praetorians kept close to their queen, seldom leaving the nest, and assumed something where someone had flushed the pair into the open. A triangle of three red glowing dots suddenly appeared on an elongated head. Kentris knew at once that a predator had targeted its prey and kept still. In the time it took to exhale, two streams of blue plasma shot out of the upper canopy, flushing out another xenomorph from the trees. With a scream of rage, a young queen, twice the size of the drones, appeared in the clearing. Her massive tail lashed out, breaking the tree in half, and something heavy hit the ground. It was Kentris's signal to run. Headed in the opposite direction to the battle, she flipped the switch to extend both spearheads, ducked around a tree, and nearly slammed into a drone. The xenomorph seemed as surprised as her, and with a hiss, slowly advanced. Kentris lifted the spear as the alien charged, impaling it on the spear, and jerked it back. From out of nowhere, bursts of blue plasma struck the wounded creature, splattering its skull. She crouched, aware something crawled on an overhead limb, and lifted her gaze to see a hunter. Dreadlocks bordered a helmet outfitted with a rhinoceros-like horn on the forehead. The body armor looked medieval, with silver pauldrons and a shoulder gun. Armed with a plasma gun, the hunter vanished at the sound of impact tremors and the snap of tree trunks. Kentris trembled at the approach of the young queen. Making loud, angry screeches, she swept aside large trees with a single swipe of her long, armored tail, on a quest to find the camouflaged predator who hunted her. Kentris took cover behind a tree, as blue streams of plasma came from a second location, fired not at the queen but the horned predator. 
both hunters ignored the rampaging queen to fight a duel in the trees. A stray bolt of plasma struck a nearby tree, showering Kentris with severed branches and burning debris. Burning vegetation emitted thick white smoke and a foul odor that burned her lungs. The queen suddenly swept through the fire, unhindered by the flames and heat, and received several well-aimed bursts of plasma. It was then Kentris ran in the opposite direction, not stopping until the sounds of battle were far behind, and found she'd entered an older section of the forest where the trees grew thick enough to block the moonlight. She pressed against a tree to catch her breath. Mule had told her three predators normally hunted together. Where was the third predator? And where was the ancient queen abandoned by its own kind? She assumed the entrance of a cave was nearby, as xenomorphs preferred warm, dark places and seldom came out into the open. It seemed possible the third hunter had flushed out their prey and now lay in wait somewhere in the dark. At the snap of a twig, Kentris lifted the spear. A lone Praetorian stepped into her path, peeled back its black lips to reveal its double set of glistening silver fangs. She jabbed with the spear, then turned it lengthwise to block a deadly blow from its tail and ducked behind a tree. The creature scuttled up the trunk, rustling in the branches, while she put her back to the bark, waiting. Aware it had moved onto a limb hanging above her, she grasped the spear in both hands and thrust it upwards. The tip pierced the armor plating of the xenomorph's chest, sinking deep, and she let it go, diving into the brush to avoid the spray of acid. With a piteous scream the Praetorian hit the ground, impaled on the spear but still alive. Kentris wiped sweat off her brow watching it thrash, then bolted forward to pull out the spear. Dull yellow acid splattered and hissed on the ground, dripping from the blade. As Kentris lifted the spear, prepared to drive it through the beast's head, a sudden rush of nausea bent her over. She spewed out stomach acid, able to smell its foulness before it hit the ground. Left with a pounding headache, blurred vision, and feeling weaker, she turned her focus back on the drone. It was no longer lying on the ground, but on its feet. Acid oozed out from the hole in its chest and saliva dripped from its extended second jaws. It rushed toward her, arms askew, hissing. Kentris swung the spear over her head and brought it down with expert precision slicing the Praetorian's oblong skull in half. Both sections fell to the ground as the body crumbled. With morbid fascination, she scrutinized both sections of the head, able to see greenish brain matter and a widening pool of acid that sizzled on contact with the moss. She wiped the blade on the ground to remove the yellow substance, then paused to listen to what sounded like rushing water. Compelled to investigate, she climbed to higher ground and came upon a massive waterfall flowing over the side of a hundred-foot cliff into a pond. Stone blocks formed a ring around the pool, with carvings of helmeted warriors from a long-forgotten humanoid race. Desperate for water, she waded into the pond. As she did so, a staircase became visible on the left of the waterfall cut out of the stone that led to an observation platform. The area felt sacred, for she saw no signs of either hostile species. She waded into the water, sinking to her neck, and sucked water into her mouth to sedate her thirst. The water cooled her overheated body, and she floated on her back, gazing at the night sky. Smoke obscured most of the moons, the air thick with the odor of burning timber. The serene moment ended at a sudden stabbing pain behind her eyes. 
muscle spasms made her body contort, yet she managed to hold on to the spear and return to the edge of the pool. As bile rose at the back of her throat, she spotted a pair of glowing yellow eyes watching her from the trees. Had the third hunter found her? Another spasm ripped through her body. It was too late to worry about toxins or parasites in the water, yet she'd felt sick before she landed, and her condition had worsened in the last hour. Without medical attention, Kentris knew she'd die. She closed her eyes, sinking into the water, and thought of Captain Lucy and Duran. The transmission from his wife had sealed her fate. Taken at his desk while Kentris lay in his bed, she had heard everything. Father confirms you have a promotion waiting. Think of it, Lucian, Mrs. Duran had said. You'll finally command a fleet. It's what we've always wanted. Make sure there's no scandal. Daddy won't like it. Kill her. After the captain ended the transmission, he'd offered Kentris a glass of water. I thought you loved me. You were getting a divorce, she said. At his apology, she had downed the water, not for a second believing he'd poison her. Until now. Whatever Captain Duran had given her, the side effects came and went. She climbed from the pool with the spear, but the yellow eyes had vanished. With no choice but to hunt a hunter, she advanced into the trees. Splatters of neon green blood left a trail a short distance into the forest and stopped at a tree. Kentris heard low growls and sharp clicking noises. She knelt and glanced at the glowing green blood. The scent of smoke from a campfire and a curious meaty odor drew her attention. A short walk led her into a small camp to find a young female predator propped against a tree. The female hunter was naked. Her skin was pale and covered with black tiger stripes at the sides of her abdomen, arms, and legs. Cords tied the hunter's arms to an overhead branch and her extended legs were roped together. Toes and fingers ended in black talons that looked sharp as daggers. A pair of big feet smoldered in the embers of the campfire. The hunter silently studied Kentris with big yellow eyes, but it was impossible it was the same predator that had spotted her at the waterfall. I'm not going to hurt you, Kentris said. Stay calm. Old Rhino was male. She didn't know the gender of the second hunter that had exchanged gunfire with him, but it made no sense a male predator would hunt females from his own species or leave this one to slowly roast in the campfire. The female hunter's flesh bore the signs of a branding iron. Deep gashes cut into her thighs and arms bled. For some reason, the hunter's helmet was left on. Her exposed neck was surprisingly slender, yet despite her injuries she looked strong. Ornate silver beads adorned her black dreadlocks. The silver armor tossed into a nearby pile looked familiar, as did the engraved round moon over a horizontal curved blade on the hunter's face shield. The last time Kentris had seen the symbol— She'd been lying on the ground with a female predator standing over her. She wondered if the females belonged to the same corps of fighters, or if the curious symbol was a family crest. I've seen that sign before, Kentra said, and drew an imaginary shape on her forehead. Not long ago, I fought one of your kind and lived. Who did this to you? Old Rhino? She made the shape of a horn with her hand. Must be some bad blood between you and the male. With a snarl, the female pulled at the ropes. 
Kentaris took pity on the female hunter, for she too felt the sting of a man's betrayal and assumed they shared a desire for revenge. I saw a second hunter. Another female? The injured hunter snarled and tried to move her feet. Kentaris stomped out the fire. She used the spear to push the hunter's seared feet out of the embers. I'm going to untie you, but first we make a deal. I need a way off this rock. You help me, I help you. Agreed? Bursts of blue plasma shot out of the trees, slamming into the ground close to where Kentris squatted beside the injured female. Reacting as she would to help a fellow marine, she cut the hunter free, pulled her up, and together they ran for cover, under a hailstorm of gunfire that set the trees on fire. The female grabbed Kentris by the shoulders, cutting into her flesh with the tips of her nails. She stood six inches taller and weighed a hundred pounds more than Kentris. With a soft snarl, the hunter motioned her forward, limping as they ran back toward the waterfall. Near the pool, Kentris noticed green blood on the ground and looked up at the same time as her companion. Overhead, the second female hunter hung upside down by her feet, flayed head to toe. Green blood dripped on the ground and her companion snarled. I'm sorry. We can't cut her down. There's a big queen and her guards in the area. Kentris winced as her head started to throb again. She pointed at the body then at her companion. Old Rhino killed her. He means to kill you and me. Yellow eyes narrowed. The female cocked her head to the side. I think you understand me, Kentris said. My captain left me behind. She tapped her chest, then lifted her hand to mimic the ship's departure. Do you have a ship? If I help you get to it, will you take me with you? Ship, the hunter repeated and pointed at the staircase. I'll take that as a yes. Kentris again tapped her chest. I'm Kai. She pointed at the female. What's your name? The growl deepened. I'm calling you Blood Venom. It sounds badass. Like you. Blood, the female said. Sounds like we have a deal. Kentaris helped the female to the stairs. Due to the condition of Blood Venom's burned feet, it took longer than she wanted to make it to the platform. Halfway, her companion needed to rest. Kentaris took the time to study the landscape. A fire lapped hungrily at trees in the distance. She turned to face the waterfall. Across the water, moonlight shone upon a spaceship set on a massive boulder, with its nose pointed toward the river. Blood venom pointed at the ship and made clicking sounds. Yeah, yeah, I get it. We have to cross, Kentris said. The pair walked along an old footpath set with broken stones. Her companion suddenly halted as a pair of Praetorians appeared on the path ahead. I hope you can swim. Loud screeches came from the xenomorphs. Handing the spear to the young hunter, Kentris wrapped an arm under Blood Venom's shoulder and pulled her into the water. The current was strong, forcing Kentris to swim on her side to hold the larger and heavier female above the water. Her companion pushed Kentris away and swam on her own. When they reached the bank, the pair climbed out of the water. As they scaled the rocks, a sudden barrage of blue plasma struck a Praetorian in the head on the far bank, exposing a neon yellow brain before it toppled into the water. It's old rhino. Damn, Kentaris muttered. 
with a furious screech, the young queen appeared on the opposite bank. The queen noticed Kenteris and blood venom on the rocks and scrambled into the water, heading after them. The male hunter suddenly appeared and dove into the water to swim after the queen. Blood Venom pulled Kenteris to the top of the boulder, and together they ran to the ship. As they neared the vessel, Kenteris spotted the stone statue of a forty-foot-tall xenomorph queen on the other side of the ship. At least it looked like a statue in the moonlight. The moment the young queen appeared, the statue suddenly moved and let out a threatening roar. The door opened and Blood Venom pushed Kentris inside the vessel, closing it behind them. The interior of the craft was black and sleek, with strange symbols engraved on the walls. Red track lights led the way to the bridge. The hunter sat in a chair in front of a control panel, with a large window that looked over the river. As the ship's engines started to whine, a pale blue shimmer appeared that Kentris assumed was a force field. Blood Venom suddenly slumped forward then fumbled for a black box from beneath her seat. Kentris came to her aid and opened the box to find strange instruments inside. She held it up to the hunter, who chose a syringe and injected a needle into her shoulder, pumping blue fluid into her body. Spotting a green cape on the floor, Kentris ripped it into pieces and tied strips around the female's chest to stanch the flow of blood. When Kentris had finished, Blood Venom held up a ceremonial knife made from obsidian and pointed it at her. We had a deal, Kentris said. The female removed her helmet, revealing four long tusks at the corners of her extensive mouth. She clicked the tusks together. Her beady yellow eyes narrowed as she grabbed Kentris's arm and pressed the knife tip to her chest and growled. Kentris reacted on impulse and ripped open her shirt, exposing three long scars across her chest. Blood venom held her gaze then made swift cuts directly above the scars. Wincing in pain and bleeding, Kentris looked down to find the same symbol from the hunter's face shield cut into her flesh. This is a mark of honor? Kentris asked. Like you, I am female. The hunter cocked her head. Do you understand me? We need to go, before old Rhino arrives to battle the queens. This is all about territory and who's in control. Old Rhino came here to kill the ancient queen and the young queen who replaced her, and were in the way. Why aren't we leaving? The hunter opened a side panel in front of her. First, she removed a large metal box and flipped it open, revealing an assortment of curious instruments. There were several glass vials with different colored liquids in a holder. Glancing at Kentris, the hunter narrowed her eyes and then selected a vial with a yellow serum. The vial was placed it into an applicator. The hunter held Kentris's gaze and held out the applicator, growling softly. Kentris realized it must be some sort of medicine. I've been poisoned. I don't know with what, but this will cure me. A soft growl came from blood venom, which Kentris took as an affirmative response. She put her trust in the female hunter and administered the serum. It hit her like a dozen consumed energy drinks. Her vision cleared. The muscle cramps and nausea ended. Whatever that was did the trick. I feel stronger. Thanks. Blood Venom growled as she again dug inside the panel. She removed two curious-looking jackets with ribbed armor around the middle, pauldrons, and a skirt of scaled armor. 
There was urgency in Blood Venom's movements as she dressed in the armor and put on her helmet. Kentris dressed, surprised the armor fit, but it was heavy. Blood Venom put on wrist gauntlets, but attached a shoulder laser to Kentris's pauldron. Both strapped on gun belts, which came with pistols, but Kentris took back her old spear. You want us to go back out there and fight? Kentris asked. From outside the vessel came two powerful screeches. A heavy weight slammed into the side of the spaceship, making the force field spark and short out. The old queen came into view. Her ancient body appeared pale silver. In her jaws hung the broken body of old rhino. With a whip of her head, she tossed aside his body. Honor, the hunter said in perfect mimicry of Kentris. You take the old girl. I'll fight the smaller queen. Then we leave. Blood Venom ran down the corridor, stopping at the door, and waited for Kentris to join her. The door opened with a whoosh. Kentris jumped out first. The young queen moved into view, more interested in battling the old queen for dominance than Kentris, and rushed at her opponent. As the creatures slammed together, the old queen's tail struck the multi-ton ship, spinning it like a toy, with blood venom still inside. Kentris ducked as a blast of heat came from exposed thrusters. She lay flat to avoid the flames, and from her prone position, watched the new queen jump onto the old queen's back. Age had hardened her body armor. In another thousand years, Kentris imagined the ancient bitch would become petrified. Slower than the young queen, who used both sets of jaws, her armor was tough and sustained no damage. The old queen retaliated, using her head like a ram to slam the smaller female to the rock. On impact, the boulder split in half, and the hunter's ship started to slide toward the river in a thunderous rock slide. The engines shut down as the ship struck the water with a massive splash and floated toward the waterfall. The section of boulder that held the two queens and Kentris remained solid, and she watched as the Ancient One placed a heavy foot on the back of the younger queen and pressed down. Her immense weight crushed the young rival flat, ending any chance of the survival of her own species. The old queen climbed over her dead opponent, took one look at Kentris, and screeched. Its bent legs were twice the length of its body and each footfall created cracks in the rock. As it approached, Kentris heaved the spear at the giant and watched it bounce off. She drew the pistol and fired at the old queen's kneecap, hoping to maim it, but the projected blue plasma rolled off its pale silver body. The automatic response of the shoulder cannon dispersed fiery rounds at the xenomorph, also with no effect. Its dragon-sized tail pummeled the rock in front of Kentris, causing her to fall between the two halves of the boulder. There was enough room between the rocks to make her way toward the river. The massive beast loomed overhead, eager to get to her, and moved ahead, vanishing from sight. Kentris put away the pistol and tried to climb to the top of a boulder. The armor protected her from the jagged rocks, but hindered her movement. She took it off, but kept the pistol, firing at the creature before sliding down the side of the boulder. Panting hard, she lacerated her hands in her haste. Small rocks rained on her as the old queen appeared above her, stomping her foot to break apart large chunks of stone. Kentris lost her footing and slid off the rock, dropping ten feet and slamming into another boulder, losing the pistol in the process. With a nasty hiss, the old queen looked down at her. 
Kentra stood, winded, and felt a twinge in her ankle. As she limped toward the riverbank, she heard a loud commotion. The ancient queen had dropped down to land at the river's edge and now waited for her arrival. Let's see if you can swim, old girl. Kentris dove into the water and submerged. The current was fierce, pushing her toward the waterfall. Able to hear a thunderous roar, a sudden burst of flames from the ship's thrusters sent her to the surface. She saw the spaceship go over the falls, then noticed the massive queen wading through the river, coming after her, eager for the kill. The old queen suddenly halted, wrenching at her tail, caught by something beneath the surface. Still carried toward the waterfall, Kentris told herself blood venom hadn't left her. Not only had she saved the hunter's life, but blood and honor were involved. That's what the ceremony on the spaceship had meant. Honor meant something to both Kentris and the female hunter. Blood Venom had made a deal with her. Kentris wanted to believe the spaceship waited beyond the waterfall and her companion would help her get off the planet. She thought of Duran and fumed with rage. If she saw Duran again, no. When she saw him, she'd make him pay for his treachery. Glancing back at the old queen, Kentris saw its colossal frame move toward her and noticed the xenomorphs had gathered at the side of the river. Yet, the drones did not give pursuit, and Kentris swam toward the waterfall, hoping to find the ship waiting for her. A misstep into a hole sent the xenomorph sinking into the river, vanishing from sight. Any feeling of victory was short-lived. Drones appeared on the far riverbank, watching Kentris float toward the falls, but made no move to stop her. The current spun her around. Still no queen in sight, she floundered in the water, coming to the edge, and went over the side. Plummeting downward, deafened by the thunderous roar of the churning water, Kentris suddenly slammed onto a hard surface. It had to be Blood Venom's ship beneath her, for she felt the surface rise upward. The flow of water pushed her forward as the ship rose and she noticed an opening hatch. When she got close enough, Kentris grasped the side of the door, holding tight. Something heavy slammed onto the ship behind her. The nose rose upward. Kentris hauled her body through the hatch. She caught hold of a ladder able to see outside as the ancient queen slid to the side of the ship as it continued to rise beneath the waterfall. Kentris ducked as the hatch closed, showering her with water. She clung to the ladder as the vessel turned sideways, able to feel a heavy weight shifting on the roof, and then a loud commotion as the old queen toppled over the side. The spaceship, freed of the queen's heavy weight, shot upward as Kentris pressed against the ladder and then leveled out. She climbed down the ladder and wiped a hand across her face. Feeling bruised and sore, she headed to the bridge, unsure what to expect. Blood Venom faced forward, piloting the ship away from the planet and into a wide expanse of inky blackness. The queen is dead, Kentra said. Aware her hands bled from minor cuts, without hesitation, she made three marks on Blood Venom's helmet. Long live the queens. That means you and me. She plopped down in the co-pilot's chair and buckled up. Just drop me off at Ganymede Space Station. Earth would be fine, too. For that matter, any planet colonized by humans. She gazed at the hunter. I mean, I can trust you, right? We are blood sisters, after all. Blood Venom's response was a deep chuckle. Unclear if it was a bad sign 
but a passenger nonetheless, Kentris finally admitted she might never see Earth again. Her fate was one big cosmic joke, and the only thing left to do was laugh with her companion and hope for the best. Story 7 Carbon Rights By Jess Landry From across a darkened hall, they pace, ready for the sirens to go off, their nightly signal, for their cage doors to open so they can go out and play. They can sense one another from where they stand their smells, their patterns, their growing fury. They've been waiting for the moment when the doors open and they're standing face to face. Just the two of them, enemies since the dawn of time, enemies with a score to settle. But until then, all they can do is wait. Wait for the sirens to go off. Wait for the fight to begin. Another perfect day in Morden, Blake thought as she rode her bike down the quiet manicured streets of her small town, passing by all the cookie-cutter houses with their lush green lawns and white picket fences. She often tried to look for flaws on her daily ride to work peeling paint or a porch chair one inch too far to the left but no matter how hard she looked, nothing was ever out of place. The only things that felt unsuited were the air raid sirens at the end of every street. Their water-stained poles jutted fifteen feet into the air, a circular mass of multiple sirens mounted at the apex, yellowed from sunny days and neglect. Red-budded bushes had been planted at the bases, as if their beauty would somehow detract from the relics of a time when no other technology existed to warn the prairie town of an impending tornado or some other disaster. Blake had never seen a tornado, let alone heard the sirens go off. Nothing new ever happened in Morden, not even a change in the weather. If anything could be relied upon, it was that every day in Morden was the same a cloudless blue sky, sun blazing overhead, the regulars coming to her diner for their daily meals, her bike ride home through the patch of forest that flanked the elementary school. Her evenings spent watching TV or reading a book or going for a jog, with a quick shower before bed. Then wake up and do it all again. Lather, rinse, Repeat. Another perfect day in Morden, Blake sighed as she sped past the school, where shadows of students gathering for class behind curtain-drawn windows moved about. Blake stood behind the counter of the empty diner, marrying ketchup bottles. She eyed the clock as its hands ticked by 9.57 p.m. The last customer had come and gone an hour ago but Blake never felt right closing early she always maintained the hope, no matter how desperate it seemed, that this night would be different. It never was. She had her regular customers who made time go by faster, but she often found herself daydreaming, usually of the renovations she wanted to make to her kitschy 60s-style diner to make it a little more current or just lost in thought looking out the diner's large windows to the red flowers lining the median that divided the street, nestled among the sturdy oak trees. The red brick facades of the town's main street housed everything from Barb's beauty salon to the movie theater. Every building had their own brightly colored awning, and it always made her think of the pictures she'd seen online of other main streets of faraway townstowns that she longed to visit. Towns that looked as though time had forgotten them as well. Blake had never stepped foot outside of Morden, and it was during those endless work hours that she found herself longing for something more than serving the small farming community, spread out over kilometers of prairielands, flat and vast and dull. Something more than canola fields and dairy farms. Blake jumped as the clock struck ten, knocking an empty ketchup bottle off the counter with her elbow. 
Without so much as a glance, she lunged to the side, catching the bottle in her hand, seconds from it shattering on the floor. She sat up and placed it on the counter, sighing. Another perfect day in Morden. Then, the bells over the front door rang out. Blake stood as two men and a woman in matching dark gray jumpsuits walked in. A small round patch adorned the left-hand side of each jumpsuit, two swords meeting at the tip with a red star connecting them, and three smaller stars on either side. They wore packed utility belts around their waists, and the two men each gripped a RAK-9 semi-automatic rifle. Can I help you? Blake said, panic rising inside of her as she focused on the guns. The woman's hardened gaze fell upon Blake. Then she nodded. The taller of the two men moved past Blake, into the kitchen. The shorter man turned his attention to the street, standing watch at the door. What are you doing? Blake asked, though no one paid her any mind. The taller man came out of the kitchen. Clear, he said to the woman. Thank you, Washington, she said, then turned to the shorter man. Hernandez, how are we looking? Quiet as a mouse, he said, a slight tremble in his voice. But. But what? You sure about this, Mariana? Getting in here. Finding her. It was easy. Too easy. The three of them turned toward Blake. Blake backed up against the wall behind the counter. I don't want any trouble, she swallowed. Just take the cash and leave. We don't want your money, Mariana said with a smirk. We want you. It was then that the air raid sirens went off. The whales shattered the quiet night, ebbing and flowing as they let their warnings be heard. Everyone went for their ears, the cacophony rattling through their very cores. Blake eyed the three infiltrators, noticing the same look on each of their faces. It was fear. You said tonight was an off night, Washington screamed over the din. It is an off night. Mariana screamed back. Blake looked to the street, to see if anyone had stepped out to investigate. Maybe she could escape while they were distracted. But the road was bare, with the exception of a flicker on top of a building across the way that caught her eye. A shape. One that seemed to shimmer in the moonlight. It crouched on the edge of the cineplex, set an invisible stone like a camouflaged gargoyle. Watching. Waiting. Back to the school. Mariana shouted, breaking Blake's gaze. Let's go. Washington and Hernandez rushed out the door. Blake stood frozen behind the counter. She turned back to the cineplex. The shape was gone and so was Blake's chance at getting away. The sirens continued their cries as the four of them set off down Main Street, keeping to the shadows, and into the cold, dark forest the quickest way to the school. Hernandez led the way, Washington stayed behind, and Mariana was at Blake's side, each one of them with their weapons drawn, each one of them on edge. Blake walked with nervous poise, unsure of herself for having gone with these armed strangers without so much as a fight. But when her gaze fell upon Mariana with her short black hair and dark, intense eyes, something in her gut said this was right, that these people this woman could be trusted. Still, Blake needed answers. Are you going to tell me what this is all about? she asked just as the sirens cut out. Everyone stopped. They kept their eyes and their guns on the trees.
we're getting you out of here, Mariana said in a whisper. It's not safe. Get down, Hernandez hushed them, going into a squat. The others followed. Hernandez kept his back to Blake, looking up to the tall trees that surrounded them, listening. Blake listened too, but heard nothing. The silence felt heavy in her ears. Okay, Hernandez said as he turned to face everyone. I think we're good. Three red dots in a triangular form suddenly rose from the darkness, stopping on Hernandez's forehead. Blake slowly turned toward where the light came from, tracing it up, past Mariana, past Washington, and high into the trees. In the windless night, a branch swayed and bowed, as though something heavy stood upon it. A shimmer rippled across what looked to be a crouching figure. The same shimmer Blake had seen on the cineplex. Blake turned back to Hernandez with wide eyes. Run, she screamed. A bolt of blue light shot toward them. Blake felt herself being tossed into the air as the woods erupted in fire and chaos. Then, she hit the ground. Hard. A muffled voice floated in and out of Blake's ears as she faced the sky. Hundreds of thousands of stars twinkled above her, like a crystal-covered ocean. But her view was interrupted by a shimmer it rippled over the whole of the sky, past the stars and everything beyond, stretching as far to the horizon as Blake could see. And with a blink, it was gone. Blake tried to summon the air back into her lungs as she saw Washington snap to attention and fire his rifle at where the blast had come from. Get up, she finally heard as the shock wore off. Mariana pulled her off the ground. She spotted Hernandez's mangled corpse as she got to her feet, little chunks of him still aflame, a strange white liquid spilling from in between his charred wounds. Come on. Mariana called to Washington as the three of them scrambled down their original path. But before they could get any farther, something hit the ground, blocking their path, with an earth-shaking thud. It stood from a crouch, its shimmer fading away, revealing the creature underneath. It towered over the group, more than seven feet tall in full-body armor that covered most of its spotted sickly beige skin, hints of a netted fabric underneath, with an embellished breastplate to cover its chest. Long, dreadlock-like tendrils spilled from its helmet, a helmet that was a work of art in itself a set of horns flanked the top part of its sleek, silver head, while the bottom portion came down sharp, a set of spiked teeth, carved into it to make a menacing smile. It reminded Blake of a crown one that the devil might wear. Its eyes were covered by a red material that glistened like fire when the moon hit its surface. Huntress, Mariana whispered in disbelief. The creature took a step toward them, its head cocked in Mariana's direction. Blake moved toward Mariana's handgun before her body realized it, grabbing it from her at the same speed that she had caught the ketchup bottle. Blake opened fire on Huntress in a matter of seconds, striking her exposed areas with a skill that Blake didn't know she possessed. Huntress screeched from under her helmet, taken aback by the unexpected show of force. She lunged for the trees, the shimmer immediately cloaking her body as she disappeared into the brush. Mariana and Washington turned to one another, allowing themselves only a moment to exchange worried glances, before Mariana snatched her gun from Blake's hand and started off once more, leading them out of the woods. The sound of the slamming door echoed down the empty school halls as the three of them piled inside.
Blake pressed her back against the building's cool walls, chilling her overheating body. That thing, that monster. It had come out of nowhere and nearly killed them all with a single blast. Blake was certain it could have finished the job as easily as it had started, but something had caused it to retreat and it wasn't her aim. Blake looked over to Mariana and Washington, who continued their nervous glance. What was that thing? Blake asked. We call her Huntress, Mariana said. She's an apex predator. A monster queen that hunts for sport. How do you know she's a queen? Her mask its intricate details and high craftsmanship show that someone, or something, spent a lot of time making it, Mariana said, as though it were common knowledge. Great, Blake replied with heavy sarcasm. What's she doing here? Good question. Washington turned to Mariana. You said this would be a quick in and out. I know what I said, Mariana spat back. We can argue about it, or we can get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Yeah, Washington replied through his teeth. Hang on, Blake said, asserting her place in the conversation. Twenty minutes ago, I was squirting ketchup into a bottle, and now we're being hunted by some kind of intergalactic warrior queen who gets her kicks by blowing people to smithereens. I need some answers. We're here to get you out, Mariana said as Washington turned his attention to the doors. Out of where? Morden? Mariana nodded though Blake saw a slight hesitance in her eyes. So why don't we jump in a car and drive away? It's not that simple. You can't just leave. Blake looked at Mariana in confusion. You can't just leave echoing inside her. Of course she could. Couldn't she? We don't have time for this, Washington said pulling away from the window and heading toward the corner that led down the long hallway that made up most of the school. I know this is a lot to take in, Mariana said, placing a hand on Blake's shoulder. But I'll explain everything as soon as we get somewhere safe. In the meantime, I need you to trust me. There was something in Mariana's eyes that told Blake she was telling the truth something that told her she could be trusted. Okay, Blake said. They sprinted to a classroom halfway down the long hall, where Mariana and Washington ran to the thermostat on the far wall. Blake eyed the room there was no hint of a way out. It looked like a regular classroom with its whiteboard and wooden desks all in a row. Though, on the floor, she spotted an out-of-place shadow, one that traced a circle in the open space between the teachers and the students' desks. Mariana pulled a keycard from her utility belt and waved it in front of the thermostat. The machine beeped, then disappeared into the wall. A numerical keypad came out in its place. Shit! Mariana muttered to Washington as she punched in a series of numbers that all resulted in the same disagreeing beep. It's not accepting the hacked codes. Try your batch. While the two of them struggled, Blake stepped out into the hall, catching her breath. From the end, they'd just come from the moon pierced through the wall of windows, looking to the football field and the rafters beyond. The other end was covered in an impenetrable darkness, one Blake thought was strange, considering both ends of the school hall were windowed. Then, the siren started once more. It was even louder in the school the noise blared from the overhead speakers. Blake turned to Mariana and Washington, who held their ears, the desperation clearly taking hold of them. 
they screamed at one another over the racket. Mariana slammed her fist against the pad, while Washington raised his gun and shot at it, sending sparks flying. Suddenly, the floor around Blake started to vibrate. Blake held her arms out to steady herself, eyes frantically searching for the source of the shaking. A movement down the darkened hall caught Blake's eye. A small, tube-like section of the floor rose up like an elevator. And when it stopped just clear of the ceiling, so did the sirens. Something crawled from the tube, disappearing into the shadows. The tube retracted back into the floor with a hiss. Everything was still once more, like it had all been a dream. Uh. Guys? Blake said, frozen in the hall. Mariana and Washington rushed to her side. I think there's something dash. But before she could finish, a tail slithered out from the shadows, spiked and with a blade-like appendage on its end. With a quick whip-like motion, it impaled Washington. Washington screamed as it lifted him into the air like a rag doll. He managed to raise his rifle, firing aimlessly into the darkness as Mariana and Blake rushed to pull him free. The tail tossed him about, knocking the women down his weapon from his hands. It was then that Blake noticed his wound the same red and white liquid as Hernandez spilled from it, soaking his uniform. His guts had wriggled free from beneath his skin, pouring out to the floor below. But they looked too thin to be intestines. Too mechanical. They looked like wires. Then, just as quickly as it had happened, the tail whipped back into the gloom, taking Washington and his screams with it. The night fell still once more. Blake and Mariana turned to one another in pure terror. Another friend of yours? Blake asked. The drone, Mariana managed. That's not possible. Both women turned to face the shadows down the hallway as a second hiss echoed out. The creature emerged headfirst its skin was the darkest black Blake had ever seen, its head long and curved, like a semi-truck tire. It had no eyes that she could see, only a mouth that looked detached from the rest of its head, held together by exposed muscles that made it look more like a machine than a living organism. It bared its teeth, silver fangs covered in an endless stream of saliva that poured from its mouth like a busted tap. Blake spotted droplets of its blood dripping down its body from where Washington had managed to wound it, sizzling as it burned clean through the cheap linoleum floor. She looked up to the creature in amazed horror. It opened its mouth wider and Blake thought she saw the hint of something deeper inside it, something that quivered as though readying to release itself. And it likely would have, if the three red dots that had found their way onto Hernandez's head had not flashed on the creature's head now. Blake lunged at Mariana, shoving her into the classroom, just as Huntress fired multiple devastating shots from down the hall. The walls and ceilings collapsed around them, burying them and their screams alive. After what felt like an eternity, Blake pushed the debris off herself, noticing the collapsed wall between their room and the adjacent classroom the window Blake passed by every day on her way to work, that always had the silhouettes of students inside, readying for the day. There were no students now but rather life-size dolls that looked eerily human. One of the dolls had landed near her, white wiring spilling out from its insides. Blake brought a curious hand to its arm, touching its exposed skin. It was warm. Suddenly, Huntress stepped into the collapsed doorway. 
Though Blake couldn't see her eyes, she knew the creature was staring directly at her. A noise from nearby caught Huntress's attention. She spun toward the rubble in the hall just in time to see the uninjured drone attack. It brought its tail around, jabbing her repeatedly and with keen precision. Huntress managed to push the drone off, sending them both back, down the hall. Blake seized her moment and peeled herself off the floor. She spotted Mariana's hand, reaching out from the debris like a zombie clawing out of its grave. As she shoved the ceiling tile and wiring away, Blake saw that a support beam had come down across Mariana's chest. With a strength she didn't know she possessed, Blake bent down and lifted the beam, tossing it off Mariana's broken body. Mariana gasped as the pressure released, filling her lungs back up. She pulled herself from the wreckage, albeit slowly. Where's your way out? Blake asked as wiring sparked around her. Under there, Mariana coughed, looking to where the bulk of the ceiling had collapsed. Now what? Blake asked, beginning to sense a hopelessness in the situation. Before Mariana could answer, the creatures crashed through the remaining wall, bringing more of the school down with them. Blake and Mariana reached for one another, dragging themselves out of the battle path. Blake snagged Washington's rifle from the rubble, slinging it across her back. As they reached the end of the moonlit hall, Blake's curiosity got the better of her she turned and watched. The two creatures were in a tangle, one constantly overthrowing the other. They shrieked into the night, otherworldly cries that triggered something familiar inside Blake. Those screams. She felt like she'd heard them before. The drone dipped behind Huntress, whipping her with its tail, knocking her onto her back. Without hesitating, it jumped onto her chest, pressing its long, taloned feet into her armor. Huntress swung wildly at the drone with her free hand, managing a few blows. But the drone persisted. It leaned into Huntress's helmet, breath fogging her fire-red eyes. Then, it opened its mouth and the smaller appendage finally revealed itself. It jabbed at the helmet fast, like a snake striking its prey, denting the alien metal. It struck again. Crack. And again. Crack. And again. With a final blow, the drone unleashed its most powerful strike yet straight through the eye of Huntress's helmet. In an instant, her body went limp. The drone retracted its appendage, a stream of neon green blood following with it. It stood on top of Huntress for a moment more, waiting, as though she may spring to life. But Huntress remained still. The green ooze began to spill from underneath her helmet and onto the debris-covered floor. Jesus, Blake whispered to herself. But the drone heard. It turned its attention to them and charged. Go! Mariana screamed. As they reached the doors, Blake shoved Mariana outside. What are you doing? Mariana screamed as Blake locked the doors behind her. Get out of here. Blake shouted through the glass, stepping back into the hall, taking Washington's rifle into her hands. The drone drew closer. Come on. Blake mumbled to herself, staring down the barrel, her finger hovering over the trigger. Come on. The drone rounded the corner with such an immense power that it skidded across the floor, crashing into the window-filled wall. Blake took a breath. 
she squeezed the trigger over and over, stepping closer with every shot, every bullet hitting its target. The drone let out a final screech before retreating down the empty corridors, leaving a trail of sizzling muted yellow blood in its wake. Blake bent down, examining the steam that rose from the trail, failing to notice the small drop that had landed on her sleeve. She had never seen anything like it. It's blood. It was acidic. Mariana poked her head through the shattered glass wall, handgun drawn, watching as Blake snapped out of her trance and exited the school. You owe me some answers, Blake said, meeting Mariana's dark eyes. So do you, Mariana replied. Blake and Mariana scrambled through the streets of Morden, guns at the ready, senses heightened. Past the cookie-cutter homes, past the white picket fences, past the families inside, blissfully unaware of the danger that ran free. It was all too much. Blake stopped. Mariana, a ways ahead, felt her partner fall back. She turned to face her. Those things are right behind us. Where are we going? There's another exit up ahead. Blake sighed. You keep talking about exits. Exits from what? Morden isn't a prison. Mariana frowned. Come here, she said, pulling Blake out of the street and alongside a house. Inside, Blake could hear a man laughing. There's a lot you don't know. Not just about Morden, but... Blake studied Mariana, seeing the reluctance in her eyes. This place. Mariana began, finding her words, it's not what it looks like. It's an illusion. A trick played out by a sadistic government military that captures people captures things and makes them their test subjects. Blake processed the information. So, those. Monsters. They were let out on purpose? Mariana nodded. And this military keeps them locked up? Yes, Mariana said, eyeing Blake. Thing is, they're not the only captives in here. It took a moment for Blake to understand what Mariana was telling her. When it finally clicked, a shocked chuckle escaped Blake's lips. No. I'm from Morden. I was born in Morden. I have memories of Morden. Do you? Blake searched her mind. Fleeting memories popped up of watching movies at the Cineplex, of going into the diner as a young girl, of the air raid sirens, always silent and never waking. But nothing more, no matter how hard she tried. You were put here, in this simulation, by the military, so they could test those. Things, Mariana continued, sympathetically so they could see just how deadly they really are. They did the same to me. They made me think that I was at home, that I was safe. Then they put Huntress in with me. I barely made it out alive. That's when I discovered there were other Sims. Other people, like us, trapped inside their own living hells with these creatures. I couldn't let the military continue with this. Torture. So I made it my mission to get people out. I don't believe you, Blake managed through her disbelief. Then look. Mariana guided her to the front of the house and opened the unlocked door. Blake opened her mouth to protest walking into someone's home, but quickly swallowed her words. Four lifeless skin suits, much like the ones at the school, sat posed around a dinner table, 
a pre-recorded sound of conversation playing from a speaker in the ceiling. Every home is filled with discarded skins, all to give you the impression that you aren't alone in here. But you are, Blake. That's not true, Blake spat back. I have customers that come to the diner every day. Those are the workers. They're nothing but metal framework with these skin suits slapped over their CPUs. They have one functionality to do as they're programmed. Programmed? Like robots? Exactly. And once the creatures come in, their command is to retreat into their hiding spots and power down until the simulation begins again. The occasional straggler doesn't make it in time, and the result of that is. Mariana picked up the arm of the skin closest to her and let it flop back down, empty and lifeless. Blake searched her mind for more memories, something to show her that Mariana was crazy, that she was at home, in her prairie town, and that none of this was real. But nothing came. She had no memories left to find. What did they do to me? I'm sorry to be the one to break this to you, Mariana said, leading Blake back to the street. But... Blake managed as they started off once more. Why me? Why am I in here? Mariana hesitated. And what about Hernandez and Washington? We need to focus on getting out, Mariana changed the subject. The military clearly knows I'm here, otherwise they wouldn't have sent two creatures in one night. I don't want to hang around long enough to see if they let in a third. Blake stopped, her gaze falling upon the air raid siren at the end of the street. Was this really all a lie? Mariana reached out for Blake's shoulders. Blake, her strong voice slowly brought Blake back to reality. Stay with me. Are you? Real, was all Blake could ask. Mariana smirked. I've been real for a long, long dash. A sudden whirring sound to cut through the night, and before Mariana could finish her sentence, Dark blood, the color of charcoal, spurted from a fresh gash in her throat. Mariana went wide-eyed and dropped to the asphalt. Blake went down with her, immediately pressing her own hands against the wound. Huntress stood at the far end of the street, a round, discus-like object in her hands. One with six deadly blades sticking out of it. The creature's mask was gone, revealing her true face there was something reptilian about her pale beige skin, something ancient and animalistic. Neon green blood oozed from where her eye had once been, the remaining eye glared at the women with an intensity that made Blake shiver. Her mouth was a tangle of fangs, reminding Blake of an insect's mandibles. More dark blood spurted from Mariana's mouth. Blake felt her own hand slipping away from the wound, unable to keep a firm grip to seal it. That feeling had emerged in her again, but this time, it was an overpowering feeling of hopelessness. Of defeat. In a split second, she'd failed Mariana. Mariana. Who'd come to get her out of whatever the hell Morden was? Who'd come to save her without even knowing her? It took a special kind of person to put their life on the line like that. And now, as Huntress closed in, Blake was ready to do the same. She removed her hands from Mariana's throat and grabbed the rifle. She had nothing left to lose and she wasn't going down without a fight. As Blake stood and raised the weapon, a hiss emerged from her left. The drone crawled out of the fake house, 
slithering its way down the front steps and onto the driveway. The two creatures screamed at one another, staking their claim in the women. Neither relented. They both inched closer, waiting for the right moment to strike. Blake inhaled. Time slowed then. She could sense both creatures, as though she were somehow in tune with them. Her gut directed her to Huntress, telling her she would strike first, getting the creature in her sights. This is it. Blake squeezed the trigger. Now or never. But before she could fire, the air raid sirens went off. Creatures and humans alike looked to the sky. Then, the ground began to tremble. Blake scrambled back over to Mariana, who gasped for air. The drone screeched as the area of driveway that it stood upon started to lower. Blake turned and saw Huntress in the same predicament. Both creatures made an attempt to flee, but a shimmer, similar to that of Huntress's camouflage, quickly encased them in a cage. The creatures had all but disappeared when Blake felt the ground give way around her, trapping her and Mariana in the same shimmer, trapping them in the same cage. As they descended into the darkness, Blake clutched a quiet Mariana, looking to the night sky, at the hundreds of thousands of stars looking back at her. At least the stars make sense. Suddenly, the sky faded away like the dissipating shimmer, revealing the truth behind it. An alien sky took its place, pale green and littered with millions of unfamiliar stars and planets. This wasn't Morden, Blake knew then. This wasn't even Earth. The cage came to a stop. Blake listened. She felt Mariana next to her, cold and unresponsive. She could hear the drone and Huntress both wailing and banging against their cell walls, fighting to break free. The door to her cage slid open, bright light spilling in from beyond, and its shimmer faded away, fully releasing them. Blake reluctantly left Mariana's side, stepping into the room with the rifle gripped tightly in trembling hands. She aimed as she walked, noticing three doors one next to hers, the other two on the far side of the room. Seeing no one, Blake lowered her weapon. Dozens of monitors lit up every which way she looked. High-resolution images played out in real time, live feeds of other towns, of alien worlds, of other trapped people. Some screens flashed only a logo two swords meeting at the tip with a red star connecting them, and three smaller stars on either side. United Systems military flashed on the others. Blake approached them all cautiously, her gaze shooting from screen to screen, desperate to comprehend what was happening before her. To her right, one block showed the interior of some sort of large ship, not a soul in sight. The designation LV-223 remained static at the top of its screens. To the left, exotic trees and a serene river filled the blocks. The name for this section read, C.A. Jungle. She moved her attention to another block the Blake One section. And in those screens, the town of Morden. Her house. Her diner. Her, now, in the control room, looking back at herself in the screen, as though her own eyes were the cameras. No, they were the cameras. Suddenly, the door next to her cage opened. From the darkness beyond, in stepped an ordinary-looking gray-haired man with an electronic clipboard. He regarded her with a smile. I'm glad you're here, Blake, the man said, approaching her. I'm Dr. Collins. 
Blake clenched her fist. What is this place? This is MRB-215, a United Systems military base. This is where we conduct research. What kind of research? He moved within arm's reach of her, looking to the screens. Robotics, he said in admiration. How long have I been here? Collins smiled and turned to her. Your whole life. Blake shook her head. But. She tried searching her memories once more, for something, anything, that could dispute Collins's claims. I remember. But her mind was blank. She looked up to the doctor, her eyes beginning to well. Everything you remember was implanted into you, he said, somehow knowing exactly what she was thinking. To make you believe you're something you're not. And what's that? Human. A loud noise suddenly echoed out. Blake spun toward it. The other two doors opened. The shimmering wall was all that stood between her and what lay beyond. In one cage, the drone. The other, Huntress. Both creatures paced, the drone hissing, Huntress slamming her fists against her cell wall, causing it to vibrate, their aggression targeting Collins. Your friends put up a good fight. Collins motioned to Mariana while jotting notes onto his electronic clipboard. But we've had you all under surveillance since she broke into your simulation. It gave us the perfect opportunity to test those two monsters together. And what a result. So it was all a test. That's right. Every simulation we've put you through, you've come back stronger, smarter, faster. We haven't had to rebuild you like the others. You're the first of a new wave of synthetics. A new generation to eliminate human casualties in war, to venture into parts of the universe we've never dared to go. A new generation to serve. Blake felt herself crumbling under the weight of Collins's words. No. I'm human, she said. I know I am. Check your arm, Collins replied. With an unsteady hand, Blake rolled up her sleeve. The wound, which she hadn't noticed, had blackened around its edges, a crust of red and white forming on her skin. Inside her arm, there was no muscle, no bone. There was only wiring same as she'd seen spilling out of Washington A red and white liquid dripping from them. It was true. She couldn't deny what was buried under her own skin. The drone whipped its tail then. Blake looked over to the trapped creature as Collins jumped. You don't have to worry about them, he said, if only to reassure himself. He punched something into his clipboard, and the doors to the creatures slid shut as they wailed a final cry. Blake heard a metallic clanging then noticed video of them on the screens. Their cells were being moved. You'll see them again, likely in your final simulation. Either South China Sea or DS-949, we haven't decided yet. Simulations? We place a human and a synthetic together in a location from a documented extraterrestrial encounter then let one of the creatures inside. The creatures are familiar with the landscape, but the humans and synths aren't. Our goal here is purely robotic research to create a synthetic that's not only capable of protecting their human counterpart from any type of threat in any type of environment, but also smart enough to think it's an actual human. Blake took an unsteady breath. How many simulations have I done? Collins turned to his chart. Looks like. 
This was your 97th time in Morden. Collins approached Blake, taking her by the arm. Blake pulled away. 97 times? 97. People? That's correct. Did I save them? Collins eyed Blake curiously. Every last one. Where are they? We dispose of every human subject after the tests are completed, he said, growing annoyed. Now, let's get you to processing. What happens there? We wipe you clean, then we ready you for another scenario. Given how well this trial went, we're the closest we've ever been to getting you out in the field. Something clicked inside Blake then, sending a wave of fire through her body. She was nothing more than a puppet, skin over metal created only to answer to someone else's calls, a system made to serve the user. But if she were nothing more than a synthetic, then how could Collins explain how Blake felt riding her bike, that feeling of being carefree? How could she harbor a desire to leave Morden, to go beyond its borders, if she were programmed to stay put and do as she was told? A synthetic couldn't feel those things. She was something else. She knew she was. In a split second, Blake snatched her rifle and pointed it at Collins. Adrenaline coursed through her body she wasn't going down without a fight. Collins chuckled. You can't hurt me. I may not be able to, Blake said, smirking. But she can. Collins spun around just in time to meet the barrel of Mariana's gun. The shot sent an echo through the base. Collins's body slumped to the floor like the discarded synth skins left to rot in Morden. Blake looked Mariana over with a sigh of relief, examining her wound in the light of the room. It had sealed shut, her gray blood the only remnant of what had happened. How did you? Mariana tossed a syringe aside. I have Huntress's kind to thank for that. Mariana stepped over Collins's body and diverted her attention to the screens. She found the keyboard and began punching into the system. On one of the screens, a handful of shimmer-covered jail cells popped up. Blake focused in on a few one housed a creature similar to the drone, another held a creature similar to Huntress, but smaller in size, while others held creatures she had no names for, things that felt familiar when she looked at them. On another screen, in a different section than the monsters, was a handful of synths, trapped in their own shimmering cages, unwittingly and unwillingly waiting for their next simulations. Blake drew in a sharp breath. They were all captives here, monsters and synthetics alike. You've broken free, Mariana said then, noticing the look on Blake's face. She motioned to Blake's open wound. Patch into the system and help them do the same. Blake dug into her arm, almost instinctively, fingers fishing around until they pulled out a cable. Her eyes scanned the control console, stopping on a port. Blake took a breath, then plugged herself in. Accessing system, she said in a voice unfamiliar to her. Files flashed into her field of vision, millions of them, all of varying subjects, all uploading into her system. Centuries of corruption. Centuries of illegal operations. Centuries of torture. They had to be stopped. Commencing system termination. As the files deleted, Mariana's found its way into her view. Blake hesitated, unsure if she should invade Mariana's privacy. She wanted to know more about this woman, who bled gray, 
who fought for the freedom of others, who was willing to sacrifice herself for the greater good. But this wasn't Blake's story to read. It was up to Mariana to tell her, when she felt the time was right. Blake deleted Mariana's file. Then, she moved her attention to the bigger fish. With a simple blink of an eye, Blake terminated all simulations. Mariana watched as the screens around them powered down, as the Sevastopol and jungle screens went blank, as the room fell dark. Only a few screens remained. What do we do about them? Mariana asked in regard to those screens, showing the creatures in their cages. Let me see. Blake scanned her files, learning everything she could about the creatures. They'd been taken from their own worlds, she found. They'd been stolen and used for experimentation. They'd been forced into these simulations against their will, doing what they could to survive. Just like Mariana. Just like her. They're captives here, too, Blake said after a moment, and Mariana understood. Blake went into the cell controls and set a timer on the creature's doors, giving herself, Mariana, and the others enough time to clear the planet. What the monsters did after their doors opened was up to them. Blake then took one final glance at her own screen, at her tired eyes. Would she always be transmitting a signal? Would the military always have her under their watchful eyes? You can disconnect, Mariana said then. You just have to rip it out of you. Blake turned and studied Mariana's dark eyes, a knowing glance passing between them. They were one and the same. With a grin, Blake tore the cable clean out of her arm, disconnecting herself from the server, disconnecting herself from a life of servitude. A small shockwave pulsed through her body, leaving her feeling lighter and more clear-headed than ever before. Blake turned to the open door, from where Collins had entered. Mariana followed her gaze and started toward it. There were others out there, like them. On other bases. On other planets. And they weren't going to stop until every single one of them was free. Free, like her and Mariana. Story 8. First Hunt. By Brian Thomas Schmidt. They landed near the planet's north pole, about five kev knocks from the freighter, and left their craft, continuing on foot. Each kev knock was made up of 100 quan ox, which in turn represented 10 knocks, the base measurement equivalent to three quarters the size of most adult yachts' feet. This gave Bakui a chance to evaluate the first hunter's techniques, as they fanned out into positions as a team to start their hunt. They led and he followed behind, close enough to observe, but far enough to stay clear. His task was to train. Later that night, if they hunted with honor, he would regale them with tales of his past hunts, perhaps even the massacre during which he'd earned his nickname Bloody Spear. As they plodded through the planet's dense foliage toward the downed freighter, the rays from the planet's crimson sun lent a red glow to everything around them. The perfect ambience for a hunt, Bakui thought to himself and smiled. Ahead, he heard the first hunters chittering beneath their bio-helmets as they took in the reddish-tinted terrain around them. Deuce, Kasi. To Asa had the scent. Amedha, Amedha. Concha chanted. Meat, meat. Emd I chak, Zaki added. No mercy. First hunters always voiced confidence and excitement before the hunt. Bakui had had similar conversations many times before. They were practically shaking with anticipation, and his mandibles clicked in amusement beneath his bio-helmet. The hunt will be the true test. For in this hunt, they would earn their place in Yatja society, and perhaps even gain the nicknames they'd carry with them the rest of their lives. Duasa and Kancha were cocky. Only Zaki showed any nervousness. 
Therefore, it was Aki in whom Bakui took the most interest. To us and Kancha called him names like abomination, idiot, or soft. Even loner or self-centered when he stood quietly apart. But Bakui knew this was because Aki was not like them. The trainer had known many mighty hunters who kept to themselves and did not like crowds. Such behavior was no sign of cowardice or dishonor on the battlefield. Cocky warriors had come and gone failed or gone rogue, some even declared bad bloods by the elders. It was the smart ones who were nervous, even afraid. As great a warrior culture as the Yatja were, as strong their reputation, no matter what the warrior's clan of birth, hunting had its dangers, especially when one had come to hunt the ultimate prey. Akui noted no alerts in his bio-helmet for electromagnetic pulses or thermal heat sources on the landscape around them, then checked his wrist bracer for signs of the hard-meat-infested Uman Star Freighter that had crashed there three years before. Five Kev knocks ahead. There and ah, Sintakai. He wished them strength and honor. They strode ahead with laser-like focus proud, determined, and ready. The Seli Souza worked quickly alongside the landing team's medical officer Mathu Piler to prepare the field hospital for their first patient. The call had come moments before, from one of the patrols Captain Rodrigo Bosco sent out to explore their new home. They'd arrived here three days before and begun setting up the pre-drop supplies and habitats. The planet had been carefully chosen as the new Brasilia five years before. Juscelino Kubitschek's and Don Bosco's dream utopia had never quite evolved as planned on Earth, but the Neo-Silesians had a second chance to get it right. It had taken almost a decade to raise the funds and recruit the right settlers. And now the day was finally here. Giselli was as proud as the others at being chosen to join the 15-person advance team. Vanessa's desperate calm call had set them all on edge. Captain Bosco took the call himself. Ten generations removed from the original visionary Don Bosco, he took great pride in his ancestors' claim to fame, and nothing could be allowed to spoil this opportunity to revitalize the concept. Help. Vanessa sounded desperate, her voice breaking. Joe has been attacked. Attacked by whom? The captain demanded. Some sort of spider-like creature, Vanessa explained. It looked so harmless we were joking these could be the new cats of New Brasilia when it leapt through the air and attached itself to his face. Captain Bosco sent another team to help Vanessa, while Lieutenant Adriana Bonfam, the second in command, ran immediately to warn Doc and Giselli, and they'd been scrambling ever since sorting through crates of supplies and vacuum-sealed medical instruments for what Doc would need. Giselli herself had torn the plastic covering off the exam and operating tables, which had been placed at the center of adjoining rooms. The field hospital had been assembled immediately after the prefab habitats and consisted of corrugated steel framework with thick fiberglass siding and an aluminum roof covered over with clay shingles. It was intended to be temporary. Just for a few months, while well, they built a more permanent structure, but though they'd been prepared for emergencies, no one had expected to face one the first week. Nothing like starting with a bang, eh, Giselli? Doc joked. Giselli nodded, but she couldn't enjoy the humor. Dear God, please let Joe be okay. The planet had been designated hunting ground 73,569 a decade before and provided multiple prey for training native wildlife, hard meat and hunts inside an human freighter. Bakui had been here several hundred times to hunt. First, as a novice on his first hunt and now as a leader overseeing the first hunt of three young Yatja. The human star freighter had been overrun by Kayanda Medha, hard meat xenomorphs to humans. A previous hunting party had detected the ship's presence as they arrived and called in ships to investigate. Those ships had scanned her, and finding no signs of life, shot her down to become a designated target. For Bakui, this made 73,569 an ideal training ground, and the first hunters, having heard stories of the humans and hunters' encounters with them through history, were anxious for their own opportunity to face that challenge so the freighter was their first chance to see what they might expect during such encounters. Bakui examined his charges again for the last time as Youngbloods. 
The hunt, if successful, would make them adults. And he truly hoped they were all successful. Tuasa and Concha were larger tall, thick with muscle, their braids adorned with animal skulls and other symbols of their clan, and each had painted the clan symbol on his chest plate. Zaki's armor was shiny as new, and he stood shorter, thinner. He was the one many expected to fail, but after decades as a trainer, Bakui knew better than to make such assumptions. Lack of size often belied true strength and determination, and the hunt was as much a game of mental agility as physical, any good hunter knew. The Yotja honor code was respected and to break it purposefully, accidentally, or even unwillingly was near irredeemable. All hunters were expected to adhere to the code and traditions on the hunt and throughout life. Those who breached the code submitted themselves for punishment honorably. Failure to do so marked them as bad blood, upon which they were excommunicated and considered fair game for the honorable hunters who remained. Bakui had seen very few first hunters fail to respect and honor the code, and he was proud of his history of few bad bloods. Tuasa, Concha, and Zaki would not let him down, of this he was confident. Two of the three came from bloodlines with long histories of famous hunters. Oleg Concha came from a lineage with a stain on its record. For all Yatja, such histories were points of pride. They would not be the ones to tarnish them. His bio-helmet detected human footprints moving about before the first hunters detected it. Ayanda Medha, Concha said, his lower mandibles flaring. Hard meat. His excitement was palpable. Iota Medha, Zaki added, his head cocked to one side in puzzlement. Humans. Asi, Tuasa added, and Concha grunted in agreement. The human footprints were fresh. Certainly more recent than the freighter's crash date, Bakui thought, surprised. Prior scans hadn't turned up any signs of human settlement, nor had any hunters mentioned it in their hunt reports. When had humans been here? Sudden anger flared as Bakui remembered stories of the death of his great-great-grandfather at the hands of humans on Earth decades before. Although some Yatja admired humans, Bakui's family had hated them ever since. The first hunters glanced toward where Bakui was observing, a few knocks away. Bakui acknowledged agreement, and the first hunters turned back toward the freighter, preparing to enter and explore. Deseli heard shouts and glanced through one of the hospital's translucent fiberglass windows, as a transport sped down the encampment's main street and skidded to a stop on the rocky soil, sending pebbles and dust bouncing off the sides of nearby buildings. Moments later, members of her team carried Joe-O inside on a stretcher, with Adriana and Vanessa following behind, the last in tears. The creature affixed to Joe's face had several long finger-like legs and was fleshy pink, but that was its only resemblance to a spider. This animal monstro. Giselli thought was the most alien thing she'd ever seen. Doc motioned and the team members slid Joe off the stretcher onto the exam table, then Bosco ordered them out. Let the doc work. Deseli stood beside the instruments and chemical medicines they'd unpacked, ready to assist as Doc examined Joe his hands probing, feeling, eyes taking in everything with Adriana, Vanessa, and Bosco watching from nearby. He's alive, Doc confirmed, and at last everyone seemed to breathe again. But unconscious. What about that? Thing. Bosco asked. Monstro, Giselli thought again. Doc examined the alien creature, frowning, then put the earpieces of his stethoscope in his ears and held the diaphragm against the creature, moving it a few times. It's just lying there. I can't see or hear that it's doing anything, but who knows what might be going on internally. He pried at a couple of the creature's long spindly legs. They wouldn't budge. It's holding on like a vise. Can we cut it off? Bosco asked. Or burn it off, Adriana suggested. You might kill it, Giselli pointed out. Then it dies, Adriana said with a cold scowl. Whatever it takes to protect and save Joe, Bosco said, shooting Giselli a reassuring look. Doc looked at Giselli. Get the laser, and she hurried off to comply. Bakui watched from a distance as the first hunters moved in formation through the freighter's rooms and corridors, stopping to examine the remains of hard meat eggs, long burst open, 
and the corpses of the ship's crew and a few local animals, who'd been dragged there no doubt by drones. The ship was eerily quiet the only life signs on his indicators, those of the youngbloods. Most of the freighter was intact with a few charred holes in the hull from Yatja plasmacasters and larger holes of jagged torn metal in the wall behind the cockpit and main airlock damage probably done by hard meat, though some of it may have happened during the crash. The walls were dark, the spaces filled with shadows and the scent of decay. As they explored, the young bloods commented on how far behind their own technology the humans were for a spacefaring species. The scent of humans faded the farther in they went. So humans had found the ship, but not explored it in depth. There were no signs of any living hard meat or anything else, so the first hunters quickly finished and retreated outside. The hard meat had clearly set up a nest elsewhere, perhaps hidden and better protected. Bakui knew where it had been on his last trip, though hard meat tended to move it after Yatja attacks. Part of the challenge was for first hunters to track and find the ultimate prey themselves, starting from the wrecked freighter. Sometimes first hunters caught traces of their targets before they ever made it to the freighter. Other times, they stalked them. Wherever the hard meat were hiding, they'd find them eventually, and probably the nest. Now the hunt began in earnest. The first hunters fanned out into the forest, tracking their prey, and Bakui followed, observing. Who would be the one to get first kill? All too often the trainer could predict the answer, but sometimes there were surprises. With this group Bakui's money was on Zaki, so he followed in the shorter hunter's wake, waiting, paying close attention to his bio-helmet's indicators. Stop. You're hurting him, Giselli cried. Doc began cutting at the creature on Joe's face with a laser. The flesh was hard enough that it took a moment for the laser to break through, but then the creature squealed and tightened its tail around Joe's neck as a dull yellow liquid its blood. Giselli wondered sizzled out and burned Joe's skin. Stop. Giselli said again and Doc froze, the blood flow stopping as they assessed the situation. Doc immediately grabbed some surgical cloths and wiped off as much of fluid as he could, throwing it to the side, where the cloth sizzled as it dissolved. What kind of blood is that? Adriana wondered. It's acid, Doc said, frowning. He stepped away as if to set the laser down, then reconsidered. Hang on. He looked Giselli. Get me some of those pads the instruments were packed in, and one of those vacuum tubes for the instruments. Deceli frowned and glanced over to where they'd set the packing materials. The tubes were around 7 cm in diameter and 15 cm long. She picked one up. These. Doc nodded and extended a hand. Those are Teflon. Highly acid resistant. Deceli handed him the tube and he removed the ends, then placed it over the black of the alien creature and held out his hand again. Pads. Giselli handed him several pads, which had been used to pack around sensitive instruments, wondering how they would defend against acid. Doc overlapped the pads around the end of the tube closest to the creature, then aimed the laser straight down into the tube and began cutting again. The creature screamed and then writhed, and as the pad soaked up the leaking fluid, Doc pushed the Teflon down into the opening to seal it from acid leakage. Giselli was impressed. Apparently the pads were acid-resistant, too. The creature writhed and broke free of Joe's face, leaping off the table and scurrying away. Find that thing and kill it. Bosco shouted to the team members waiting outside, as Doc turned back to examining Joe. That was genius, Doc, Bosco said. Not their intended purpose, but it worked, Doc replied. Just give me a few moments to examine him. Duasa found the first hard meat in a clearing west of the downed freighter. Bakui's biomask's electrovision lit up with contact simultaneously with Tuasa's war cry, piercing the air as he took up chase, and the hunt was on. Concha, Zaki, and Bakui followed. Leaves and brush rustled and branches cracked as the drone plowed forward, Tuasa and the others close in its wake. Then, from the right, came the sound of feet scrambling on loose stone, and a familiar screech as another drone appeared, Zaki peeling off to give chase. A few knocks farther and Concha was off after another. Soon, Bakui saw electromagnetic alerts of several more drones moving quickly through the forest around them. 
Suddenly, he realized the hard meat were all heading in the same direction. What were they hunting? Then he heard a loud squealing that brought hissing from all the drones his hunters were chasing, and as they burst through a copse of foliage and trees, the biohelmet's indicators lit up with more contacts. Humans. Named Lee. Bakui shouted the command, and all four Yotja activated the shift suits that concealed them from humans, as they raced into a clearing. Six armed humans had circled a larval hard meat near some primitive structures in a makeshift village, and were firing away at it with laser weapons, as it scrambled to escape. So, there were humans living here. The drones all swarmed toward the humans, the hunters giving chase, and all hell broke loose as the various groups converged. The Selly heard shouting and plasma fire outside, then a few explosions followed by screams. My god! What in the world was happening? She rushed to the hospital's windows and looked out to see several insect-like creatures converging on the men who'd been hunting the creature Doc had removed from Joe's face. Her team members turned from firing on the creature as the aliens all attacked, using teeth and claws. Then the air around them lit up with lasers bursts that seemed to come out of nowhere, from all around. Sourceless red triangular targeting beams panned the area around them, as her team members returned fire and sought shelter. Moments later, Adriana and Timoteo, one of the pilots, raced inside, shutting the door behind them. Who are they? Giselli asked. They're like something out of nightmares, Timoteo said. They came from the forest and attacked us. Adriana added. Why? Giselli wondered. Perhaps that creature who attacked Joe is their pet, Adriana said. The Giselli, it sounded as good an explanation as any. But who's doing the shooting? Timoteo wondered. Outside, the insectoid aliens had turned to defend themselves against the laser fire, and the air shimmered. For a moment, Giselli almost thought she saw men moving about out there. They're fighting each other, Timoteo observed. Did you see forms just now? Giselli noted. What forms? Adriana shot her a puzzled look. Be ready and stay under cover, she ordered as they all continued to watch through the small windows. As the humans scattered, firing at the hard meat attacking them and seeking shelter, the first hunters looked momentarily puzzled, lower mandibles flaring in aggression. Follow your prey. Honor. No mercy. Bakui ordered. Hunt humans after. So the three first hunters focused on the drones, ignoring the fleeing humans. The drones screeched and hissed, two slamming into structures in a vain attempt to get at the humans, while the rest turned back to face their Yotja assailants. They'd come to hunt hard meat. But humans were legally approved prey under certain circumstances, and whatever the circumstances that had brought them, 73,569 was a hunting ground. There were two highly desirable prey here now, and unless they were children, pregnant or ill, humans were fair game and would be hunted. For now, the drones were running away, however, and the first hunters were running full bore after them, with Bakui following. Did you see that? Who are they? Timoteo wondered as they stared out the window in awe. A dangerous problem, Giselli muttered to herself. We need to talk to the captain, Adriana said and got on the radio. Jesus Christo. Mudeus. This is like a bad dream, Timoteo muttered. A bad fucking dream. Calm down. It'll be okay, Giselli said, putting a hand on Timoteo's arm. The radio crackled as Captain Bosco acknowledged Adriana's call. How many are with you? Timoteo, Giselli, and Joe, Adriana reported. Let's evac everyone to the admin unit, Bosco replied. What about Joe? Adrian asked, then looked at Giselli. Can we move him? Giselli shook her head. I'm not sure. Doc needs to come look at him first, Adriana reported into the radio. Okay, Bosco replied. I'm sending Doc with two Marines for security. Doc will clear him, and then I want all of you over here. We're setting up a perimeter. Copy, Adriana said. Like our shit is any good against those things. Timoteo whined. In one motion, Adriana set down the radio, whirled, and slapped Timoteo across the face. You're supposed to be a soldier. Get it together. We need you on lookout. 
Dimiteo rubbed his jaw where he'd been struck, his face stunned, then he nodded. Yes, Lieutenant. Adriana grabbed the pulse rifle he'd left leaning against the wall and shoved it into his hands, then pushed him toward the door. Doc and two Marines are coming. Nothing else comes in or out. Dimiteo nodded, his eyes still brimming with fear, but took up a guard position as ordered beside the door, as Adriana went back to the radio and started issuing orders. Akui followed the three youngbloods as they crashed through the forest in singular pursuit of the prey on their heat vision, red beams piercing the foliage in search of targets as they ran, plasmacasters and spear-like combi sticks at the ready. Then blue bursts shot out and foliage exploded, followed by screeching from drones as one by one, in rapid succession, the three first hunters each scored their first hits upon their targets. Hard meat. No mercy. Tuasa and Concha chanted over their comms as they burst through burnt brush and over rocks, across thirty knocks, closing in on their wounded prey. Only Zaki moved silently, with deadly focus and utter stealth, and as such, his victim didn't even hear him coming until he was almost upon it, and piercing its back with his combi stick, simultaneously firing two more bursts from his plasmacaster at zero range. Flesh sizzled and burned as the hard meat screamed and dull yellow liquid spewed from its wounds, sizzling and smoking everywhere it landed. Seconds later, Zaki stood triumphantly over his mortally wounded target, a combi stick embedded in its black flesh as the lifeblood drained from its body. The attack had been glorious well planned and well executed at every step, like a true champion. To Asa's and Concha's own first kills, when they came, paled by comparison appearing far more as luck and brute force, than artful execution to the experienced eyes of their leader. And so Bakui silently declared Zaki the true winner of the hunt, even as each quickly cut trophies from their fallen prey, then raced off into the forest again after new targets with focused determination. Once again, Bakui's first hunters fanned out across the forest, while their teacher tracked them as best he could using his wrist bracer, electrovision and thermal vision, accompanied by his senses and experience. The drone sped in a circle, headed back toward the human settlement now, and Bakui assumed a clash was inevitable. So far, the humans hadn't shown any aggression, and his hunters had stayed focused on their designated prey. But if the humans showed any weapons or got in the way, he knew his first hunters wouldn't hesitate to hunt them as well, and neither would their teacher. His family's long history of hatred toward humans assured that. But still, they had targets they'd come to specifically hunt, and Bakui didn't mind seeing how his charges handled them before they got distracted by any other targets of opportunity. His electromagnetic and heat vision lit up as red tracker beams cut through the forest, and plasmacasters boomed ahead, sending out more blue plasma bursts followed by explosions, and he caught the scent of burning flesh and foliage. Hard meat round two. Underneath his bio-helmet, his lower mandibles trembled with anticipation as he doggedly followed his hunters. Doc arrived with his armed escort and immediately returned to examining Joao with Giselli hovering nearby at the ready. Adriana issued orders as she, the two marines, and Timoteo took up armed positions in all four corners, facing the exits, eyes scanning outside through the dingy translucent fiberglass windows. Do you see anything? Timoteo asked, eyes darting around the view out the window. He was like a nervous six-year-old, a fact which didn't give Giselli much confidence in him as a sentinel. Adriana shook her head. No, it's quiet for the moment. But they could come back. We need to be ready. I think we can say the survey ship screwed up in declaring this planet safe and ready, Doc replied. The organization's got too much invested for such snap judgments, Adriana answered with a glare. We don't know for sure yet. Doc scoffed and pointed to Joe. I'm sure Joe would agree with you. He rolled his eyes, stressed like the others, and no longer his usual jovial self. Just do your job and let me do mine, Adriana snapped. The safety of our families is all of our jobs, Giselli said, not allowing Adriana to intimidate her in the least. Adriana whirled and glared so hard, Giselli could imagine smoke coming from her nostrils as she launched across the room at lightning speed. Don't ever accuse me of not caring about the safety of our people. 
it's the center of everything we do. The Selly backed away, shocked. Crazy, she thought. I was not. No one's accusing anyone, Doc said as he stepped between them. She was just reminding you we all share that commitment. There are monsters attacking and invisible attackers fighting them. Adriana glared a moment longer then breathed deeply, nodded curtly, and returned to her sentinel duty by the door. She'd always had a hard edge to her, but Giselli had never seen her snap like that. Clearly the stress was getting to her as much as everyone else, despite the calm sense of command she projected. Giselli turned to Doc. How is he? About the same, Doc said. Vitals holding stable. In a sleep state or coma. We'll just keep monitoring and hope for the best. Giselli nodded and reached out to gently caress the spot where the spider-like creature's legs had left acid burns on Joe's cheek. Once again the first hunters followed the racing drones onto the makeshift street through the human settlement, only this time no humans were in sight. The drones sought targets, throwing themselves hard into any openings or weak points in the makeshift structures, as they wove their way through the settlement, hunters literally hot on their tails. Bakui saw more drones swarming the settlement at least fifteen drawn there by the chance to incubate and the attack on their own. Red beams lit targets with a familiar three-dot triangle. Blue bursts fired from plasma casters. Loud screeches or squeals emitted from those drones who were hit, and several turned, hissing, and zeroed in on their attackers to launch counterattacks. Not for the first time, Bakui wished the shift suits worked as well against hard meat as they did with humans. Duasa and Concha, as usual, were sloppy and cocky firing haphazardly and too quickly, causing damage to structures, the ground, foliage, and twice almost to each other while Zaki's attacks were launched with patience and focus, awaiting just the right moment, a surety of aim. As a result, his weapon struck home with far more accuracy, and within a few minutes he'd racked up three kills to the other's one. Time and again, the creatures slammed into the walls and doors of the field hospital, causing rattling of metal instruments and the structure's parts, and accompanied by loud thumps, and often the creature's own screeches. Outside, Giselli heard blasts from plasma guns and explosions, then more otherworldly screeches and screams as two groups of aliens attacked each other. They're killing each other, Timoteo cheered, sounding hopeful for the first time since the first attack. Some of them are, Adriana agreed, but pointed. The others are trying to get at us. Again, thumps and screeches were followed by rattling as creatures attacked the hospital's walls. Can the walls hold up? Giselli wondered and fear returned to Timoteo's face. They're strong enough to withstand a lot, Doc said, not sounding very confident. Giselli silently prayed for Jesus's mercy. Piedaid, Jesus, she whispered again and again. Adriana nodded. They can't withstand this forever. At that moment, one of the locked doors the two marines were guarding bent inward with a thump and a screech, as the lock managed to hold, but took a real beating. A few more hits like that and they may fail, Adriana noted. Doc motioned. Move some of those boxes and tables over to brace the doors. What if we need to escape? Giselli asked. If they get in here, we'll run through the hole, Adriana replied, and the men hurried to bolster the doors, while Adriana got on the radio and reported to Captain Bosco. The smart disc whooshed through the air, its sensors locked on prey as Concha scored another hit, then stabbed with his combi stick and fired his plasma caster. Another kill. Two knocks away, Tuasa retrieved his own smart disc and combi stick as dull yellow blood pooled on the ground around his own second kill. From a nearby structure there was a crackle of static, and then human voices projecting over some kind of calm. Quanto tempo es as parades resistem? A woman asked. Them carries or para que agentem tempo sufficiente, a man responded. Bakui could not understand human speech, but his universal translator lit up with one of the markers he'd saved in his memory. Portuguese. The same language spoken by the humans in the strangely named human city, Rio something, whose defeat of his ancestor had brought disgrace to his family. A mighty hunter had been led away in chains, declared a bad blood by his own that day, and the scandal had forever marked Bakui's family. 
Translations filled his bio-helmet's inner screen. The humans were discussing strategy the woman questioning, the man giving orders. Around him, the drone sensed the static and heard the voices, zeroing in on the source of the noise and closing to attack the nearest structure with renewed frenzy. Foolish humans, Bakui thought. Stupid to use open comms in the midst of a hunt. Such prey deserved to be hunted. They lacked the cunning and wisdom of more worthy prey. A final desperate screech echoed across the street as Aki bent to cut trophies from two more prey and attached them to his combi stick in triumph, and Bakui turned his focus back to the hunt. Looking back, Giselli could remember exactly the moment that sealed Timoteo's fate. It happened when the alien's hits on the hospital's outer walls went from spaced-out thumps to staccato hits, over and over, almost like hail, and as she strained to see out the window, Doc called out, there's more and more of them coming from all around now. What do they want with us? Timoteo said, his voice and body shaking with tension. To Giselli, he seemed to be becoming more and more unglued by the minute. I think they're mad we hurt their pet, Giselli suggested, motioning to where Joe lay prone on the operating table. It attacked Joe. Timoteo seemed on the verge of hysterical. What were we supposed to do? They're animals, Doc said. They don't think like us. Calm down and stay at your post, Adriana ordered. Giselli glimpsed the panic in Timoteo's eyes as he slowly turned back to the window. He wasn't going to last much longer, of that she was sure. Something had to happen soon. For every drone the first hunters took out, three more appeared from the forest to take their place, and soon all four Yotja were fighting, even Bakui. Half the drones charged at anything that moved, while the rest continued throwing themselves against the two structures, which had shown signs of human life. Soon, the loud banging of the hard meat against the structures became a steady rhythm, and Bakui began wondering how long the walls could hold against such a barrage. Duasa cried out as a drone spike drew blood from his arm and spun, lashing out ruthlessly with his wrist blades, as the drone scream matched his own. Zaki methodically picked off two more kills, and Concha pounded a drone with his combi stick, raising it above his head before each strike with great bravado and showmanship, making Bakui wonder if the appearance of skill had mattered more to his trainers than actual ability. Still, his strikes wounded his prey, and he continued pounding away, doing real damage. We have to do something. Timoteo said again, his eyes wide with desperation as the clamor from the attacking creature's repeated strikes against the walls reached a new pitch. We stay put. Adriana ordered. They're going to kill us all. It'll hold, brother, Doc said calmly, his eyes trying to lock on Timoteo's with encouragement, even as the panicked man's hands clenched around the plasma pistol in his hand. There were more thumps and screeches followed by the sound of metal tearing and Timoteo suddenly ripped open a window, sticking his weapon arm through, and firing awkwardly toward where the creatures were attacking the building, as Adriana shouted, Alto! Neuu! Adriana and Doc both screamed, but then Timoteo screamed in agony as something grabbed his arm and wrenched, twisting and pulling him through the window by force, and out into the planet's arid air. Mudeus! Giselli whimpered. Locks clicked as the two marines yanked open their own door and raced outside, firing bursts from their pulse rifles, in a vain attempt to rescue their colleague. No. Shut that. You heard the captain. Get back here. Adriana ordered, but the two men's screams joined the chorus, and Doc slammed the door shut, securing the locks again behind them, as his eyes met hers. It's too late, he said, shaking his head. Murda. 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 Adriana cursed as the radio lit up. What's happening? Bosco demanded. Who's screaming? Adriana keyed the radio and filled him in as Doc took up position by the doors the Marines had abandoned. Bakui couldn't believe his eyes when the human extended his weapon arm through the structure's window and fired at the aliens crashing into its sides. It took only moments for several drones to zero in and grab him with their claws, yanking him through the opening, despite the fact it was too small for his form. The weapon slipped from the human's fingers as he screamed. And then the drones set about tearing him apart, limb by limb, 
their teeth and claws cutting through his flesh with razor sharpness. He heard the human's alarm shouting from within the structure, probably calling for him to come back or warning the rest to seal up the window, then two other humans launched themselves out one of the doors and fired at the drones. More drones peeled off and tore them to pieces in the same fashion they had their companion, as the first hunters continued picking off targets one at a time. Then there was a loud screeching from the drones and their target alike, as one structure's metal sides ripped open, and the drones continued pounding it with their heads and bodies, forcing the opening in the side wider and wider, until one of them slipped through, then others followed. Human screams, explosions, and plasma fire joined the screeches then as more drones slipped through while others tore at the opening, ever widening its edges. At the far end of the structure under attack one across the street from where the three humans died two males and a female appeared. The males fired haphazardly with laser weapons, while the female screamed and ran about chaotically, as if she just wanted to escape and didn't know what to do. Drones singled in on the new targets, racing toward them. And when the human's plasma fire struck a tree behind Concha, he and Tuasa began firing at the humans as well, assuming they were being attacked. Red targeting beams lit up the ground around the humans with familiar triangle pyramids, as plasma casters focused in, and Concha's smart disc flew through the air, striking the screaming girl just below her head to silence her screams. Her body fell in a heap, blood pouring from the wound as her head ricocheted away in the opposite direction, and rolled across the debris-strewn ground to land at Tuasa's feet. He chattered, swinging his combi stick with one hand as he leaned over to the side and scooped it up with the other, tossing it to Concha as a trophy. The other humans reacted with horror and anger, firing more directly at the two first hunters, and Tuasa screamed as he was struck in the arm by plasma fire. Moments later, the two humans fell under a combined barrage of fire from Concha's and Tuasa's plasma casters and attacking drones, their bodies then ripped apart by the hard meat. Deceli was in shock Vanessa decapitated right there in the street, Timoteo and four marines torn apart. Screams echoed across the street from the administration building as she, Adriana, and Doc watched with horror. The alien insect creatures had poured through the wall and done God knew what to the rest of their team. Adriana keyed the radio over and over, hailing the captain, but getting only static as a reply, and Giselli knew right away she'd never get one. Of the original advance team of fifteen, only four of them, including Joe, remained. Then she glanced out the window and thought she saw the alien insect creatures dragging bodies from the building. They were dead they had to be. But they weren't torn apart like the others. What are the creatures going to do with them? She wondered. Hard meat poured from every opening of the human structure, some dragging human bodies of the unconscious or dead. Based on his knowledge of the ultimate prey, Bakui assumed these were still living specimens knocked unconscious and headed for a fate much worse than the terrible deaths of their brethren. These poor humans would become the hard meat's living incubators, and he made a mental note to search for and eliminate them before the hunting party headed home. About half the hard meat disappeared with the bodies, while the rest split their attention between the structure where the other humans were hiding and fighting off the hunters. One by one Concha, Tuasa, and Zaki picked off the hard meat until the settlement was quiet, but Bakui knew it would not be for long. The humans stayed hidden inside their shelter, but then Concha gave a loud cry. No mercy. And he fired his plasma caster at the doors of the structure, clearly intending to go inside after the humans. As he motioned to his companions and threw open the door, six hard meat drones and a Praetorian royal guard swarmed from the forest. The royal guard hissed and flicked her long spike tail, spearing Concha in the leg and spitting acid. As Tuasa turned to face the new attack, Acid struck his bio-helmet and he screamed, then Concha struck out in rage, his back arched, swinging his combi stick while firing wildly with his plasma caster. Zaki and Bakui fired focused plasma bursts at the royal guard, causing her to retreat defensively, but not before Tuasa ripped the melting bio-helmet mask from his face, giving her the chance to spit more acid right on his fleshy face. Again, 
to Asa cried out, falling to his knees, and the guard's bladed tail struck out and severed the downed Yotja's arm. Then Zaki's smart disc boomeranged across the street and severed her hand, causing her to roar in pain. Bakui's smart disc followed, but in shuffling back from Zaki's attack, she shifted her posture and position, and Bakui's only managed to shave the top of her large head crest, before arcing back to his waiting hand. She screamed again at the indignity, and the screeches of her drones joined her. As Tuasa screamed once more, Kancha lost his bravado and turned, joining Zaki's and Bakui's constant barrage. Three drones fell, and the royal guard and the remaining drones retreated back into the forest, hissing and screeching as they went. It was a regrouping, Bakui was sure. They would return in force, and his hunters should move on to avoid confronting the Mon Moss. With an angry shout, Kancha charged into the human structure, combi stick raised high. Bakui pointed to the fallen Tuasa and ordered Zaki, get him back to the ship. Then he raced inside after his rogue charge. As he arrived, Kancha was standing over a slain human female and stabbing an human male with his combi stick, as another human female trembled beside a table containing the body of another human male. Bakui scanned them with his biomask and determined the human male was incubating a hard meat chestburster. He would have to be destroyed. Then Kancha snarled in rage and turned on the human female, who was unarmed and trembling. Now, poor favor. Now, poor favor. She seemed to plead, backing away from the invisible form towering over her. In that moment, Bakui thought of the reckless actions Kancha had taken in the last few minutes' rash decisions, rushing into action, not protecting his flank and the resulting maiming of his friend and fellow hunter. The human female was clearly afraid and no threat. No killing. Bakui shouted and pushed with his hands at Kancha's shoulder. It would stop here. The hunt was over for now, and they must return to the ship and reassess. Kancha raised his combi stick and rage screamed again, but Bakui blocked it with his own, shaking his head. No killing. He repeated and uncloaked to make the point. Kabj T. He spat, accusing Kancha with his eyes, and the student relented, lowering his combi stick. Bakui pointed. Go. Now. An order a first hunter dare not disobey from his teacher and judge on a hunt, so reluctantly, Kancha's shoulders sagged as he whirled toward the door. Bakui turned to the wide-eyed human female, staring at them with total shock and disbelief. Then Kancha decloaked as well. Letting out a blood-curdling roar, he spat at the trembling girl with a glare, then marched from the structure, leaving Bakui alone with her. With smooth calm movements, Bakui approached the human male lying on the table and shook his head, then activated his wrist blades and cut the human's neck and cut open his chest, reaching into the bloody cavity to yank out the embryo by the neck. The human female gasped as she saw it squirming and squealing in his hand, then Bakui quickly snapped its neck and threw it aside, nodded respectfully to the human female, and turned, making his own retreat. On their way back across the arid landscape and forest to their waiting ship, Bakui berated Kancha for his careless behavior and bravado. His foolish actions had caused his friends wounds and near death, and though Kancha had not violated the code, he had not acted with honor, and the elders would meet to discuss his punishment. They'd go back to the ship and tend to Tuasa's wounds, then attempt to find the nest and kill any incubating humans if possible before they headed back to their home planet. The hunt had been honorable until the final moments at the human settlement, and Bakui would see that it ended on an honorable note. Kancha did not respond to the verbal thrashing his teacher gave him. Instead, his shoulders drooped and he looked at his feet as they walked, clearly sobered by what had occurred. The elders would probably require him to undergo more training on discipline while hunting, and perhaps to do some service for the clan, in order to punish his foolishness. Bakui hoped this would make him wiser, stronger, and better for the future, but it remained to be seen. Kancha seemed of a breed Bakui had seen all too many times before much bravado, little brains and such hunters often became outliers that other hunters trusted little during hunts and battles. But time would tell. 
as for Zaki, he had become a great warrior this day, and Bakui would see that his clan and elders knew he'd earned his place of honor among them. They crossed the seven Kev knocks from the human settlement to their ship quickly, and Bakui found Zaki tending to Tuasa's wounds. He'd managed to rinse the acid off his face, but the arm would need replacement a prosthesis would be attached back home. None of these first hunters would be the same after the day's hunt, but although Zaki would draw some lessons, Kancha and Tuasa would be the ones with the hardest lessons to learn. Bakui had done his duty, and he found for the first time that his long-standing hatred and resentment of Umans had tempered somewhat at the realization that if his own great-great-grandfather had behaved as recklessly as Kancha, then perhaps the elder's reaction might be more deserved than he'd ever allowed. He hated that his family's reputation had been tarnished by the incident, but strength and honor were the Yaja creed, and they must be maintained at all times. This he believed. This he lived. This he knew. Deseli huddled alone for a while in the field hospital after the creatures left her, wondering why she'd been so lucky as to be spared when her friends and colleagues hadn't. Armored aliens over seven feet tall with thick dreadlocks, who materialized out of midair. She was sure now she'd seen something shimmering, but they'd moved so fast and killed so quickly, she could hardly believe it. Now Doc, Adriana, and even poor Joa were gone with the rest. She was alone. Something had happened between the dreadlocked aliens at the end that she knew, and she was horrified at seeing Joa slaughtered before her. But there had been something growing in his belly something alien. She shuddered as the memory played back in her mind. The idea almost paralyzed her with fear. Then she had a thought. Were they coming back? Surely they would. And who would it be the insect aliens or the tall humanoids? And which was worse, she couldn't say. But Yuseli felt a sudden chill come over her as she realized she really wanted to live, to survive. She had to gather supplies and a radio, and find a place to hide until her people sent rescue. Oh my god, the colony. Everything they'd worked for gone. She wasn't sure how they'd ever recover. They could try again, she supposed, but she wasn't sure she'd even want to herself. What she did want was to survive. Springing to her feet, she began gathering medical supplies and two fallen blasters, along with cartridges to fire them. She'd have to be careful, but it was quiet all around now. If she hurried, she could get what she needed from the other buildings, find a cave or somewhere to hide, and hope they wouldn't find her. It would be hard alone here, she thought as she scrambled around, but Octavio Souza had raised all his children to be strong and independent, even the girls. Giselli may have been afraid during the attack, but she would not lie down and wait to die. She would fight. She would do everything she could to stay alive. Most of all, she would hope for a second chance somewhere else far away. Story 9 Abuse Interrupted By Yvonne Navarro Jazz stood at the window in the cabin's main room and stared outside, where everything was gray, brown, and damp. After a few minutes, she pulled the heavy drapes closed, hoping to block some of the drafts and hide the depressing outdoor scene. The view might be okay if she could see the mountains, but what so many people never seemed to recognize Da was that if you were in the mountains, you couldn't see them. She wondered if Mark had realized that, then dismissed the thought. That wouldn't have mattered. He had wanted a cabin in the Colorado mountains, and that's what he'd gotten a place where she couldn't escape. How many times had Mark brought her up here? Going on a dozen, surely. It was his way of making sure she hadn't hit her limit and the road after he'd given her what he called a good lighting up. Your fault, Jazzy. You know what happens when you don't do what I tell you. Your fault, Jazzy. You know what happens when you leave a mess in the bathroom. Your fault, Jazzy. You know what happens when you buy shit we don't need. The wind gusted outside and rattled the windows. Jazz frowned when it was followed by a hard spattering of rain. 
Mark was out there somewhere, geared up for a couple of days of camping and fishing. He wouldn't care about a little snow, but a rainstorm would bring him back early, which was the last thing she wanted. Your fault, Jazzy. In the bathroom, she examined her face in the mirror, a stupid thing in a frame made of deer antlers. There was a blue bruise along the left side of her jaw, and her right eye was a horror of purple and red puffiness. If there was a blessing to be had at all, this morning the swelling had gone down enough so that she could see out of it again. A painful scab had formed where her upper lip had split, but at least none of her teeth were loose. This time. I guess the nurse in the emergency room was right, she said to her reflection. You just fucking never learn. Or did she? There was no landline, and even if a signal was possible out here, Mark had busted her phone months ago. His battered 1995 Ford Bronco was parked in front of the cabin, like he always left it. Locked up tight, plenty of gas, good tires, five speed that was good on wet mountain roads. He left it to mock her, a reminder that escape was so close yet impossible. But not this time. Today, tucked into the watch pocket of her jeans was the Bronco's extra key. Jazz had found it a couple of weeks ago, in an old tin can that had once held a belt but was now almost full of change Mark had been collecting for who knew how long. For almost as long, She'd been going through his things and pinching a little cash here and there not enough for him to notice and hiding it away for. Someday. She'd known about the can but had never actually emptied it before. The key under all the change had been a surprise. Was it a test? She'd never know unless she tried, and her nerves had felt like razor wire ever since she'd taken it a couple of weeks ago and taped it to the underside of her small jewelry box. She turned and headed into the bedroom, glancing at the nightstand clock. It was mid-afternoon, five hours since Mark had headed out on his ATV. Surely that was enough time to be certain he wasn't going to turn around and come back. By now he was unloaded, his tent was up, and he was gathering his fishing gear to head to what he had deemed his most prized spot not that Jazz had ever seen it. She wasn't allowed out of the cabin without him, and the prequels to her visits here generally left her not wanting to move much. That was why he'd ignored it when she'd hit the bed and covered up with an afghan without bothering to unpack her small bag. Now Jazz swung the bag onto the bed, wincing as her body remembered his punches and the kick that was new Mark had aimed at her right hip when she'd ended up on the floor. No matter. She was no stranger to this life. After her father had beaten the soul out of her mother, he had turned his anger at life on jazz. If nothing else, she could take a beating with the best of them. Her coat, hat, and gloves were next to her bag and like found money, the car key was burning a hole in her pocket. Even so, she wouldn't hurry. She had one chance at this, and she wasn't going to. Something slammed against one of the outside walls of the cabin. In the act of pulling her coat closed, Jazz froze. More racket-like part of the wood pile had slid onto the array of tools Mark had stored next to it. Still not moving, Jez breathed in through her nose to fight the panic that wanted to rise. It wasn't Mark she would have heard the ATV's motor. It could be a moose sometimes, they poked around out of nothing more than curiosity. Even as she thought it, the front wall shook and Jazz knew it wasn't true. A black bear, then. Was there trash outside? Not a chance, but a persistent one might tear the door off the shed 
to get at the garbage bin inside. She should be okay there hadn't been a bear-related fatality in this area since around 2015. On the other hand, if it had been wounded by a hunter. This time something hit the front door hard enough to rattle the dinner plate she'd left in the sink. Jazz sucked in a belly full of air at the same time as she snatched up the Mossberg 12-gauge leaning next to the room's door. Her hand might have been shaking, but not enough to stop her from smoothly chambering around as she stepped into the cabin's main room. Yamark had taken his rifle and his .357 with him, but he'd also left a weapon in the cabin, just in case she needed protection. He was so arrogant, so confident she would never use it on him. And he was right, the bastard, on both accounts. Before she could focus her next thought, the front door was ripped out of its frame. Jazz didn't wait to invite the bear inside. She squeezed the trigger, staggering back as the Mossberg kicked. Something screamed, a crazy sound her mind couldn't identify. Suddenly, a dark figure scrambled through the opening. Not only was it too fast for her eyes to track, it hit her across the shins right after she primed the shotgun again, but before she could fire it. She pitched forward like a too-slow quarterback taken down by a defensive lineman. Instinct made her turn her head, and because she landed on the unbruised side of her face, she managed not to pass out. She'd lost the shotgun, so when she flipped onto her back, all she could do was throw up her arms to defend herself. After all, Mark had taught her well. Nothing happened. Eyes squeezed shut, muscles tensed at whatever was coming bites, slashes, pain, death jazz lay there, as close as she could get to being paralyzed. Waiting for it, unable to breathe, a sound finally broke through her concentration on herself. A kind of clicking and wheezing, noises that combined and followed each other, first one, then the other, then again. Jazz made herself open her eyes. The creature bending over her roared. Jazz had never been one to scream even Mark at his worst couldn't make her do it and she didn't scream now. Instead, she tossed a garbled curse at whatever the hell it was and scrambled backward, using her legs to both kick at it and move her body. She didn't know where the Mossberg was and didn't care as long as she could put some distance between herself and the thing that had invaded the cabin. She ended up by the wall next to the couch, overturning the end table and kicking it away. Incredibly, it didn't come after her. Instead, it just stood there, staring down as she stared up. It wasn't human. Jazz could see mottled skin beneath what looked like dark armor, the high-tech kind used in science fiction movies. It had a narrow waist below an expanded area across the chest that looked feminine, and it moved on two legs, like a human woman, but not. More of the skin showed through a heavy netting on exposed parts of its arms and legs, and Jazz didn't see the gaping shotgun wound she was hoping for. Different gadgets blinked and dinged on the creature's forearms, and there was another device on one shoulder that made a whirring sound and tracked Jazz as she pushed herself harder against the wall. The thing's head was covered by a helmet made of the same stuff as its body, but the helmet was cracked on one side, the edge of it dented sharply inward. Eye holes in the helmet revealed nothing but merciless, night black pits. Strange tentacles branched out behind the helmet. She didn't know what was more terrifying the thing standing over her or the thick ribbon of nuclear green liquid that was leaking from below the smashed and left side of its head covering. If that stuff dripped onto her, what would happen? 
Jazz lost that thought when the creature made a clicking sound and jerked a metal-looking staff from its belt, then took a step toward her, sizing her up like a hunter readying for a kill. She swore under her breath and grabbed for the arm of the battered couch to pull herself up. She was halfway there when something shrieked from the doorway. The thing in front of her spun and went into a crouch, bellowing a sound that was somehow worse than its previous one. Instinctively, Jazz looked where it did, and now she did scream, because there was another monster sliding into the cabin, one that was far worse than the first one a few feet away. Black and shining like dirty oil, its elongated head filled the ragged opening. It was a living nightmare of barbs and spiky arms and legs and fingernails, leaning over and sliding into the cabin, eyeless and hissing from a mouth grinning with silvery, dripping teeth. It had too many pieces to it, arms and legs and more crooked body parts moving sideways, as it did, too many joints and claws. Jazz had maybe two seconds to process what she was seeing. Fucking giant bug? Before a long, black tail whipped from behind it and snapped toward the armored female creature. The appendage ripped across the female's forearms, making it her snarl and jerk backward. The apparatus on her shoulder whirred and clicked and a red laser line shot forward. It ended in a triangular three dots fixated on the insectoid beast's head. There was a harsh, blue flash and a painfully loud boom a millisecond before an explosion, but it happened where the bug thing had been, not where it was. The she-hunter spun, tracking, and she and Jazz caught sight of a gleaming blur as it disappeared behind the rough pine table. The contraption on her shoulder adjusted, searching, but could find nothing to target. The cabin was swirling with cold air and dust, and pieces of wood were scattered across the floor and rugs. The mini-explosion had sent Jazz onto the floor in front of the couch, and for an instant all she could think was that Mark was going to be so pissed about the mess and the ruin of his precious crap furniture. Dismissing the thought, her eyes scanned the wreckage automatically and her gaze finally stopped on the Mossberg. It was maybe four feet away, not so far. If there weren't two unimaginable monstrosities, only a yard on the other side. Jazz slid toward it, and the she-beast's head snapped in her direction. She made that weird clicking sound again, faster a warning? There was no time to think about that, because suddenly the insectoid creature careened from around the table. For a too short moment it scrabbled along the floor, losing traction on the rag runner that tangled underneath it. While it tried to gain its footing, the female hunter spun toward it and fought to bring up her handheld weapon. She couldn't do it fast enough her arms were deeply slashed and all Jazz could see was radiant green liquid staining her armor and everything else. The female sank to her knees as the bug thing let out a screech that sounded bizarrely triumphant and charged forward. Jazz snatched up the shotgun and fired. She was too close to miss, and the blast knocked it sideways and slammed it into the refrigerator. Dull yellow liquid blood spewed from the wound in its body, sizzling and smoking everywhere it landed. The bug creature squealed and thrashed, still trying to find its footing. Without hesitating, Jazz primed the Mossberg and shot it again, and then a third time, until the whipping tail and jointed legs finally stopped shuddering, and the only sounds in the room were her own harsh breathing and the noise of the floorboards blistering under the creature's blood. The she-hunter got to her feet stumbling just a bit as she found her balance and faced Jazz. Jazz held her position with the shotgun aimed and ready, but neither moved. After an eternity, 
the armored female stepped over to the insect thing's body, unstrapped an evil-looking blade from her waist, and with one stroke severed its oversized, ugly black head. She held it up high, ignoring the goo that dripped from it, and let loose with a deep rumbling sound of victory. Then she glanced at Jazz one more time and strode toward the ruined doorway. Jazz gulped air in relief. She got it that two monsters had been out in the wilderness, fighting each other, and the one had busted into the cabin as it tried to get away from the other. None of that mattered now. The survivor was leaving, and Jazz herself was still alive. She had no idea how she'd deal with the remnants of this disaster, but... What the ever-loving fuck is going on here? Jazz made a sound between a gasp and a groan as Mark's not inconsiderable frame suddenly blocked the doorway. His enraged gaze had honed right in on her, crouching by the debris-strewn couch, without even noticing anything else. I knew you were planning something, Jazzy. I never thought you'd screw up so bad you'd ruin my shit. One of the kitchen chairs was overturned in front of him, and he batted it aside like it was a piece of Kleenex. You bitch. No dash was all Jazz managed before the she-hunter tossed the bug head aside and stepped in front of him, an all-in-black encased menace a good six inches taller than him. Mark jerked back. In true Mark form, he jumped right in with a narrative that suited him. I get it. You got some weirdo friend playing Halloween. She come up here to rescue you? He laughed. The she-hunter tilted her head at the sound, as though trying to understand. Without warning, Mark lunged forward, trying to get past her as he aimed for Jazz. The hunter stopped him easily by ramming one hard shoulder against his upper arm hard enough to make him yell angrily as he stumbled sideways. I'm happy to teach you a lesson, too, he spat. For a big man, he'd always been fast. His hand was a blur as he grabbed her helmet and lashed out with his other fist. He was on the floor so fast that Jazz and certainly not Mark himself didn't know how he'd gotten there. Wheezing with pain, he shook his head and tried to stand. Before he could, the she-hunter stomped one of his knees. He twisted and grabbed at it, caterwauling in agony. As Jazz stared, she saw with a start that he had the female's helmet in his hand he had dragged it off as he went down. Jazz saw the she-hunter's face the same time Mark did and she knew instantly that any notion Mark had about this being some kind of get-up had gone up in smoke. Her mouth dropped open in shock, and she realized she hadn't even thought about what the female hunter looked like beneath her helmet. Jazz's first impression was, Fangs. In the millisecond before the she-hunter focused fully on Mark, Jazz registered that it had four oversized sharp tusks that overlapped each other at the corners of a squarish mouth opening. Overhanging deep set, piercing yellow eyes was a massive, bony brow studded with sharp little spikes. The brow was wider than the creature's face and went up twice its length. The thick, black dreadlocks were studded with metal bands and grew sideways from her sharp cheekbones and all the way around the back. Below the cheekbones the face was sunken, then the jaw jutted out again, and behind the fangs jazz could see red gums on the top and a suggestion of teeth. The she-hunter's glistening skin was loosely reptilian, varying shades of brown and cream and stippled in darker brown and black marks. Mark shouted something incomprehensible, and the hunter leaned over him. The sound she made at him was harsh and thundering enough to hurt Jazz's ears. Worse, that square mouth opened impossibly wide, 
the spear-like fangs spreading and vibrating to show long incisors and ragged-edged bottom teeth. Despite the green fluid ribboning down her wrists and off the ends of long appendages tipped by vicious nails, the hunter grabbed at him. I got something just for you, you ugly, lizard-faced shit, Mark snarled as he lurched sideways on the floor and fumbled behind his back. Instantly, Jazz knew what he was doing. He's going for his point three five seven, And her mind took over, stepping in and overriding all that she had ever been since Mark had come into her life, beaten her body, broken her heart, and tried to crush her spirit. Jazz pointed the Mossberg at his stomach and fired. The slug smashed him against the wall and the pistol he was pulling free flew forward, landing a few feet away. Most of the middle of him was obliterated and splashed on the wall behind him, while his jaw had dropped open at what had undoubtedly been the biggest surprise of his life. The she-hunter had leaped backward into a crouch at Jazz's shot. Now she straightened, first staring at Mark then looking over to study Jazz, grotesque head tilted like a dog trying to understand. Jazz and the hunter stared at each other. Jazz had no idea how much time passed, only that it felt like forever and she understood that trying to move, maybe bringing the Mossberg around to aim it, would be a really bad idea. It wasn't primed, and at this point, she wasn't sure how many slugs were still in the shotgun anyway. Did she really want to kill something that had taught her to finally defend herself? When the she-hunter looked away, Jazz knew she wouldn't have to. Jazz let the Mossberg slide to the floor and inhaled as deeply as she could. The smell wasn't pleasant human blood and waste, unidentifiable fluids, death in all its human and non-human nastiness but she needed to slow her frenetic heartbeat and tamp down the adrenaline in her bloodstream. Her nerves were still cranked to overdrive, but she watched as the hunter went over and poked at the insectoid head, and then seemed to dismiss it. She headed to where Mark was sprawled and nudged his body with one foot, then bent over and slid her least injured forearm behind him and hauled his body upright like it weighed no more than a small bag of potatoes. For a second Mark hung in her grasp and the female glanced at Jazz, almost as though waiting for her to protest. Looking at his broken body, Jazz realized she felt, well, not much at all. When all Jazz did was shrug, the she-hunter twisted the body. Her other talon-tipped hand flashed forward and raked Mark from the tip of the back of his skull all the way down to his hips. Then she gave his corpse a brutal, practiced twist and a part of him dropped. When she turned to face Jazz, she was holding his dripping red skull and spine in one hand. Jazz slammed the back of her hand across her mouth to keep from crying out, then had to lock her throat when the she-hunter stepped forward and offered it to her like a trophy. There was no place to go her back was still against the wall so she met the hunter's gaze and shook her head. The female turned the skull and studied it for a moment, then threw the whole thing on top of the bug creature's body like so much garbage. Then she stepped over the loose bag of flesh that used to be marked and disappeared into the cold night. For a long time, Jazz simply stood there, looking at the carnage while her brain tried to sort it all out. Eventually, she felt herself moving, and she rolled with it, letting her brain autopilot her into taking the steps she needed to protect herself. She went back into the bedroom, picked up her bag and purse, and put on her hat and gloves. Then she made her way outside, careful not to step in any of the insect thing's yellow fluid that was still chewing holes through the flooring and onto the ground beneath it, and also avoiding the splotches of blood and body matter that dripped down the wall to the left of the doorway. 
She didn't bother looking over at the broken parts of Mark's skeleton or the giant bug. Their images would be burned behind her eyelids for a long, long time. The ATV was there, key in the ignition. There was nothing tied to the back of it, no camping gear or supplies. Apparently, Mark had thought to drop in on her maybe the key she'd found had, indeed, been put there intentionally. Jazz tied down her bag and purse, then started the ATV. Before she took off she made her way to the shed, where she knew there were several five-gallon containers of fuel. That was Mark, always prepared. Jazz dragged them back to the cabin, swung two over the threshold unopened, then splashed the contents of the last one on the outer front walls. The ATV waited, engine rumbling like an eager animal. Before she climbed into the seat, she used a match from the metal tin mark kept on the front windowsill to, as Mark so loved to say, light it up. Your fault, Jazzy. Not this time. Not any time. And she'd always hated it when he called her Jazzy.